You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures given in assorted cities to members of the Anthroposophical Society between the 31st of January and the 19th of June, 1915, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lang. And it's entitled The Mystery of Death. This is Lecture 1, given in Zurich on the 31st of January, 1915, entitled The Four Platonic Virtues and Their Connection with the Mysteries of Man's Being, The Influence of Spiritual Powers Upon the Physical World. Our spiritual science has the task of removing for our consciousness, and indeed for our whole inner life, that gulf which extends for outward human consciousness between the physical world, where man abides between birth and death, and the spiritual world, where man spends the other part of his existence, the time between death and a new birth. For someone who lives in spiritual science with every fiber of his soul, such a statement is both familiar and one that he takes for granted. But in the moment when I am speaking to you now, one may well say that it acquires a particularly sacred quality. We have, after all, recently lost a number of our dear friends and members through the grave events of the war, and we are about to accompany two friends upon their last paths here on earth. Tomorrow morning at eleven o'clock, we shall have here in Zurich the cremation of a dear member, Frau Dr. Kalatza, who left the physical plane this week, and we have just received the news that our dear friend Fritz Mitscher died around five o'clock this afternoon near Davos. With these two members, souls dear to us have left the physical plane. However, spiritual science shows us the way to understand that in a far higher sense than we otherwise are able to understand, we do not lose such souls, but remain connected with them. A considerable number of souls who have belonged to us since the work in our movement began have already passed through the gate of death. And from those sources whence spiritual knowledge flows to us, it can be said that they have, in accordance with their respective powers, become faithful collaborators in the spiritual world. Indeed, with the full responsibility with which one can say something that is founded firmly on spiritual knowledge, I can say that we have in them gained pillars for our spiritual movement. Many have passed through the gate of death who worked within our spiritual movement and who looked down upon that to which their love is directed. In the period between birth and death, they have grown attached to the kind of aspiration which is pursued in our circle. They have left something behind them in our society which is itself on the path between death and a new birth. Just as the nature that surrounds us is a world upon which we look back, so can we look back upon our physical life from that moment which one can compare with a person's birth. Immediately after death, man passes through a condition that can be compared with embryonic life, with life in the mother's body, except that this period in the life after death lasts only a matter of days and is therefore much shorter than embryonic life in relation to physical life. Then follows what can be compared with the entry into the physical world, with the taking of the first breath. This can be called the awakening in the spiritual world, of which it can be said that it is like an awareness that the will of the soul that has crossed the threshold of death is being received by the beings of the higher hierarchies. Just as a person emerging physically from the body of the mother into the physical world initially finds himself able to take in the outside air and then experiences the gradual awakening of his senses, so after death does there come that moment when the soul feels the power of will 
which during physical life was contained within the limits of the physical body, is now flowing from me out into the universe. And the soul then feels how this will is indeed received through the activity of the next higher hierarchy, the beings belonging to the hierarchy of the Angeloi. This is like the taking of the first breath in the spiritual world and gradually growing into one's spiritual surroundings, for this is what spiritual knowledge shows us. I should like to speak about the destiny of those who have gone from us in the course of the years. I should like to cast an eye upon those who have developed a fondness for our spiritual movement and look down upon it as something of which they know that it speaks to human souls, of that within which they are living also within physical life. To be able in this way to connect oneself in memory to earthly life is something that here in the physical world already belongs to the world of spirit. For those who have crossed the threshold of death, this is something of infinite value, of infinite significance. And when the stream that flows up to them from the physical world which has its source in what they have experienced in our movement, is augmented by them as a tributary to a river, when the thoughts of those who were attached to them in love or from family ties are added to it, because it is based on spiritual relationships, the community is far more intimate than it could otherwise be in our materialistic age. Again we may say that in the case of many a person who has passed through the portal of death into the spiritual world, it appears to us as if he or she had done this out of intimate love for our spiritual movement in order to be able to contribute stronger powers from the spiritual world. A considerable number of those who have gone from us have, living in their souls, the most wonderfully clear feelings about the need for our spiritual movement and for someone who is able to acquire insight into the spiritual world, all those who have crossed the threshold of death and now look down at the movement with which they were connected are like the spiritual heralds of our movement, those who carry their spiritual standards before us, constantly calling to us. We were convinced while we were united with you of the necessity of this movement, but now that we have entered the spiritual world, we know that we can and must help at a time when this movement is needed. This is something which those who remain behind on the physical plane, who have lost relatives and friends, will increasingly be aware of. For them, what has been said can represent the deepest comfort of having everything that brings about a still deeper bond between souls, even if we are no longer in the position of being connected with those souls outwardly through physical eyes and physical words. This spiritual movement of which we are to become participants has a great deal that it must bring. I should like today to choose a particular aspect out of the many things that it must bring to us. A time like ours, when outward culture, notwithstanding the last echoes of the old religions, is based wholly on a materialistic consciousness, can also only develop the impulses of moral life in a way that takes account solely of the life between birth and death. Among the many things that will emerge from our spiritual movement will be a new upsurge of humanity's moral life, the whole life of the virtues. For human beings will learn to regard moral life, the life of the virtue, from a standpoint that extends beyond birth and death, and which reckons that the human soul passes through repeated earthly lives, that just as it lives its life between birth and death, it has also passed through many lives and can hope in anticipation of further lives which it will live in future. When we have extended our frame of vision from one life to successive earthly lives, we shall have a more comprehensive and more appropriate conception of life, together with a more appropriate and more comprehensive conception of virtue and the moral life. When we speak of the human virtues, we can distinguish essentially four such virtues of which we can speak in ordinary language. As we shall indicate later on, there is one virtue that lives in the depths of the human soul, but of which we should, as we shall see, speak as little as possible, 
for reasons that are held sacred. All other virtues, which exist in life and which together constitute moral life, can be regarded as special cases of the four virtues that we wish to consider and which were fully described in antiquity. Plato, the great philosopher of ancient Greece, distinguished these four virtues because he was still able to derive his wisdom from the echoes of ancient mystery wisdom. From this standpoint, Plato was better equipped to distinguish the virtues than later philosophers and certainly than those of our times where knowledge of mystery wisdom has become so remote and so chaotic in nature. The first virtue, which we must consider if we are speaking of a moral life as it arises from a comprehensive knowledge of human nature, is that of wisdom. However, this wisdom is to be understood in a somewhat deeper sense and as related more to ethics than one would normally understand it. We cannot say that wisdom is something that can, as it were, simply come to a person of its own accord. Still less is wisdom something that a person can learn in the ordinary sense. It is, moreover, not easy to characterize in a few words what wisdom should signify for us. If we pass through life in such a way that we allow what comes toward us in this life to influence us, if prompted by the various events of life, we learn from the one event how we might have been able to respond to this or that more appropriately, how we might have used our powers more skillfully and effectively. If we take account of everything that befalls us in life, so that when we encounter something similar a second time we do not any longer respond as we did the first time, but feel that we have learned something. And if we maintain throughout our life the mood of being able to learn from life and of being able to regard everything that nature and life brings toward us in such a way that we learn from it, and moreover not simply by accumulating knowledge, but by becoming inwardly better and richer, we will then have grown in wisdom, and what we have experienced will not have been without value for our life of soul. Life will have been worthless for us if we have lived for several decades and continue at a later time to judge something that we have experienced in the same way that we evaluated it when we were younger. If we spend our life in such a way we are very far removed from wisdom. Karma may have brought it about that we became angry when we were young and condemned this or that quality in other people. If we hold fast to this, we will have made poor use of our life. The opposite will be the case if, in an instance where we formed a derogatory judgment in our youth, at a later stage of life we judge not disparagingly, but with understanding and forgiveness if we make the effort of wanting to understand. If we have an innate tendency to erupt with a violent anger at certain things, and if when we are older we are not led to blind anger as we were in our younger days, if the violence of our anger has been tempered by what life has taught us and we have become gentler, we have profited from life in accordance with wisdom. If we were materialists in our youth, but have subsequently allowed the revelations from the spiritual world that our time has sought to impart to us, to influence us, we will have employed our life in the service of wisdom. If we have closed ourselves to the revelations of the spiritual world, we have not lived our life in accordance with wisdom. To be enriched in this way and to achieve a wider horizon may be called making use of life in accordance with wisdom. And what spiritual science wants to give us is fitted for opening ourselves up to life so that we may become wiser. Wisdom is something that opposes egotism in the strongest possible way. Wisdom is something that always reckons with the course of world events. We therefore allow ourselves to be instructed by the course of world events because we thereby free ourselves from the narrow judgment made by our ego. A wise person cannot actually judge egotistically, for if one learns from the world, one learns to understand it. One learns to let the world correct one's judgments, so that wisdom extracts us from narrow, limited points of view and brings us into harmony with itself. Much else could be said which 
could gradually provide us with a description of wisdom. We should not attempt to arrive at a definition of such concepts, but rather open our hearts so that we can become ever wiser also about wisdom itself. Here in the physical world, everything that a person has to experience in waking life has to make use of the instruments of the outward physical and etheric nature. As human beings between birth and death, it is only when we are asleep that our soul nature, insofar as it consists of an ego and astral body, is outside our physical and etheric bodies. When we are in a conscious waking state, we avail ourselves of the instruments of our physical and etheric bodies. When we fill ourselves with wisdom, when we try to live in our actions and thinking, in our feelings and sensations, in accordance with wisdom, we make use of those organs of our physical and etheric bodies which are in a sense the most perfect in our earthly life. Those organs that have needed the longest for their development, which were already prepared by Saturn, Sun and Moon, and have come into our lives as a heritage and have reached a certain culmination. I should like to present to you from another point of view an idea of what one can understand by more or less perfected organs. Let us, on the one hand, take our brain. The brain is not the most perfect organ, but we can regard it as more perfect than other organs, for it needed longer for its development than these other organs. Compare the brain with our torso, for which our hands extend. When we undertake to do something with our hands, we have the thought, I stretch out my hand, I take the vase, I retract my hand. What have I done? I have extended not only the physical hand, but also the etheric and astral hand, and a portion of my ego. But the physical hand went with them. If I merely think and entertain only thoughts, clairvoyant consciousness can see that something like spiritual arms stretch out from the head, but the physical brain remains in the skull. Just as my etheric and astral hand belongs to my physical hand, so does something etheric and astral belong to the brain. The brain cannot follow, but the hands can do so. At a later time, the hands will also become fixed and we shall subsequently only be able to move their astral part. The hands are on the way to becoming what the brain is already today. In earlier times, during the old sun and moon periods, that which today extends as something purely spiritual or intellectual from the brain was also still accompanied by the physical organ. It has now been covered over by the skull, so that the physical brain is held fast within it during earthly evolution. The brain is an organ which has passed through more stages of evolution. The hands are on the way to becoming similar to the brain, for the whole human organism is on the way to becoming a brain. Thus there are organs that are more perfect and have evolved into something more self-contained, and those that are less perfected. The most perfected organs are needed by what we achieve by way of wisdom. Our ordinary brain is actually used only as an instrument for the lowest form of wisdom, for earthly cleverness. But the more we acquire wisdom, the less we depend upon our cerebrum and the more activity is, unbeknown to modern anatomy, withdrawn to our cerebellum, to what is enclosed within our skull as a smaller brain resembling a tree. When we human beings have become wise, when we have attained wisdom, we do indeed find ourselves beneath a tree, which is our cerebellum, and which then begins in a particular way to unfold its activity. Imagine how a human being who has become especially wise extends the organs of his wisdom mightily like the branches of a tree. They have their source in the cerebellum, which resides in the hard covering of the skull. But the spiritual or intellectual organs extend outward, and he is as a spiritual reality beneath the tree, the Bodhi tree. Thus we see, too, that what we do in wisdom is the most spiritual aspect of our nature, or at least one of the most spiritual, for the organs are already at rest. When we do something with our hand, we must use a portion of our forces on moving the hand. 
When we make a wise judgment or decide something wisely, the organs remain at rest. No force is employed on a physical organ because in such an instance we are more spiritual. And those organs that we use on the physical plane in order to live wisely are those for which we need to use the least strength, those that are already the most perfected. Wisdom is, therefore, something in the moral life which enables human beings to experience themselves in a spiritual way. This is associated with the fact that the wisdom that a person acquires enables him to derive the greatest possible fruits from his former incarnations. Because in the realm of the spirit we live in wisdom without any effort on the part of our physical organs, we are through a wisdom-filled life also most able to make what we have acquired in former incarnations fruitful for this life, in that we bring this wisdom over from former incarnations. We have in German and also in English a good word for someone who does not want to become wise. We call him a Philistine. A Philistine is a person who resists any development of wisdom, someone who wants to stay as he is for his entire life and does not want to arrive at a different opinion about anything. But someone who wants to become wise makes the effort to bring the work that he has accomplished and accumulated in former incarnations into his present life. The wiser we become, the more do we bring into the present incarnation from earlier incarnations. And if we do not want to become wise, so that we elect not to cultivate further the wisdom developed in previous incarnations, then along comes one who gets rid of it altogether, Araman. No one likes it better than Araman if we do not become wiser. We have the power to do so. We have acquired far, far more in previous incarnations than we think. We gained far more in the times when we were living through the old conditions of clairvoyance. Everyone could become much wiser than he does become. No one should try to persuade himself that there is not much that he could bring over from the past. To become wise means to bring forth what one has acquired in former incarnations, so that one may be filled with it in this incarnation. Another virtue although it is difficult to describe it exactly in a single word, is that of courage. It represents the mood of soul that does not passively attend to life, but is guided by the inclination toward active participation. One might say that this virtue derives from the heart. It can be said of someone who has this virtue in ordinary life that he has his heart in the right place. And this is a good expression for when we are able not timidly to withdraw from things that life demands of us, but have the capacity to take ourselves in hand and know how to intervene where this is necessary. When we are in such a way inclined to press on with our activity in a confident and good-hearted manner, the expression good-hearted is applicable to this virtue. We have something of the quality of this virtue. One could also say that this Virtue is associated with a healthy feeling life that gives rise at the right moment to bravery, whereas its absence engenders cowardice. Naturally, this virtue can, in the physical course of life, be exercised only through certain organs. These organs, which include the physical and etheric heart, are not so perfected as those which serve wisdom. They are still on the way to becoming different and will in future indeed become so. There is a great difference between the brain and the heart in their relation to cosmic evolution. Suppose that someone passes through the gate of death and then through the life between death and a new birth. His brain is altogether a work of the gods. The brain is pervaded by forces which completely separate themselves from him when he passes through the portal of death. And for his next life, the brain is built up entirely anew not only in a material sense, but also as regards its inner forces. This is not the case with the heart. The situation with the heart is that not the physical heart itself, but the forces that are active within it continue in existence. These forces withdraw into the astral realm 
and into the ego, and also remain there between death and a new birth. The same forces that beat within our hearts also beat next time in our new incarnation. That which functions within the brain does not feature in a forthcoming incarnation, but the forces that inspire our heart also reappear in the next incarnation. When we contemplate ahead, we can say, invisible forces are working within it, of which the brain is composed. But when a person passes through the gate of death, these forces are given over to the cosmos. When, however, we listen to someone's heartbeat, we are hearing spiritual forces which are present not only in this incarnation, but will also live in the next incarnation, having passed through death and a new birth. Popular consciousness had a wonderful sense of such things. That is why so much importance was attached to the feeling of the heartbeat, not because the physical heartbeat is so greatly valued, but because we perceive something far more eternal when we consider a person's heartbeat. If we have the virtue of courage, of valiant good-heartedness, we can use only a part of certain forces for this virtue, and we must use the other part for the organs that serve as the instruments for it. These are organs for which we must still use a portion of such forces. If we are not courageous, if we do not develop the virtue of brave good-heartedness, if we let ourselves go, timidly withdraw from life and give ourselves over to the gravity of our own being, we cannot enliven those forces which must accompany the full expression of the virtue of courage. For as long as we take a cowardly stance in life, the forces that should fire our heart remain inactive. They are a seed for Lucifer. He takes possession of them. And we do not have them in the next life. To be cowardly in the face of life means that one is providing Lucifer with a quantity of forces that we will lack when we want to build up our hearts, which are indeed the organs, the instruments of courage. We will come into the world with defective, underdeveloped organs. The third virtue, which reckons with the least perfected organs that will acquire a form only in the future, and of which they contain at present only a seed, is one that we may call temperance, circumspection, or discretion. It can also, in one of its shades of meaning, be referred to as moderation. Thus, we have three virtues, wisdom, courage or good-heartedness, and temperance. One can be intemperate in the most varied way, such as overeating or drinking to excess. This is the lowest form of intemperance. The soul is totally engulfed in bodily desires and our life is dominated by the body. If, however, we take our desires in hand, if we directly command the body as to what it may and may not do, we are then temperate, or as one could also say, acting in moderation. And through such moderation we also maintain some order amidst those forces whose task it is to prevent the organs in question from falling prey to Lucifer in the next incarnation. For the forces that we expend through giving ourselves up to a life of passion we make available to Lucifer. This is most severely exacerbated by our passions if our consciousness becomes submerged in a dreamy, drowsy state. When we lose our sense of temperance or moderation, we always make forces available to Lucifer. He takes these forces, but he also takes from us the forces that we need for the organs of breathing and digestion. And our organs of breathing and digestion are adversely affected if we do not cultivate the virtue of moderation. Those who like to be carried away by their desires and give themselves up to their passions are candidates for being the decadent people of the future, those who will suffer from all possible aberrations of their physical body. One can say that this virtue of temperance is dependent upon the least perfected organs of man's being, upon the organs that are in the initial stage of development and must still essentially be transformed. When we consider our organs of digestion and all that is connected with them, we have to apply our ego, astral body, etheric body, and physical body in order to set them in motion. With the organs that serve 
as the instruments for courage, the situation is different. In this case our ego remains more or less outside, in that we move freely, and only our astral and etheric bodies reach into the physical domain. When we come to the virtues that comprise wisdom, we keep the ego and astral body freely detached. For as we become wiser, we develop the organization of the astral body, we take hold of it. That is the essential point, that through becoming wiser we transform the astral body into the spirit self, and only the etheric body combines with the physical body. In the brain, the physical aspect of our being is accompanied only by the etheric, and whereas during waking life we are with respect to the rest of the body, very closely connected in our physical organism, at any rate with our astral nature, we retain for the brain the condition in which we are in sleep to the highest degree. Thus for the brain we are in the greatest need of sleep, for likewise when we are awake our ego and astral body are outside the brain, and they have to make the greatest effort within themselves without having the support of the external organ. Thus we find a connection between our human nature and the virtues. We can call wisdom a virtue that belongs to man as a spiritual being, where he is freely active with his ego and his astral body, and his physical and etheric organs really offer a kind of support. We can refer to courage as a virtue where a person is free only with his ego and has his supports in his astral, etheric, and physical bodies. Finally, we can speak of temperance, circumspection or discretion, where the seed within our ego is becoming free, where our ego is nevertheless bound to the astral, etheric and physical bodies, and we work by means of it to free ourselves from these bonds. But then there is a virtue which is the most spiritual of all. This most spiritual of virtues is connected with the whole human being. There is a function of human nature which we lose early and have only in the first years of childhood. I have often mentioned what I have in mind here. When we arrive on the physical plane, we are not in the position that we need for our human dignity. We crawl on all fours. I have pointed out that it is only through our own forces that we achieve the right situation of uprightness. Similarly, we develop through the forces that bring about speech. In short, in the first years of our life, we develop forces which in all essentials, note the expression, draw us into the position that we have in the world as true human beings. We do not come into the world in such a way that we already find our right orientation in it. We crawl, but we are rightly placed when we direct our head toward the stars. This corresponds to inner forces. In later life we lose these forces, they cease to manifest themselves. Nothing any longer appears of a similar nature in human life to match the energy displayed in learning to walk and acquiring an upright posture. We become increasingly weary when it comes to our capacity of uprightness. If we begin early in the morning to live with our brain, we become tired. When we have come to the end of the day, we are in need of sleep. When we are tired, that which gives us our upright posture in childhood itself remains somewhat weary and degenerates into feebleness. And anything comparable to the achieving of uprightness in childhood no longer happens in later life. And how do we orient ourselves in life when we learn to speak? Also, when we are learning to speak, guiding forces are working with us. The same forces that we use in early childhood are, however, not lost in the course of later life. They remain available to us, but they are associated with a virtue, with the virtue that is connected with rightness, with what is right, with the virtue of all-encompassing justice, the fourth virtue. The same power that we use as a child, when from a being that crawls we raise ourselves to uprightness, lives in us when we have the virtue of justice, the fourth of those mentioned by Plato. Anyone who really practices the virtue of justice puts everything and every being in its right place, goes out from himself and into the others. 
This is what it means to live in all-encompassing justice. To live in wisdom means to derive the best fruits from the forces that we have stored up in previous incarnations. And if we had to point toward what was imparted to us in former incarnations, when divine forces still pervaded us, we must with justice further emphasize that we derive from the cosmos. We practice justice when we develop the forces through which we are connected in a spiritual respect with the whole cosmos. Justice represents the measure of a person's connection with the divine. Injustice is, to all intents and purposes, equivalent to godlessness, to one who has lost his divine origin, and we blaspheme against God from whom we spring if we do any human being an injustice. Thus we have two virtues, justice and wisdom, which direct us back to what we were in former times, in other incarnations, in the times when we ourselves were still in the womb of the Godhead. And we have two other virtues, which may be designated as courage and temperance, which point us toward later incarnations. We build up all the more forces for these, the less that we give to Lucifer. We have seen how what is associated with courage and temperance goes into the organs and how the organs are thereby prepared for the next incarnation. In the same way, moral life extends into future life if we fill ourselves with spirituality. Two virtues extend their life over past incarnations, wisdom and justice. Courage and temperance shed their light upon future incarnations. The time will come when people will see clearly that they are throwing themselves into the jaws of Araman if they shut themselves off from justice and wisdom. And what they had in former incarnations, what belonged to the divine world, would be made available to Lucifer through intemperate or cowardly actions. What is seized by Lucifer is taken away from the forces available for building up our body in our next life. We cannot practice wisdom and justice without becoming selfless, as has been indicated. Someone who is self-seeking can only be unjust. Someone who is self-seeking can only be wanting to remain unwise. Wisdom and justice lead us beyond ourself and make us members of the whole organism of humanity. Courage or good-heartedness and temperance make us in a certain sense members of the whole organism of humanity. Only by experiencing courage and temperance and expressing them in our lives do we ensure that in the future we shall engage with humanity as a whole with a stronger organism. What we would otherwise cast away to Lucifer will not then be taken away from us. Egotism is of itself transformed into selflessness when it is extended in the right sense over the whole horizon of life and man finds his place in the light of the fourth virtue. This is what spiritual wisdom will bring to the future of humanity and will extend to include ethics and the moral life. This will then also flow into methods of education. If wisdom and justice are understood in the way that I have indicated, one will want to learn throughout one's life. One will see that one has to begin learning in the right way only when one is no longer young whereas people nowadays think that when one's youth is behind one, there is nothing more to learn. In this way, even the greatest and noblest fruits of art of the great writers and poets of mankind are lost. We would approach them most fruitfully if we were to take up these works again in old age. When people read Goethe's Iphigenia or Schiller's Tell, they usually think, we already read that at school. But this is not right, for it should not be forgotten that these works have the greatest effect on us when we read them in old age, for it is then that they promote justice and wisdom. Again, the education of children will be particularly fruitful if the virtue of courage and the virtue of temperance are seen in the right light. When it is a case of educating children, these virtues must be viewed in an individual way in that children are again and again shown that they are to take hold of life in a good-hearted way, that they should not be afraid of everything or withdraw from all manner of situations, 
and that they embrace life with circumspection and moderation in order gradually to free themselves from their passions. An immense amount can be done for the education of children in this way. These things will be explained further as we proceed in our spiritual scientific studies. So, you see that the laws in moral life, which otherwise only apply to the outward physical plane, to the life between birth and death, extend through spiritual scientific observations to an endlessly wide horizon. The situation here is the same as it is in other areas of spiritual science. And yet humanity has also had to experience an extension of its horizons with respect to natural science. Giordano Bruno pointed out that there is not only one earthly life, but that there are many earthly lives. Before Giordano Bruno, people believed that there is a fixed boundary up in the sky. He made them aware that this is not so, that the blue of the sky does not constitute a limit. Spiritual science shows that birth and death are as such not really there at all, and that we introduce them into life through the limitations of our understanding. Thus, the gulf between the physical and the spiritual can be spanned. And for those who establish a real true monism, the things that have their foundation in spiritual science have a real existence. It may often happen that those who call themselves monists make their monism very simple. They take one part of the world and make it into a single entity by getting rid of the other half of the world. True monism comes about through allowing both halves to intermingle in a meaningful way. This happens through spiritual science, but not only that this impresses itself on our consciousness, but arises for the whole of our life. We must increasingly come to the real knowledge as we look into the world that in what is around us, in everything that lives and is active everywhere, there is something supersensible, not only in what our eye beholds, but also in what our reasoning powers that are bound to the brain perceive. There are spiritual forces everywhere, behind every phenomenon, behind the phenomenon of the rainbow, behind the movement of our hand, and so on. If you read the cycle of lectures that I gave at the turn of the present year in Leipzig, you will find how the Christ impulse worked through the mystery of Golgotha, how Christ lives in the most important affairs of humanity, and not only in what people have consciously known about, There have, for example, been quarrels about dogmas. But while people were arguing, the Christ impulse was living through everything and bringing about what needed to happen. Let us take the figure of the Maid of Orleans. This simple shepherd girl makes her appearance in European history. She appears in a remarkable way, in that in her soul there live not only those forces that otherwise live within a person, but that the Christ impulse is working in this personality, enlivening and sustaining her through its mighty influence. She became a kind of representative of the Christ impulse itself for her time. This she could only do because the Christ impulse had entered into her being. You know that we celebrate Christmas at the time when the power of the sun is at its least, in the deepest darkness of winter, because we can be convinced that at this time the inner light the spiritual light, has the greatest intensity. Old legends tell us that over Christmas, up to the 6th of January, people have had special experiences. Because at this time, earthly life and the inner forces of the earth are at their most concentrated. Those who have the right disposition for this then indeed experience spiritual forces within the earthly forces. Countless legends tell of this, The best time for this is the thirteen days before the 6th of January. The Maid of Orleans spent these thirteen days in a particular state, whereby her feeling life was not receptive to the outer world. Remarkably, the time when the Maid of Orleans was carried in her mother's womb came to an end in the Christmas period of 1411. She was born on the 6th of January, after she had spent the last thirteen days in her mother's body. Before she drew her first breath, before she saw the physical light with her physical eye, she experienced the earthly realm during the thirteen days in the sleep through which a person passes before he enters the physical world. 
I am indicating something of the greatest significance that shows how the world is ruled from out of the domain of spirit, how what happens outwardly in the physical world is given its direction by the spiritual world, how the spiritual world is flowing amidst physical realities. Thus in our present time we must ever more consciously remove the gulf between the physical and the spiritual through spiritual science. We do this in one realm of our lives when we become conscious that there are within our movement the forces of those who in the course of their earthly lives have united their soul and body with our movement and have passed through the portal of death. If we look across to the other bank of the stream where they are active and feeling ourselves united with them, direct our thoughts toward them. We do this in full consciousness, the consciousness that we gain through spiritual science. We know ourselves to be in living connection with those who have passed through the gate of death, and we know them as the best forces among us. When we are able to do or to think this, we are regarding life as a field that is to be sown. Between what we ourselves plant, we see springing up everywhere plants that we could not have grown ourselves, and we can then know that these plants have been put there by those to whom it has been granted to be in the world of spirit, those with whom we feel ourselves to be connected, those with whom we become one. It will be the characteristic sign of this movement and of those who feel themselves to be members of it and reckon themselves as belonging to it in future, to be in fellowship also with those who are no longer the bearers of a physical body. Other societies founded only upon earthly things will remove many barriers between one person and another. The barriers between the living and the dead will increasingly be removed by the movement that will unite those people who want to be united in the sign of spiritual science. We all want to carry this in our souls and retain as a lasting experience the characteristic quality which unites us with this spiritual movement that has become dear to us. and a small appendix at the end of this lecture. Aside, during the war years the following commemorative words were spoken by Rudolf Steiner before every lecture that he gave to members of the Anthroposophical Society in the countries affected by the war. Steiner now. The first thoughts that we have as we meet together in our groups shall be directed toward the guarding spirits of those who are out on the battlefields, where they have to serve the great obligations of the time with their blood, and soul forces. We want to direct our pleas to the guarding spirits of these souls in order that what we contribute through our petitioning love can ray out and unite with the power of the spirits guarding these souls on the fields of battle. Spirits watching over your souls, may thy wings bring our petitioning love to the human beings on earth entrusted to thy care that united with thy power our plea may radiate help to the souls whom we seek lovingly to reach. And for those who have already passed through the gate of death, spirits watching over your souls, may thy wings bring our petitioning love to the human beings in the heavenly spheres entrusted to thy care, that united with thy power our plea may radiate help to the souls whom we seek lovingly to reach. And may the Spirit whom we have sought through the years of our striving enable the power that He carried through the mystery of Golgotha to ray forth to Thee, so that Thou might have strength for the fulfillment of what the great obligations of mankind demand from Thee. May the Spirit who passed through the mystery of Golgotha, may the Spirit of Christ be with Thee. That's the end of Lecture 1. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures, entitled The Mystery of Death. The Nature and Significance of Central Europe and the European Folk Spirits, 
translated by Simon Blaxland DeLang. This is Lecture 2, given in Hanover on the 19th of February, 1915, entitled, The Passing of a Human Being Through the Gate of Death, A Transformation of Life. It is a time when man's connection with the spiritual world, that world which he enters when he crosses the threshold of death, comes to our awareness with great frequency through the many deaths occurring on a daily basis. Moreover, this rapid succession of almost simultaneous deaths is occurring under quite particular circumstances. This is because many earthly human beings are passing through the gate of death who under the conditions that ordinarily apply to human individuals would otherwise be able to live on this earth for several decades. And whenever people die prematurely, this also gives rise to circumstances of an extraordinary nature. We know that when a person passes through the gate of death, he leaves behind, gives over to the earthly element, what falls away from him in the form of his physical body. We know that the so-called etheric body is the second element to be considered, but that this too separates from the individuality composed of the astral body and ego, which passes through the spiritual realms between death and a new birth, that this etheric body continues to work further, separated from the ego and astral body. As it enters the spiritual world immediately adjoining our own, a world that we have often referred to as the etheric world, this etheric body can be thought of as manifesting itself differently in the case of someone who passes prematurely through the gate of death from the way it does with someone who has lived to a ripe old age. For an etheric body which has to pass through the gate of death where someone has died prematurely would under normal circumstances have had the strength to imbue the physical body with life for many years and even several decades. Now in the spiritual world, energies are lost just as little as they are in the physical world. This strength that otherwise imbues the physical body with life continues to exist. So we can say, if thousands are now passing through the gate of death virtually every day, etheric bodies are entering the elemental world, which are still viable, which have within them different forces from etheric bodies that have become older. What happens now with these still viable etheric bodies? Yesterday in the public lecture I spoke of the folk soul who is an actual being, in our time, it needs quite particular forces. It needs such forces also at other times, of course, but quite especially in our time. This folk soul still receives these viable etheric bodies. The human being himself pursues different paths through his ego and astral body, those paths which will then prepare him for his next earthly life. But these etheric bodies separate from the human individualities. They pass over into the essential nature, the substance of the folk souls. Thus, after such a destiny-laden time as we are now living through, we are approaching a time when the folk soul has within it, as living forces residing in it, the etheric bodies that have been made available to it by those who have crossed the threshold of death in battle. Thus a time is drawing near when the spiritual scientist can know that what has been sacrificed by way of etheric bodies on the altar of the great events of the time has not been lost. A time is drawing near when from the folk soul an effective force streams forth into the individual souls from whom at the same time proceeds what numerous human beings have received here on earth in the first, second and third decades of their youth. What they would otherwise have been able to retain for many decades, but have given over to the folk soul. This will in future be in the forces that the folk soul infuses into individual souls, and it has not been lost. Let us take this rightly into our hearts. Let us think how our awareness of the connection with the spiritual world can be enlivened in our hearts when we record the fact that one will in future be able to speak of the folk soul in such a way that the fruits of sacrificial deaths reside within it as effective forces.
This will be particularly important in the near future. At other times it would be different, but for the near future it will be significant for a quite particular reason. We have been living in a dire period of materialism. Souls that have not been able to approach spiritual science have, as it were, been plunged into a strong aura of materialism. It will, in the coming times, be the task of the folk soul to combat this aura. Forces for combating materialism will flow to this folk soul through the fact that the etheric bodies of those who have died prematurely live on in this folk soul, thus making such forces available. These etheric bodies, sacrificed on the altar of human evolution, will be the most powerful adversaries of materialism. Thus we must distinguish between what passes as an individual human being through the expanses of the spiritual world and remains united with the human individuality, and what is channeled through the etheric body to the universal whole. What, in the sense referred to here, works further in the spiritual totality in the substance of the folk spirits. This can make a particularly deep impression on our feeling life if we consider two types of human beings with regard to this spiritual difference. The soldier, fallen in battle, who goes through the gate of death, devoted to the task of his people, who, at the moment when he enters the field of battle, when he merely makes the resolve to do so, must in a certain sense also be deciding to look death in the eye, and in comparison the ascetic. One gains some idea of the difference between the soldier who has fallen in battle and the ascetic if one considers what the forces of the etheric body signify in human life. The ascetic works upon himself. He tries to work upon himself in such a way that he completely overcomes his physical nature as such, that he becomes free from this physicality even during his lifetime. Because of the work that the ascetic does in this regard, a significant transformation also takes place in his etheric body. One could say that he uses the forces of this etheric body in the strongest way in order to incorporate it in his ego and his astral body. What makes the ascetic free from his physicality stands the individuality in good stead, It serves the transformation of the individuality. Thus a person who becomes an ascetic can only serve humanity by way of what he makes of himself. However, someone who makes himself free from the physical body in early youth by giving himself up to military demands gives the forces of his etheric body over to the general whole. He incorporates it in influences of a universal nature. One must feel this difference. It is a significant difference. It points us in some small degree toward what holds sway as a reality in human life. And it is, moreover, also significant to look retrospectively at what the etheric body is, at the passage through the gate of death. In the moment when someone crosses the threshold of death, he is still united with his etheric body. We have often described what happens with it. This state of union with the etheric body gives a person the possibility of living so rightly in all the mental images which the life that is past has kindled within him as wholly to be absorbed as in a mighty tableau in all that this last life has given him. But this is a vision that lasts a relatively short time and fades with the separation of the etheric body from the ego and astral body. One can indeed say that the fading process begins immediately after the moment of death, a tendency for the impressions that derive from the possession of an etheric body to become ever weaker, and there then makes itself felt what is of particular importance after physical death. Those who want to form ideas about life after death will only to a very small degree gain a right conception of this. It is even difficult to find words for those conditions which are so different in nature from those experienced in the physical body. People readily believe that once someone has passed through the gate of death he would first have to acquire a consciousness again, but this is not so. What he experiences, 
when he crosses the threshold of death, is not a lack of consciousness. With death, it turns out that there is not a lack of consciousness, but the exact opposite. There is a too-muchness, an overabundance of consciousness when death comes about. One lives and weaves wholly within consciousness. And just as strong sunlight causes the eyes to shield themselves, so is one initially numbed by consciousness. One has too much of it. This consciousness must be dampened down in order that one can orient oneself in the life that one has embarked upon after death. This lasts for quite some time, in that it gradually happens that after death there are more and more moments when consciousness makes such an orientation possible, that the soul comes to itself for a short time and then enters into a kind of sleep-like state, as one might describe it. Such moments then become ever longer. The soul increasingly becomes accustomed to such conditions until there is a complete orientation in the spiritual world. This also causes difficulties in forming clear ideas of the way that the person who has passed through the gate of death perceives his surroundings. In the last few weeks we have cremated a dear anthroposophical friend and it was the wish of the person who has now died that I took on the task of celebrating a committal festival at the place where she died for her assembled friends. In the time when I was speaking and my words had been directed to the dead person, she was as though sleeping. Then the heat took effect, the flames, as it were, took hold of the body. And at this instant a moment of consciousness came over the soul, as a moment of orientation. And the dead person then had the whole picture of what the funeral and the funeral address consisted of before her, as one has something of a spatial nature simultaneously before one. Time indeed becomes space. One sees the past not as in life, one sees the past elapsing in time, but one sees what is past before one as a spatial phenomenon. So, that what had already run its course had happened, say, a quarter of an hour before, then stood before the soul of the deceased person as a first moment of enlightenment of her consciousness. Then again a state of stupefaction came to pervade the flooding light of consciousness. In order, in this state, to reach toward those other states in which the soul gradually learns to orient itself in the spiritual world. It is important, if we want to form good conceptions about the life after death, that we keep these wholly different ideas of time in mind, that we see that time there is not something of which one can say that it has elapsed, and one recalls the things that happened in time, but what has elapsed is there before one, just as the table stands there. And this table does not go with me when I go and look back at it. So after death does what has happened, what can only be remembered, stand there. And the dead person looks back at it as in the body one looks back at spatial objects. It is very important to bear this in mind. Something further of quite particular importance that needs to be considered is that we remain in connection. Our earthly life retains a connection with what we afterward experience between death and the new birth. At any rate, it remains in close connection until the point of time that is referred to in the last mystery play as the midnight hour. It would be remiss of me not gradually to give our friends some idea of these conditions which are difficult to describe. The soul that has crossed the threshold of death looks upon what we as earthly human beings have experienced between birth and death, but not as if what one experienced then were simply there, but much of the state of being of the dead person also exerts an influence in a particular way. The state of being of a dead person is not like that of someone living between birth and death. The state of being of someone living between birth and death is such that he feels himself enclosed within his skin and looks out at the world through his senses. As soon as one enters the spiritual world as a dead person, one flows out into the whole of the spiritual world. 
One gradually feels oneself filling the whole spiritual world. And what one has experienced during physical earth existence, one senses to be something that continues to belong to one, not of course as a physical body, but as what constitutes the form, the forces of the physical body. This one retains after death. But in such a way as the human eye, E-Y-E, inhabits the physical body, just as one has the eye for seeing, so does one have oneself, the earthly life that one has lived through, as a cosmic sense organ in order to perceive the world. What our eye is now for our body, our earthly life is for our spiritual life after death. Our earthly life is used as an eye, a sense organ. You will, through lengthy meditation, gradually come to realize how significant it is to say that our earthly life becomes a sense organ for our life between death and a new birth. When a person's ego and astral body leave his physical and etheric bodies as he goes to sleep, a similar situation also pertains. When initiation occurs and he is enabled to behold the spiritual world outside his physical and etheric body, he knows in the spiritual world you perceive as through a sense organ with the spiritual part of your physical body. And you think in the spiritual world with your etheric body. Your etheric body is actually like your brain in the spiritual world. And your former physical body is a sense organ. But you yourself are, with all your life forces, spread out over the spiritual worlds. You have spread yourself out. You do not feel yourself to be concentrated by your skin in one place. You feel yourself poured forth spread out over the spiritual world. It is an entirely different existence, and to it belongs the fact that someone who himself enters the spiritual world, whether through death or through initiation, lives in a state of union with the other beings of the spiritual world, with beings of higher hierarchies, or with human souls who are living between death and a new birth, in such a way that he does not experience them as one outwardly meets earthly human beings where one is spatially separated from them. Rather, does he experience them as being with him in a common spirit realm, in a state of mutual interpenetration? What another soul experiences, one learns about not through this soul saying something to one, as with earthly human beings, but through one's living into the other soul and experiencing its thoughts as it experiences them. Hence, it is also the case that one can only be sure of really experiencing what, for example, a dead person is experiencing when one knows that one is, so to speak, within the one who has died. One is not merely giving an account of something that one apprehends from the model of something or other that one experiences on the earth, but one is aware. The dead person himself is speaking through your being. I should also like to explain this by means of an example. One of our members recently died. Already before the cremation, there was felt to be the need to apprehend what this personality had to say after death. This came about through the links that she formed with her etheric body and her capacity to express herself in, as it were, an earthly form through her etheric body, while nevertheless everything was brought together that had been interwoven with her soul through an intensive experiencing of the anthroposophical conception of the world. Thus we have to do with a personality who had reached a good old age and who in the last part of her life had been committed really intensively and with all the forces of her heart to our spiritual scientific view of the world. Then she passed through the gate of death. She therefore still had her etheric body. It was still before the cremation, and the etheric body was still there as a means of expression. This gave the possibility that she could still express herself through earthly words, because the etheric body was able to have an after-experience of them. And this liberation from the body, from earth existence, at the same time, gave the possibility of bringing together the whole being, which through the heart had been engraved in the soul. And as I was shown how this personality who had passed 
through the gate of death, wanted to express her being, approximately on the second day after her death had occurred. The words were formed that I can impart to you, words that are to be seen as words experienced by the deceased person. So that one has to imagine that here, on the second day after the death, this being of the soul that had passed through the gate of death was filled with the power of these words. And if one put oneself in the place of the soul, this being of the dead person expressed itself through one of these words. Hence I could do no better than to address these words to the dead person at the funeral, for these were the words that she herself, so to speak, spoke to the friends that stood around her earthly remains. I can give you the assurance that I have added nothing to these words, but I have tried to regard them as coming from the being of the deceased. To be sure, later there ensues what I have called the numbing or stupefying of consciousness, which one could call a state of sleep. The dead person would now not have been able to bring this being of hers to expression, because she now lacks the means of the etheric body. She will be able to do so after some time, but not immediately after death. These are the words, quote, In world expanses I will to bear my feeling heart, that warm it may become, in the fire of the working of holy forces. In world thoughts I will to weave my own thinking, that clear it may become, in the light of the eternal life in becoming. In soul foundations, I will to immerse the sense of what has been, that strong it may become, for true aims of human working. In God's peace, I so aspire, midst life's struggles and concerns, myself for the higher self preparing. Striving for peace in joyous work, Sensing world being in my own being, I would fulfill man's highest duty. May I live expectantly in the light of my destiny star that grants me the place in the realm of spirit. Close quote. This is, as it were, the result of many years' absorption in the worldview of spiritual science. This long absorption in the spiritual scientific world conception has become the essential nature of the soul itself and has expressed itself in this way. It is a clear, vivid example of how the forces of the soul are really taken hold of when one does not merely take up spiritual science in a theoretical way, but transforms it into life forces within the soul. Then the feelings and sensations that come from the spiritual scientific world conception go beyond something of a theoretical nature and themselves become forces within the soul then one can be quite certain that no one who has not become acquainted with the world conception of spiritual science would bring his own being to expression after death in words such as these, In world expanses I will to bear my feeling heart that warm it may become in the fire of the working of holy forces. In world thoughts I will to weave my own thinking that clear it may become in the light of the eternal life in becoming. I should like to place this before your souls as a clear example of the mysterious course that the human soul takes through the point of time that separates life between birth and death from the life between death and a new birth, where in a sense everything that was for us in earthly life still an outward experience becomes an inner richness of the soul and thus lives within us. Here one still receives spiritual science as something of an outward nature. Directly after death, however, it manifests itself in the soul in the way that, say, the strength of a muscle now lives in our physical body. One must have some feeling of this if one is wanting rightly to grasp the inner meaning, the inner significance of what spiritual science can be for the human soul. One will then gradually, and for this one needs to have patience, form for oneself a concept of the wholly different circumstances that pertain in the spiritual world. Whereas we formulate words and concepts for the circumstances that exist in the sense world, 
we can at best give symbols for what is in the spiritual world. One must patiently work toward developing concepts and feelings that to some extent, rightly and truly, express the circumstances prevailing in the world of spirit. The logic of earthly life, and indeed it is only a logic of earthly life, is even for earthly life sometimes thoroughly unreliable. I have already spoken here of how with the logic of earthly life one can miss, fail to recognize real facts. I have often given the following example. Suppose that someone is walking beside a river. We see that he falls into it. We hurry up and discover that he is already dead. We see a stone at the place where the person fell into the river and can now form a perfectly logical but nevertheless superficial judgment. We can say he stumbled over the stone, fell into the river and drowned. Drowning was the cause of his death. But this may be completely wrong. If one investigates the matter purely anatomically, it may turn out that the person had a heart attack and fell into the water as as a result of that. The heart attack would then be the cause of his death. With ordinary correct logic we arrive at the opposite conclusion. Such conclusions, this should be observed merely in passing, are continually drawn in human life and especially in science. Science is full of such conclusions where cause and effect are confused. But all this becomes important when questions of human destiny are concerned. In the autumn we experienced a blow of fate in Dornach, which is instructive in the most significant sense. The little seven-year-old son of one of our members, Theo Feiss, who was a very lovable, wide-awake child, went missing one evening. It was on an evening when there was a lecture. The mother went looking for the child, but he was not to be found. It was first heard that the mother was searching for the boy when the lecture was over, and the only thing that people could think was that the boy's death was connected with the accident of a furniture van. A member of our society had dispatched her furniture in a van, and in the evening this van had overturned on the spot where it was found. It was 10.15 p.m., and we made every possible effort to lift the van. Members of the military services came to help us lift this van. And when this was done, the boy was found, crushed underneath it. Now, imagine, there has never been a furniture van in this area before, and there have been none since. All possible investigations enabled one to establish that the boy had been at the very spot. It must have been a question of minutes or even a single moment when the van overturned. It was at any rate remarkable that those who were at the place where the van had overturned had initially only thought of the safety of the horses. No one had any idea that the furniture van had fallen on the little boy. So the child was dead. According to the outward materialistic view, it was pretty by chance that the van had overturned at this moment when the child came by and was crushed. This is what the materialistic view will say. From the spiritual perspective, this is complete nonsense. For what is of concern here is the karma of the child, and this karma of the child guided all the various circumstances. It had guided the furniture van there at the moment when the child needed to die, because the child's karma wished it so. The karma of the child had run its course. We have here to do with the need to reverse cause and effect. Through such circumstances and their perception, one can gradually find one's way to a real conception of life that brings us to the point of reversing what outer appearances present to us. We must do this many times over. But the situation becomes especially significant if afterward there is an experience of what arises from such a circumstance. The soul of a human being passes through the gate of death. This soul had incarnated for seven years in a physical body. Why would little tail not have been able to live for seventy, eighty, or ninety years, when viewed outwardly, if karma had not made it impossible? He had an etheric body that could have supported life for decades, an etheric body that was indeed full of forces of the eternal, of the good. He was a boy with outstanding qualities. As you know, the actual individuality, the ego and astral body, continues on its own path. 
but the etheric body separates out. This etheric body into which are woven all the beautiful tender forces that have developed in the age of childhood, but in which also live all the forces that come from former incarnations. Now consider what one has before one with such an etheric body. The individuality comes from former incarnations. It embodies itself in this incarnation. It brings with it what comes from former incarnations. The life in this incarnation is in a certain sense the fruit, the realization of what resided as a cause in former incarnations. These fruits would then have been able to come to fulfillment throughout the present life. Everything that derives from the fruits of former incarnations would then have passed into this etheric body. This did not happen. Thus, in this etheric body, everything that exists by way of causes in the former incarnations finds its place. And what is most remarkable is this. Anyone who tries to investigate the aura of our building in Dornach will find this etheric body of little tail in the aura of this building. It is there. It hovers around and surrounds the building in Dornach with its life. Anyone who has something to do with the building, or will have something to do with it, since that late autumnal afternoon when little Theo crossed the threshold of death, knows what was changed in the spiritual aura of the Dornach building. Because in this aura there has been assimilated that etheric body which contains the forces that would otherwise have been used for the sustenance of a physical human body for several decades. And this etheric body has flowed forth into this aura of the building. So mysterious are the paths that the wisdom flowing through the world has to traverse with its creatures. The only right conceptions of the way that human life as a whole takes its course, and this eminently includes the life between death and a new birth, are those that enter into the details of these things. And since our anthroposophical movement should not be abstract in any way, but should be something in which we and also those that belong to us are involved with our whole being, it may also be possible to speak about such things. Unlike other societies, we do not ally ourselves only with a particular program, but we want to be engaged in our spiritual scientific movement with our entire soul. We want to think of this spiritual scientific movement as an actual stream to which each person belongs who really adheres to it with all his feelings. Thus we can say that we speak as one speaks here and there in an extended family about those belonging to it, for what touches us in a familiarly intimate way at the same time gives us the highest, most significant, and for us the most important information about the spiritual world. Out of such a mood I should like to mention another of the many deaths of our friends that have occurred in recent times, Fritz Mitscher, who was an infinitely dear friend of all of us, passed through the gate of death not long ago, and it turned out that the necessity arose for me to formulate in words what my own soul felt as it inclined toward the soul that had just crossed the threshold of death. Notice the difference between the previous words that I read out to you and the words that I now want to recite. The words that I have just read to you derived from the soul of the deceased person. The words that I shall now share with you were stirred within my own soul on beholding in a soul sense the dead person Fritz Mitscher, still united with his etheric body. It is therefore the impression that the dead person made which is now communicated in these words. You may perhaps know that Fritz Mitscher was already active on behalf of our Anthroposophical Society as a young teacher in many different places, especially in Berlin. And many of us also know how it was in so beautiful a way his will to connect what he had been able to acquire of knowledge and learning of the earth with the noblest and most exemplary Anthroposophical awareness. This expresses itself also after death, when in his entire being there is united what he was and what now radiates after death from his soul in its body-free state, but still united with its etheric body. And it seems to me that what Fritz Mitscher was after death 
had to be expressed with the words that I felt obliged to send to him at the cremation. Quote, As a hope that gladdens us, so do you venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. Your longing had its deep affinity with a pure love of truth, The goal to which you tirelessly aspired throughout your life was creation from the spirit light. You cultivated your fine gifts to follow with sure step the radiant path of spirit knowledge, unswayed by outward opposition as a true servant of the truth. Your spirit organs you enhanced that they boldly and persistently thrust error from you to both sides of the path and create for you a realm of truth, to fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within you, was your concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched your soul, for knowledge as the light that to existence meaning gives held for you life's truest worth. As a hope that gladdens us, So do you venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. A loss that deeply us aggrieves, so do you vanish from the field where earthly seeds of spirit have matured for your senses' spheres in the womb of soul-being. Feel how we look lovingly up to the heights that called you now, away for other creating. Extend your strength from realms of spirit to the friends you've left behind. Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. As a hope that gladdens us, a loss that deeply us aggrieves, let us hope that from far and near, unforsaken for our life, you shine as starry soul in spirit realms. These are the words that were sent from the one who had died to the being of this deceased person. And then some time passed after these words were spoken at the cremation, and from the being of the person who had died, sounding forth not as yet from a well-ordered consciousness, but as from his essential nature, the following words could be heard, words that, therefore, now resounded from the one who had died in the night following the cremation. Quote, To fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul. For knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Thus did the words resound. I had afterward discovered that the two verses had been directly transmuted from you to your to me or my. I had not been aware of this before, for I had heard the verses as I first read them to you, and now they came back from the being of the person who had died, spoken by him. Quote, to fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Mother cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul, for knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Close quote. This shows that also, at the time when consciousness does not yet have the form that it has after this time, from the soul, throughout the period between death and the new birth, the words that are addressed to the dead person come livingly and meaningfully transformed. One must merely feel the extent to which the spiritual scientific world conception becomes truly alive in forming connections between the physical and spiritual worlds. For a sense of consternation may well pass through our soul, if we feel through such an example that the words are addressed to the dead person and he repeats them back to us unchanged, 
but our feeling is that on the one hand they have reached the dead person because they have resounded back from him, though not as an echo, but changed in a meaningful way. These are things that give us the assurance, the confidence also for our present time, that the souls that live here in earthly bodies have a connection with the spiritual powers working and weaving through the world, and that the earthly souls of human beings that have passed through death are interwoven with this stream of spiritual powers, wherein they experience their further destiny after they have died. If we allow the connection of the physical world with the spiritual world rightly to exert its influence upon our hearts and minds, we can indeed extend our consideration to other things. I have on a previous occasion indicated also here that in this interaction, this quite specific interplay between the physical and spiritual worlds, we find ourselves drawn quite especially toward the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha. We well know that it is only really now that we are through spiritual science beginning fully to take into account the meaning and significance of the mystery of Golgotha and of the Christ being. Hitherto people have done this, and rightly, with their reasoning powers. And what has emerged from this? Well, if the influence of Christ in the earthly life of human beings had been dependent upon what they have understood of it, the influence of the Christ impulse on earth can hardly be very great. Theological quarreling and all manner of arguments have characterized people's understanding of Christianity. But Christ has worked out of a living power. I have also previously referred here to the example of the battle that Constantine waged against Maxentius, through which the destiny of Europe at that time was decided. With this, Christianity was first really recognized and then became the ruling power in Europe. This battle was not won through military tactics or through the armies of Constantine. Maxentius had Rome to defend. Through consulting the books of the Sibyls, and through a dream that he had had, he had been led to believe that his army, which was five times stronger than that of Constantine, who was marching against Rome, was to be led by him out of Rome. He would then annihilate Rome's enemies. He indeed led his army out of Rome, strategically the most inept thing that he could have done. For, from a strategical point of view, everything was in favor of leaving his army in Rome and letting the enemy armies approach, but he led his army out of Rome. As for Constantine, who was leading his armies against Rome, what gave him his power was not technical skill of a military nature, but rather a dream that he had had. The dream's message was, If you let Christ's monogram go at the head of our army, you will conquer Rome. As a result of Constantine's victory with his weak army, the whole map of Europe was transformed at that time and for future times. The cultural life of Europe thereby also became different. What people in those days were able to fathom of all this would not have sufficed to accomplish what was achieved. The Christ impulse was working into the subconscious regions of human beings, into what lived in the depths of people's souls, of which they could only dream in the dream pictures that sprang up before them. We have a later and highly significant example of the influence of the Christ impulse in the Maid of Orleans. Anyone who really studies history, that is, not in the way that history is often studied today, but through trying to recognize the actual connections, can know that, again, through what the Maid of Orleans did, the destiny of Europe was defined in an absolute sense for the next few centuries. For what was decisive for this destiny of Europe and especially that of France, was not military strategy or the wisdom of politicians, but the deeds of the shepherdess of Orleans, in whom the Christ impulse was working through his representative Michael. Her soul was wholly imbued with and inspired by the Christ impulse. Just as the Christ impulse was an active force when the battle between Constantine and Maxentius was decided, without people being consciously aware of this, so was the Christ impulse also a contributory factor when the Maid of Orleans sent the French armies to meet the English armies. The whole continent of Europe, including England, would have taken a different course 
if France had not been victorious then. England, too, would not have been what it became if it had not been defeated. But, as said, what brought the victory about were the subconscious forces that manifested themselves in visions, and the abilities of the Maid of Orleans were inspired by them. Thus one can say, what the Maid of Orleans did stands under the influence of an initiation that was more or less unconscious, a pure soul vessel, such as the Maid of Orleans was, through which the Christ impulse could work through his Michaelic representative, had to be unconsciously taken hold of and encompassed. Let us look more closely at what is involved here. When someone today consciously undergoes an initiation, there are rules for this. The rudiments of this are explained in my book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? There are rules through which one can gradually make progress in this respect. The initiation of the Maid of Orleans could not, of course, have been of this kind. But a spirit not otherwise united with the human soul must have taken up its abode in this human soul and pervaded it. For this to happen, there would have to have been particularly favorable circumstances. It is not always that a spirit of higher spheres can exert such an influence upon souls that have the capacity for this. Particularly favorable circumstances must be in place in order that an individual human soul may, without initiation, without special work, come into connection with higher worlds. Such circumstances are present in the time when the spirit of the earth wakes up, as it were, in the time from 25 December until 6 January, when, in summer, the sun is at its highest, when the physical warmth of the earth rays out to the greatest extent, the conditions for initiation are most unfavorable, because then the spirit of the earth is asleep. The spirit of the earth is most wakeful in the darkness of winter, at the winter solstice. Hence it is no mere legend, but corresponds to a truth, when it is related in old legends that in the thirteen nights preceding the 6th of January, certain especially suitable souls were initiated, so that they were able to enter the spiritual world, so that they were able to experience there what we call Kamaloka and Devakan. We may well recall the recitation here in Hanover of the legend of Olaf Astason, who in the thirteen nights traversed in sleep the whole path that can constitute the path through Kamaloka and Devakan. Olaf Astason then relates what he has experienced in these thirteen days. When, therefore, outward physical earthly darkness is at its strongest, the circumstances are most favorable for leading a soul into the spiritual world. For souls that are initiated, not through directly conscious work, but through particularly favorable circumstances, for a deed on behalf of humanity as a whole, such as the maid of Orleans accomplished, it would therefore have been most favorable if she could have been able to sleep in the thirteen nights, and moreover, in connection with the spiritual worlds. Thus, if she could have undergone all this in a kind of sleeping condition. Now, it is indeed so that the Maid of Orleans passed through such a state of sleep. This was because the Maid of Orleans spent these thirteen days until 6 January in her mother's body, in a state where a person is still asleep. For a human individual only awakes to physical life when he has been born and takes his first breath. In the Maid of Orleans' case, the last nights of sleep during the embryonic state fell in the time of the thirteen nights, for she was born on 6 January. Here you have the foundation of the mission of the Maid of Orleans, to whom it was given, as this pure soul before her first breath, in the last thirteen nights of her mother's pregnancy, to receive initiation in this state of sleep, in the particularly favorable circumstances of earthly life. The calendar makes this perfectly plain. For if you open up a calendar, you will find that on 6 January, the Maid of Orleans has her birthday. Thus the calendar shows that a deeply inward connection exists between the physical and spiritual worlds. 
it was of course necessary for the soul of the maid of Orleans to be prepared through its previous incarnations, but as in the thirteen nights this soul met with what was able to come through it, what ensued historically occurred in order at this point in the evolution of mankind to make the intervention of the spiritual world into the physical world possible. Thus the spiritual world is always there with all its various aspects. The spiritual world is always among us. And the ways that the spiritual world seeks out in order to exert an influence in the physical world are many and various in nature. Our awareness of the connection with the spiritual world becomes ever stronger the more in such instances we find expression with a particular depth to the connections between the physical and spiritual world in that such connections remain livingly in our soul. On the other hand, one must say that what happens here in the physical world can also serve as preparation for the nature of the connection between the spiritual and physical worlds. And if someone who has taken up as intensively as Fritz Mitcher what flows through our spiritual science and in the thirtieth year of his life passes into the spiritual world, his thirtieth birthday would have been on 26 February, and has impregnated his soul with the power that can pervade it through our spiritual science, we have a mighty individuality who will remain together with us in the spiritual world and who is a helper of the greatest possible stature. And when one calls to mind how difficult the aspiration toward spiritual knowledge is in our time, beset as it is with materialism, It may perhaps also be said that anyone who is connected with the spiritual world with every fiber of his being places the greatest hopes on those who can be spiritual helpers, who become spiritual helpers after laying aside their physical body. It does, of course, not need to be said that this crossing of the threshold of death can never be a personal decision, but that it can be brought about only through karma. These spiritual helpers are those who give us hope and consolation, when we see how difficult it becomes precisely at this present time to bring our spiritual scientific movement through the many hindrances. But we know that higher spiritual forces exert their influence upon the earth in order that the stream of the spiritual worlds may contribute to the physical purposes of the earth. Thus the unused forces of human souls come into the spiritual worlds so that these forces may be active there in conjunction with other forces. Thus it was that I truly called out the following words to our Fritz Mitcher from my innermost heart. Quote, Hear the entreaty of our souls, sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. Close quote. Then when, in an honest way, we try to bring our spiritual movement further toward its goal. We are conscious that the forces that are available to us here on the earth are supplemented by those which our friends have already borne through the gate of death into the spiritual world. We can also gather all this together for an understanding of the general world situation. The human souls who are, because of the fateful events of the time, now passing through the gate of death, bear their etheric bodies, on the one hand, to the folk spirits. On the other hand, they bear everything that they have summoned up by way of sacrificial devotion, in that, through the very nature of these events of the time, they have passed through the gate of death with their individuality. And all this will be poured forth as an active influence into the time that is to come. It will, in this respect, be dependent upon those people who live through the peace to form out of themselves a connection with what will, as it were, descend from above. Those who as mothers and fathers, as brothers and sisters or relatives of some other kind, are today experiencing the decease of those dear to them on the battlefield, can receive into their consciousness the fact that with the etheric body something of immense significance for the future passes over into the general affairs of earthly humanity. Not only that they can know that individualities are strengthened and fortified, 
for a subsequent life of greater intensity through a sacrificial death. But they can also know that what the warrior who has passed through the gate of death has transmitted to the folk soul is a living reality. Moreover, it should be said that those who have crossed the threshold of death when they are young have fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers engaged with the common folk soul and with their individuality. And this idea will only have significant value when it has wholly become a feeling, so that one will know in one's feelings the dead are there, they are amongst us. When this bond will be so strong that death actually becomes an untruth also for our feeling. For when we can summon up all his forces and no longer has the hindrances of a physical body, a dead person is often able to manifest himself more truly than in his physical embodiment. Powerful streams of consolation, streams of an inner capacity to bring comfort, emanate from what spiritual science can give to souls in living consciousness and living feelings. Then, when this is experienced in this way, especially those who ally themselves with spiritual science, can look full of hope toward the future. They can experience these fateful and momentous events as something like the dawn of a time of transition, which will be followed by a sun-filled time of peace. But an important part of the spiritual potency of this sun-filled time of peace will be what has been achieved by the sacrificial death of so many. It will be made fruitful here on earth, especially if a bridge, a link is formed between the living, the souls incarnated here on earth in a physical body, and the souls that are above and want to ray down what they have received. And it is here where a real understanding of spiritual science strikes so truly a chord within our heart and calls on us to do what we are able to accomplish out of the awareness that we have gained through spiritual science, what we are able to do and feel in order that the great destiny-stirring, grief-outpouring events of the present time may, to the extent that it lies within our power, turn out to be fruitful and healing for mankind. Those who know something of spiritual science can feelingly know and knowingly feel how the bridge up to the spiritual world is created, namely, that from souls that have remained below, thoughts and feelings are sent, which can be kindled through spiritual science. The horizon for this will be an horizon of peace. The souls that will want to send down the spiritual rays of light will be above. There must be people below who have learned to send up from their souls such thoughts and feelings as are inspired by spiritual science. When there are indeed souls who with an awareness of the Spirit direct their minds into the Spirit realm, the time will then have come when, precisely through such fateful and grievous events as are taking place in our time, an intimate bond must be woven between the physical world and the spiritual world to which we aspire through our spiritual science. So, let us summarize what our understanding and our task shall be and what shall awaken our confidence in the words, From the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote, translated by George and Mary Adams. That is the end of Lecture 2. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at uh, RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159, by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures entitled The Mystery of Death, and uh, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is Lecture 3, given in Bremen, on the 21st of February, 1915, entitled Spiritual Science and the Riddles of Death, 
deeper connections of European history. In our times, what is referred to in spiritual science as the riddles of death come to our attention in a particularly meaningful way. Everything has either a close or distant connection with them. We receive, above all from spiritual science, not only the fundamental conviction but the basic knowledge about the world in the physical body and about the world that we enter through the portal of death. But this latter world actually also always livingly surrounds us in our sensory existence, although it is not discernible to someone who is strongly attached to the life of the senses, because he is insufficiently attentive to it. When such dramatic events as now surround us are pervading the age that demands such a multitude of sacrifices from human beings, we must engage with them with our whole soul. It is in this respect clearly apparent that there are many things which can be illumined from the standpoint of spiritual science. We wish to direct our attention to realms of life where it is evident that humanity has, through a materialistic way of thinking, arrived at a disastrous degree of illogicality with respect to what is going on around it. We hear, for example, the various nations reproaching one another in the manner that is familiar today. I did not want the war. It was you who started it. The question is in itself justified, and it can already now be stated, for the facts speak for themselves, where the outward causes lie. But someone viewing this from the perspective of spiritual science will see it differently. With regard to this question, he must be clear that the war is actually a final phase, or at any rate a later phase, in the course of the events that came before. One also commits an error of judgment in the case of processes of illness, where one often continues to speak of such processes when there are processes of health which need to occur in order to bring healing. The outward processes that ensue in order to paralyze the illness, in order to bring healing, and which have previously taken place, are not noticed. The war also represents an apparent process of illness. It is an endeavor on the part of mankind to reach beyond certain events which preceded it. The sickness resides in the unhealthy relationships of nations with one another. When one investigates outward causes with one's reasoning powers, one overlooks the inner causes. Where we are, as though herded together as in a fortress and surrounded by a ring, there is good cause to raise the question as to the inner reasons or the nature of the soul reason that this encirclement was brought about. People speak of an encirclement in relation to recent years, to the last few decades. But when one considers the wider context, one sees that it begins much, much earlier. It may sound strange, but one can identify the year 860, not 1860, but 860, the process that now comes to expression in a manner that one can designate as the most terrible war that humanity has faced since its time on earth began, has lasted as long as this. In the deeper context of European history, one finds the highly remarkable thing that in Central Europe something of the nature of spiritual substance was pressed together. And if one investigates these deeper connections, one sees that this was with a particular object in view. It does not have to do with the outer determining factors of blood, of race, but with the fact that something of the nature of a spiritual substance pervades the world. Something draws together in Central Europe as in a snake-like ring that comes down from the extreme north. Two streams from the east and west reach in the form of a ring toward the south and come together again in a similar pattern. In the ninth century, the Norsemen, who are related by blood with so much, move down from a center which later comes to be in Central Europe, but they invade the Roman element, which derives from Southern Europe. They intermingle with it. In 1860, they stand before Paris, and the Vikings are overpowered by the Romans. The western territory of France owes its origin to this. The Vikings, as Normans, 
brought more to England from France than the Angles and Saxons were able to bring to the British Isles. In the east, the Vikings migrated further. They forced their way down from the north toward the Volga and the Black Sea into Slavic territory. Later, the Tartar stream invades. The Slavic element racially overwhelms the Vikings and brings them the Christian religion in its eastern form. They become Slavicized as Ros. This is what they are called in Finland, nothing of which remains other than the name Russia. This name is of Germanic origin. The name Rurik has the same origin. People have very dubious views about these connections. In the west of Europe, many speak of how the French are called to re-enliven the old Celtic world in a kind of renaissance. There is the idea that in Central Europe there are predominantly Germans, whereas the West is the cradle of Celtic culture. But the truth is the reverse of this, in that in the French there is far more German blood and in Central Europe more Celtic blood. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of the West are completely overwhelmed by Romanism. In the East, the Viking element, and hence the Germanic heritage, are overpowered by a foreign racial element, and a religion that is completely alien to the Russian folk soul continues to hold sway there. Thus people in Central Europe are confined within these encircling arcs. The Romans reach as far as Constantinople, as do the Slavicized Norsemen, so we have the form of a snake or ring. When we consider what was spiritually pressed together then, we have the impression that it has a particularly important task. Yesterday I gave an indication of something of which I have spoken elsewhere, that a certain intimate association of the folk soul with the individual soul was to take place here, and fruits of the fairest kind were to be brought forth within the best of those involved. The ego is to be directly embraced, not the particular soul members, as in the West. The ego was to be directly enlivened. It arises from this, as must already be clear from viewing these things exoterically, that in Central Europe there could never be total hostility toward idealism, that to an intense degree there was always a certain inclination toward the spiritual world. When we began our spiritual movement, karma disposed that we had, initially, to work in conjunction with the British movement. But outwardly, everything further was only a symptom of what had to occur with a certain necessity. When we consider what the theosophical movement from which we had to separate ourselves actually is, it will be apparent that cultural life has fallen there into two parts. Outer life takes a purely materialistic course, and the spiritual element is added on to it. They always go their separate ways. Contrast with this what our spiritual life must be for us. Just as in the organism the head cannot be thought of without the body, so does our spiritual life grow out of the overall cultural life. One needs only to begin with Tauler, Eckhart, Angelus Silesius, and then proceed to Herder and Lessing. Everywhere we must develop from this what shall become a higher spiritual culture. We cannot simply attach our spiritual outlook to what we find. We must conceive of it as an organism and raise it to such a status. We must inwardly make the discovery that Christ's second coming is a spiritual affair. Hence we cannot make even the smallest concession. We can only approach Christ as a figure with the eye, E-Y-E, of spirit, with an inner experience. In the West he is forced into a materialized mold, made into something dogmatic. People could not but imagine that he would come in the physical body. Hence the grotesque idea of putting Christ publicly on display in the body. This happened in connection with what was circumscribed at that time. Thus this question must touch us quite objectively. How must Central European culture relate to the culture of the future. Truth is something universal, but how it arises is a different matter. In Central European culture lie the sources 
for the whole spiritual culture of the future. We must find the path from German idealism to a spiritual culture. To this end, it is necessary that here in this central region, a culture of the ego is established. On the occult plane, this can easily be seen. The human ego must be enkindled by the outer world since it first awakens and becomes inwardly conscious. Thus the ego culture of Central Europe is inspired from without. One needs only to observe recent events, the unification of the German nature. It is characteristic that the German Reich was founded in 1871 on foreign soil. So many things could be said that show also, in outer events, that a culture of the ego holds sway in Central Europe. It seems appropriate to ask, what significance do sacrificial deaths have for the spiritual world? Countless human beings are passing through the portal of death in the flower of their youth. First, the connection between ego, astral body, and etheric body separates from the physical body. The physical body is seemingly given over to the earth, the etheric body to the etheric world. Astral body and ego go further on their way. But it must surely occur to us that the relationship that a person has to his etheric body when he passes at a normal age through the gate of death is different from that of those young people who are doing so now. One understands this at the level of the physical body and one now comes to understand it for the etheric body. It would still have supported the physical body for decades and been able to work upon it. It goes through the gate of death with these unused forces, is united with the folk soul, and the work of the folk soul will in future be impregnated with the unused forces of these etheric bodies. It is up to us to have an understanding of this. There will be people who will know that the folk soul is an active element. Only if one knows that unspent forces of etheric bodies will work as a spiritual power in a quite specific way in the spiritual world can one understand what actually goes on. The awareness of this connection with the spiritual world becomes important. Through the engendering of such an awareness of the spiritual world, spiritual science will increasingly become something living in people's hearts and minds and not remain a mere teaching. A person knows that he is in a spiritual aura, just as he knows here that the air is all around him. Just as he distinguishes here between fresh and stale air, so will be aware of good and evil spirits in experiencing the spiritual aura. This is indeed the right fruit of spiritual science. We see it when we observe events affecting us that we may find instructive, One such event occurred where our building is located. This concerned a child, the forces of whose etheric body were unspent. For someone to see who knows how to see, the forces have passed into the aura of our Dornach building and live there. This is something for which I can vouch. The etheric body, which as regards its forces, belongs more to the commonality, continues to exert a rightful influence. Since then it has tried to do something through inspirations in the vicinity of the building. These are helping forces. Such things come to our attention. We can let ourselves be instructed by them as to how mysterious the connections are in the spiritual world. In recent times we have had the experience in the karma of our society that dear friends have through death been taken from us away from the physical plane. What I said in the Vienna cycle about the life between death and a new birth was made very clear to many by these souls. One of these souls has found the way into our movement when the physical body was already worn out. This was a being who, since belonging to our movement, manifested herself to me in her soul nature through a body that had become translucent. After death, the image of the soul that I had formerly known was interwoven with the way that it presented itself afterward. The following words made themselves audible approximately three days after death had occurred. Quote, you appeared among us. The moving gentleness of your being spoke 
out of the quiet power of your eyes, an enlivening peace flowed in the waves with which your gaze conveyed the weaving of your inner being to all things and to other people. And this being was ensouled by your voice, which eloquently, more through the manner of speaking than the words themselves, revealed what lay hidden within your beautiful soul. Yet wordlessly they fully revealed the devoted love to those attentive to it. This being who from a quiet, noble beauty proclaimed to the receptive a feeling of world-soul creativity. Close quote. After death there is a dimming of consciousness because it is being flooded with activity. This happens through the review that is the first thing that occurs after death, not in a case of suicide, as a kind of solar point. It is one of the most beautiful and highest of experiences. One begins by saying, This has been your life, and through this one orients oneself in the spiritual world. Our friend had emerged from the stage of the etheric review so that one spoke to the being who was indeed present but not conscious. Then, through the heat, came a moment of consciousness and she saw the cremation. Time becomes space. There is a correspondence between what takes place in the physical and in the spiritual world. In such a case, a call does not resound from the spiritual world like an echo, but is transformed into a comprehensible answer from the not-as-yet conscious soul through such examples of the feeling that can be discerned in us, in the knowledge of the spiritual world apprehended by our feelings, the result must be that we experience the reality of the spiritual world. It is particularly important to acquire this definite feeling in our time in order that healing for the whole of humanity, in both its physical and soul aspects, may grow out of the grave nature of the present. For great events of world significance have always also been, for a superficial spiritual knowledge, the clear expression that in the world of the senses we have not only sense-perceptible things, but that spiritual beings are involved with them. It is difficult to break through the veil that separates the physical from the spiritual world. This makes self-knowledge difficult in the broadest sense. People often take too facile a view of it, Even in an outward physical sense, it is sometimes difficult. The notable philosopher, Professor Ernst Mach, not Ferdinand Mach, I would not otherwise have spoken of a notable philosopher, has given a grotesque example of this. In one of his works, Mach says that when he was a young man, an unpleasant, somewhat repugnant face had once appeared to him, reflected in a shop window which to his consternation he was obliged to recognize as his own. He experienced something similar again on a subsequent occasion. On boarding a bus he saw a man with an ugly face approaching him from the other direction and belatedly recognized that he had seen himself in the mirror. People have a great deal of unclarity about the nature, the form of the soul, and all that one has to go through in order to come to self-knowledge is something that they can scarcely dream of. To a considerable degree, maya is a present reality in the depths of the soul. A person has the drive toward cruelty. He lives with people whom from time to time he torments, and so on. He searches for an outward cause for this. He often invents brilliant reasons for casting a veil over the whole fabric of the soul. I myself knew someone who always spoke of how he had accomplished what he had through great sacrifices, but I had to say that it was only an inner sensuality that satisfied him. When he spoke of sacrifices, egotism alone stood behind everything. True self-knowledge can be attained only if one gradually advances in spiritual knowledge, insofar as one experiences through oneself what is in the world. There are in the world people who love to organize opportunities for gossiping. This even occurs among men gathering for their evening drink. When they are asked why they gossip, people have all kinds of important reasons for it. But if we run our fingers through all the finery, we have a feeling of pleasure. When one gossips, the etheric body constantly comes in contact with the air that is set in motion. It is thereby stroked. 
There is nothing baneful in this. One only understands what happens when people gossip if one knows that man has an etheric body. Humanity is approaching a time when it must increasingly look such things in the face. It will then occur that the people who maintain today in their materialistic outlook that everything spiritual is sheer fantasy will look as they would if someone wanted to say that where the air is, there is nothing but empty space. Just as one discovers that the air is real, so will humanity discover that the spirit is a reality. When one considers the greatest of all mysteries, the mystery of Golgotha, one can believe that Christ had mainly influenced mankind through a teaching once he had passed through the mystery of Golgotha. But what people have known about Christ is the very smallest part. Theologians have squabbled with one another, but the least of them have understood something right. Only a part of what happens in history forms part of one's conscious understanding. One example of this is the battle between Maxentius and Constantine at Milvian Bridge on 28 October 312, which was decided not through outward circumstances of whatever kind, but through influences of a non-physical nature. With an army that was far stronger than that of his opponent, Constantine, Maxentius had Rome to defend. On consulting the books of the Sibyls, it was indicated to him that he should lead his troops out of Rome. In this way, he would destroy Rome's enemies. He was further confirmed in this by a dream. Constantine also had a dream. He was charged with having his soldiers preceded by a banner with Christ's monogram instead of the old standard. Thus it happened, and the armies of Maxentius which in defiance of all reason was led out of Rome, was defeated by Constantine's weaker military forces, and Maxentius himself met his death in his flight. The Christ impulse had here worked right into the subconscious of human beings. The impulse lives in the subconscious in the same way that while ships are voyaging on the sea, what really matters is enacted in submarines. In the 15th century, there was another important moment, At that time, the Maid of Orleans entered into the course of history in such a way that everything that happened subsequently was determined by this. The whole map of Europe, and also its cultural life, would have been different if the English had been victorious. The Maid of Orleans was a servant of Michael. Schiller was deeply moved by the figure of the Maid of Orleans. Quote, the world loves to besmirch what is radiant, close quote whereas Voltaire spat poison and gall at her. Shakespeare himself could not understand her. Anatole Francais dragged her into the morass of materialism, and all Western cultural figures failed to understand her. Schiller embodied this noble figure in his drama. In order that the Maid of Orleans could fulfill her historical mission, it was necessary that she underwent a kind of unconscious initiation. This was an initiation of the kind that is described in the legend of Olaf Astesen. Such initiations, for which certain karmic preconditions had to be present, could take place in the time of the thirteen nights between 25 December and 6 January, when the outer light has the least strength and inner enlightenment is most possible. Thus Olaf Astesen had real spiritual experiences in the state of sleep during the thirteen nights, which he then related before the church door, as it says in the dream song. The Maid of Orleans also, in a certain sense, spent the thirteen nights in a state of sleep, namely, in the body of her mother. In the last period before birth, a person is especially accessible to unconscious influences from the spiritual world. The Maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. On this day, all the inhabitants of her place of birth came together, because something quite extraordinary could be felt in the aura of the village. It was the birth of the Maid of Orleans, in whom the Christ impulse had been implanted immediately before she perceived the physical light of the sun. The true goal of all our endeavors, and what really matters to us, is to discover the living aspect of the connection between the physical and spiritual worlds. It will come to be recognized that the twilight period of this war 
signifies a turning point of time. Human beings shall know that the souls of those who have sacrificed themselves work further and that this war has the task of bringing the age of materialism to an end. It is necessary that there are souls who send thoughts up into the spiritual world like outstretched hands and bring down the consciousness from the spiritual world, souls with a spiritual consciousness. The more such spirit-conscious souls send forth their thoughts, and much is dependent upon our spiritual atmosphere, being pervaded by such thoughts, the more will the fruits deriving from sacrificial deaths be able to ripen. Thus we may summarize our considerations today in these words, quote, From the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. The end of Lecture 3. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures, entitled The Mystery of Death. Translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang. This is Lecture 4, given in Leipzig on the 7th of March, 1915, entitled The Intimate Element of Central European Culture and Its Aspirations. We live in difficult, destiny-laden times. And what these destiny-laden times will bring to us earthly human beings is something that very few souls anticipate with full confidence. Moreover, The significance of what comes to expression through the events of these days does not speak to souls with any degree of clarity. However, it is precisely those who try, as human souls, increasingly to enter into what should be assimilated by way of impulses into the cultural evolution of humanity, into the spiritual evolution of culture, through the demands of spiritual science, who should know themselves to be connected in their deepest, innermost feelings with what is taking place around us, on the one hand on so vast a scale, and on the other hand so painfully and so distressingly. What is taking place is something that not only in its nature but also in its degree is indeed without parallel in the conscious history of human evolution, that enters deeply and decisively into every living aspect of earthly evolution. One needs but to gain an inner sense of what it means, and this applies today to every person in Europe, to stand amidst the course of events of such significance in order to feel that this is a time when it is not only eminently right, but also eminently necessary, that the soul frees itself ever more and more from a mere life within its own self, within its own ego, and to try to share in the experience of the common fate that has befallen mankind. The soul will, in our present time, be able to learn much if it knows to connect itself in the right way with the stream of events, and it will be able to free itself from much pettiness and selfishness if it knows how to do this. Things of such magnitude are happening that virtually any thinking purely of oneself in this time of ours must be seen as a robbery that our soul commits with respect to living in association with common destinies. And what immense questions, especially those living in Central Europe, must be asking themselves about things that they can really only learn now. Such people can become aware that they are misunderstood and indeed hated. These misunderstandings, this hatred, did not really emerge since the beginning of the war. It is only that they became apparent from that time. Thus the beginning of the war and the course of the war are also merely that which makes Central European souls aware that they must feel themselves, in a certain sense, more or less increasingly isolated with regard to the feelings of those people who surround the inhabitants of Central Europe with feelings and sensibilities that are thoroughly lacking in understanding. How desirable it would be, especially now, 
if in the souls that are dedicated to spiritual science one could kindle an intensified interest in the great events of life, which lead the soul out from the horizon of its ego to the great horizon of human and earthly events. What benefit there would be if precisely in the souls that have embraced spiritual science their vision and mental outlook could be extended to a knowledge of the wider forces involved and thus bring them out of an interest in narrower forces concerned merely with the human individual. For indeed, when one hears today what the world, and especially the world around us, as Central Europeans is saying, when one reads what strange things are being said about the impulses that are supposed to have led to this war, one has the feeling that mankind has completely lost the obligation to judge in accordance with wider viewpoints in our materialistic age to the extent that one sometimes has the impression that people had learned nothing whatsoever, but that for them history really began on 25 July 1914. It is as though people knew nothing of what has taken place in the interplay of forces among the earth's population, and what has accordingly led to the problematic complications that finally ignited and flared up in the flame of the war. Hardly anything is said of the encirclement tactics of the former English king, who has united the European powers around Central Europe, so that in the end, because of this union of the surrounding human forces, the only possible consequence was what has arisen. Hardly anyone is likely to go back a few years or at most decades and endeavor to form some ideas of how what now so painfully and fatefully surrounds us has come about but things lie at a much, much deeper level. When one speaks of encirclement, one must say, what has been accomplished as regards the encircling of the Central European powers in recent times has been the last stage, the final step of an encirclement of Central Europe, which began a long, long time ago, and already in the year 860, at that time when the Norsemen or Vikings who swept down from the north of Europe, were gathered before Paris, a part of the power which was to come to full expression in Europe entered in the west of Europe into the Roman stream that had flooded into western Europe from the south. We have a stream of human forces that pours from Rome by way of Italy, Sicily, and modern Spain, and through what is now France, while the Viking invaders who came from the north and in 860 were before Paris, are overwhelmed by the Roman stream deriving from antiquity and are absorbed in this Roman stream. The vigor possessed by this stream derives from the Viking element that is absorbed within it. And what arose in the West as something alien to Central European culture derives from the Roman stream that had flooded into it. This Roman stream did not simply come to a halt in modern France, but through its dogmatically rationalistic nature, through its inclination toward a materialist manner of thinking, it proved itself well capable of overwhelming not only France, but when the Normans then reached out their hands to what are today the Anglo-Saxon lands, of causing the decisive element in what came to the Anglo-Saxon world to lie, not in what the Vikings had brought from the north to the south, but in what they had received from the south. Also in the British element, it is the Roman element that thereby opposes, without understanding, what lives in Central Europe. And this Norman element, infiltrated by the Roman element, has further extended beyond the coasts of Greece to Constantinople so that we see a flood of Viking-imbued Roman culture moving down from the European north to the west, encircling Central Europe in a snake-like form and extending its tentacles as far as Constantinople. The other migratory movement emanating from the north we see flowing to the east and penetrating into the Slavic world. The first Viking invaders were given the name of Ross by the largely Finnish inhabitants, of what is now modern Russia, hence the name Russians, which is therefore reminiscent of the name that the Finns gave to the Viking population. We see these Nordic peoples extending into the Slavic element, entering ever further into it, 
and at the same time, when the Vikings had gathered before Paris and began the process of their Romanization, we see the Viking element becoming immersed in the Slavic stream, and on the other hand, moving down to beyond Kiev and on to Constantinople, and the circle is closed. The Norse or Viking forces move down on the one hand to the west and become Romanized, and on the other hand to the east, where they are Slavicized, and as they approach from east and west, they collide with one another in Constantinople. And in Central Europe, there is enclosed, as in a kind of cultural basin, what remains of the primal Germanic world, fructified by the ancient Celtic world. And this Germanic world then finds expression in the most diverse ways, in the populations that manifest themselves as the inhabitants of Germany, Holland, and Scandinavia. Thus we see how old this encirclement is. In this central Europe there is now being prepared what we can call an intimate culture, a culture that was never in a position of developing, as does culture in the West or in the East, but which had to take a completely different course. If we compare the culture that has developed in Central Europe with what has developed in the West, we would be bound to say that in the West there developed, and this can be seen from the smallest and most prominent characteristics of this culture, a culture whose basic character can be traced from the British Isles, by way of France and Spain, to Sicily and Italy and to Constantinople. The basic feature of the culture that developed was a certain dogmatism, a rationalism, a longing to clothe all the knowledge that one acquires in simple rationalistic formulas. There developed an impulse to view things in the way that reason and the senses must see them. Let us take an instance that as students of spiritual science is familiar territory to us, the structuring of our human soul in three members, sentient soul, intellectual or mind soul, and consciousness soul. The human soul can actually only be understood when one knows that it consists of these three members. Just as little as light can be understood without discerning the various colors in their origin, and without knowing that it is divided into the various nuances of color that we see in the rainbow, on the one side the red and yellow rays, and on the other blue, green, and violet, and that if one does not know this, one cannot as a physicist study light, so would one be equally little able to study the human soul, which is infinitely more important, without making a comparable discernment. For each person is a human being and should know about the soul. Anyone who does not feel in his soul that it finds expression in the three members of sentient soul, intellectual or mind soul, and consciousness soul, will end up becoming totally confused about it all. We see this in modern university psychologists who muddle everything up when they speak of the soul, just as people get into a tangle about the nuances of color and light and in their immense arrogance and their scientific sense of superiority, they regard themselves as quite especially learned when they create the utmost confusion in the soul life. Whereas, one can only come to know the soul if one is in a position to really know about this threefold nature of the soul. Whereas the sentient soul is initially also what makes manifest a person's desires, the more feeling-related impulses in earthly existence, what we may call the more sensory aspect of man's being, this sentient soul nevertheless at the same time contains in its deeper parts the eternal motivating forces of human nature, those forces which go through birth and death. The intellectual or mind-soul contains in equal measure a temporal and an eternal aspect. The consciousness soul, as it is now, contains primarily man's orientation toward things of a temporal nature. Hence it is understandable that the people which its folk soul forms through the consciousness soul, the British people, has, in line with a very beautiful remark made by Goethe, nothing of the quality of profound reflection, but is oriented toward the practical, toward outward competitiveness. 
it is perhaps not bad to call such things to mind, for those who have participated in German cultural life have not been blind to these things, but have always spoken about them very clearly. Thus to Eckermann, it was some time ago, but one can see that great Germans have always seen things in their true light when it was a question of philosophers, such as Hegel, Fichte, Kant, and also several others. Goethe said, yes, yes, Whereas Germans torment themselves with solving the deepest philosophical problems, the English are oriented primarily, or even solely, toward the practical. They lack any sense of reflection. And even when, said Goethe, they make declarations about the morality of liberating slaves, one has to ask, what is the real objective behind this? And on another occasion, Goethe wrote something, that is highly significant and speaks more than many volumes, that even Walter Scott once admitted that even though the English had taken part in the battles against Napoleon, it was more important for them to, quote, keep a British objective in view, close quote, than all the liberation of peoples that was being spoken about at that time. A German philologist, and there is little that the industry of German philologists cannot unearth, has discovered in the nine thick volumes of Walter Scott's biography of Napoleon the place where, to which Goethe was alluding, where Walter Scott admits that the British did indeed participate in the battles against Napoleon, but that there was behind this the wish to gain a British advantage, that is, as he puts it, quote, to secure the British object, close quote. It is a typically English remark, one has only to look for them, These things are interesting as a means of somewhat widening our perspective today. Thus one needs to know, as I said, that the human soul consists of these three members, or rather, that the human self works through these three soul nuances, just as light works through the various nuances of color, primarily in the three kingdoms of mineral, plant, and animal. One then comes to see that in that he has these three soul nuances, Man can assign a great deal to each of them, and must do so in the course of human evolution. That the ideal of these soul nuances is a great ideal, but each of these ideals is only one of the soul nuances and is not for the whole soul. And only when, through spiritual science, people come to the point of attributing to the individual soul members the respective ideals will what can be the true ideal of healing for humanity and of an harmonious interaction between human beings on the earth become a reality. For man must aspire to what is associated mainly with his sentient soul, to what he gives expression to in the context of the physical plane, which is a different ideal from which he expresses through the intellectual or mind soul. And he must again aspire to a different ideal for that to which he gives expression through the consciousness soul. Through one of these ideals, the one soul member is ennobled. Through the other, another soul member is ennobled. If one develops the one soul member, especially through the brotherhood of human beings on the earth, one must develop the other through freedom and the third through equality. These three ideals each relate to one soul member. In the west of Europe, everything is muddled up, and what the rationalists did was to simplify everything in the smooth formulas and dogmas that rationalism likes to make everything clear and reasonable. Through this dogmatism, the whole human soul was simply regarded as one, and freedom, brotherhood, and equality were spoken of as simple entities. So we see that in the west a fundamentally rationalistic cultural trend lies hidden, and we could extend this scrutiny into the details. For example, well-educated French people can spend time pondering if, shall we say, the lines of my mystery dramas are iambic pentameters but do not rhyme. The French mind cannot understand that the inner impulse of language, at this level, does not require rhyme. It stands for sophistication, for what outwardly forms a framework, and it says one cannot have lines that do not rhyme. Thus it is also with outer life. Thus it is with everything. 
In the West there is this insistence on dividing, systematizing, putting everything nicely in boxes. But just consider what a terrible thing it was that at the beginning of our spiritual scientific endeavors, through the fact that many of our friends were still influenced by the English theosophical movement, in every branch or group that one entered, one could find, as one looked up all manner of systems, nicely written on cards, blackboards and so on, Atma, Buddhi, Manas. Then all sorts of horizontal and vertical lines representing various systems and categories. Consider how one has bowed beneath the yoke of this dogmatism, and how difficult it was to put in its place the methods of inner development that we must have in Central Europe that the one arises from the other, that concepts are developed further in inner experience. One cannot use systematization, these donkey bridges of the mind that bring everything into quite definite formulas. What an effort it costs to show that it is a question of going from one thing to the other, of a consequential sequence of division and development, of a living, organic, formative process. I could extend this description to all areas of life, but we would have to stay here all day. So we find this in the West as the one part of the stream that encircled Central Europe. And if we turn to the East, we must say, here we have to do with a longing that expresses the exact opposite, with a longing to let everything today disappear in a mist of indistinctness, in a primitive elemental mysticism, in something that does not present what is being directly expressed in clear ideas and clear words. We indeed have two snakes. The symbolism is absolutely appropriate, one of which extends from the north to the southeast, and the other from the north to the southwest, and which become entangled with one another around Constantinople. And enclosed in the midst of them we have what we can call the intimate Central European cultural stream, where, if it appears in its primal distinctive quality, the head can never be separated from the heart, and thinking can never be separated from feeling. One does not as yet completely see this in our spiritual science, because there has to be an effort in the direction not of conceptual systematization, but nonetheless of concepts of evolution. People do not yet see that everything that is striven for there is not merely intellectual stimulation, but that the heart and the whole soul are connected at every level, that the heart is intimately engaged when, for example, the head describes the transitions from Saturn to the sun, from the sun to the moon, from the moon to the earth, and so on, that the heart is at every moment involved in the description. And one can be moved at the deepest level, as one ascends from one's heartfelt feeling into the highest heights and dives down into the deepest depths and can again rise up from there. It is not yet noticed today that what is only seemingly described in concepts must at the same time be inscribed with one's heart's blood if it is to correspond to Central European spiritual life. This intimate element of Central European culture cannot conceive of the spiritual without the ideal, or the ideal without the spiritual. To come to know the spirit in order at the same time to enter with the spirit into a kind of marriage of the soul is a moment that characterizes to the most intense degree the essential nature of Central Europe. Hence this Central European nature can use that which descends into the deepest depths of sensory experience and sensory feeling in order to become a symbol for the All-Highest. And it is deeply significant when Goethe, after he had let the life not only of a typical German, but of a typical human being, the life of Faust, pass by before his soul, concludes his poem with the words, Everything transient is but a semblance, and ends with these last words, The eternal feminine leads us onwards. Here a cosmic mystery is expressed through a sensory image, and in this sensory image there comes to expression the intimate character of Central European culture, this wonderfully intimate character 
that we find so beautifully and tenderly expressed, and at the same time rising spiritually to the heights in, for example, Novalis. If you look at the translations that have been made here and there of this last phrase, uh, German, das ewig weibliche, zieht uns hinan, especially the French translations, you will see what has been made of it. It has often not been rendered very lucidly by Frenchmen, but they do not count on this when it is a matter of understanding Faust. Intimacy of the spiritual life is in the most eminent sense what Central Europe, in its essential nature, is oriented toward, and it is what is enclosed in both East and West by the Midgard serpent. And we must go to these lengths in order wholly to connect ourselves in our feeling with what is actually going on. We shall acquire from this Central European nature some objectivity for ourselves in order not to be judged by the same impulses from which things are judged in the East and West, but to be able to stand before the great events of the present that we are experiencing out of truly supernational human impulses. Then we shall understand something of why Central European people are so misunderstood and even hated by those who surround them. Of course, we must be able to regard what is present in Central Europe as a mission for humanity as a whole, with all humility. We must be able to arrive at a mood that avoids any kind of arrogance. But we must also safeguard for ourselves the free awareness of what is to be carried out in Central Europe. The people of Central Europe have been imbued with a power emanating from their folk soul that has a constantly rejuvenating quality. It reached a high point in the ideals of Lessing, Schelling, Hegel, Fichte, Goethe and Grimm. However, everything at that time was living more within an aspiration toward idealism. This must now be developed further in a more concrete way. The profound ideas of German idealism must gain further substance through what can come from the spiritual domain, enabling them to be raised from mere ideas to living beings of the spiritual world. It is the greatness of the task of Central Europe that must now ensoul German hearts, together with the awareness of what needs to be defended from all sides, from where the Midgard serpent keeps the circle in its firm embrace. It is especially fitting that we who stand on the ground of spiritual science study in such a more elevated sense what is actually going on today. Moreover, we cannot be taking the innermost impulse of our spiritual science seriously enough if we do not feel how this spiritual scientific aspiration in each single person is connected with the aspiration of Central Europe as a whole, how it must be connected with the whole substantiality of this aspiration. We must be clear that much of what we have in mind is only present in a seed-like form, but that it is the task of Central Europe to enable these seeds to unfold in blossoms and in fruits. Just one example will be given to illustrate this. If a person tries gradually to engage in self-development through his meditation and concentration, through intimate work on his soul, all soul forces take on a different form than they have in ordinary life. The soul forces then, as it were, acquire a different quality. If he works really industriously on his development, as is described in the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? He comes to the point of understanding, understanding in a living way, and I would say livingly taking hold of the idea that in the moment when he approaches the actual spiritual world, he no longer thinks as one has to think in ordinary life. In ordinary life one thinks in such a way that thoughts begin to live within one. When one confronts the world of the senses, one is aware of one's ego and that this ego is having the thoughts. One connects one thought with another and thereby forms for oneself a judgment. One brings the thoughts together and lets them go their separate ways. In my book titled The Threshold of the Spiritual World, I have compared the development of thoughts with putting one's head in a world of living beings. Thoughts begin inwardly to swarm about, 
They become, if I may say so, living beings. And we are no longer the ones who lead one thought to another. They go from one thought to another. The one takes hold of the other and sets itself free from the other. The life of thoughts begins to become alive. Only when the thoughts, as it were, start to become vessels and containers that contract in the small space and then again become more extended like sacks or bags, can the beings of the higher hierarchies draw into our thoughts. Only then. Thus our own life, our whole thinking changes when we enter livingly into the spiritual world. One then begins to perceive that on other planets there live not human beings as on the earth, but other beings, that the other planets are inhabited by other beings. These other beings of other planets penetrate into our thinking that has become alive. And we no longer think about the beings of other worlds and cosmic spheres, but they live in us. They live united with our self. Thinking has, therefore, become a completely different soul quality. It has developed from the point where it was formerly into another soul quality, into a quality that extends its influence and activity above us and becomes identical with the world which is the world of spirit. Here we have an example of what must arise within humanity if it is to develop the state in which it is now living into a higher one for the future of the earth. It must indeed become something that people all share, that such thinking is possible, and that only through such thinking is a person able to make his acquaintance with the spiritual world. This does not mean that everyone needs to become a spirit researcher, no more than anyone wanting to understand the achievements of chemistry needs to become a chemist. After all, even though there can be only a small number of spirit researchers, anyone can, through unprejudiced thinking, see and understand the truth of what the spirit researcher says. But it must become clear that in the course of life there reside within a person soul capacities, which once he has passed through the gate of death, likewise of themselves become what they become in an initiate. When someone crosses the threshold of death, thinking becomes a completely different capacity of soul. It reaches out into the world of being. It is a continual extending of feeling antenna, and the higher worlds are embraced within these feeling antenna, and one experiences them directly. Now, there was a highly characteristic figure in the nineteenth century who through his wit and erudition, for he was indeed clever, contributed to the forming of the materialistic world conception, Ludwig Feuerbach. He wrote a book entitled Thoughts About Death and Immortality, and it is interesting to read the following from this book. Feuerbach says something along these lines. The highest things that a person can develop out of himself are his thoughts. He cannot develop soul capacities higher than thoughts. Were he to be able to develop soul capacities, higher than thoughts, that which originates from the dwellers of the starry worlds would be enabled to penetrate his head, and instead of thoughts he would have in his head the deeds and activities of the beings who are on the planets. This seems so absurd to Ludwig Feuerbach that he naturally considers anyone saying something of this kind to be ill. Think how interesting it is that a person who becomes a materialist because he rejects the idea of higher soul capacities, comes to understand the nature of the soul capacity that represents the higher development of thinking. He even describes it. But he has so terrible a fear, so terrible a dread of this development, that precisely because it would have to take the course that he suspects, he rejects this soul capacity as an impossibility, as sheer fantasy. The trend of intellectual development in the 19th century is so close to what needs to be striven for and at the same time so distant from it because it is indeed, as it were, thrust forth from the inner consciousness toward what is being sought but is unable to enter into the depths since it must be regarded as absurd 
since it is truly feared, quite massively feared. Central European cultural life must come into its own, and we shall then find that from this Central European cultural life precisely that which overcomes this fear will develop. What seeks to suppress this spirit light of Central Europe has become too strong. Some examples of this may also be given. Hegel, the German philosopher, raised his voice in vain against the over-appreciation of Newton. When you hear physicists speaking today, you can read about what I am saying in many popular works, you will hear Newton is the great exponent of the theory of gravity, a teaching through which alone the cosmos can be explained. Hegel said, what did Newton actually do? He clothed what Kepler, the German astronomer, had expressed in mathematical formulas. For nothing is contained in Newton's works that Kepler has not already said. Kepler worked out of that outlook whereby the whole of the soul is active, not only the head. Newton, however, brought everything into a system and thereby made all sorts of errors of judgment, for example, the idea that the sun's influence is extended into the wider periphery, which is not applicable to the movement of the planets. For Newton, it really is as though the sun had physical arms, and that it stretches out these arms and attracts the planets. But the German philosopher's warning that Central European culture would be overwhelmed in this area by British culture was in vain. To mention another example, Goethe formulated a theory of color that arose wholly out of Central European thinking, and which one will only understand if one recognizes, to some extent, the connections of the physical domain with the realm of spirit. The world did not accept Goethe's theory of color, but preferred that of Newton. Goethe also established a theory of evolution. The world did not understand it. And it was only prepared to accept what was promoted in a popularized, materialistic way as a theory of evolution in Darwinism. One can say that becoming aware of the forces that people of Central Europe, encircled as they are by the Midgard serpent, have is what is needed so as not to give way to the influx of rationalism and empiricism. You see the colossal task that lies before us. You see the greatness of the ideal. Because things continue to flow, as one might say, in the stream of appearances, people do not pay attention when one asserts the Central European identity. I do not know how many have noticed the following circumstance. When, from the reasons that were specified yesterday in the public lecture, our spiritual scientific movement had to free itself from the specifically British movement of the Theosophical Society, and when, long ago, what is now taking place in the war was in a certain sense anticipated in the realm of spirit, and which, for good reasons, preceded or anticipated it, I spoke about and explained the whole affair in terms of its symptoms. There are foolish people who want to pass judgments about our spiritual scientific movement, and have often said, after all, this Central European spiritual scientific movement has likewise derived from what it has received from the British Theosophical Movement. I should like to recall that I said, I say this not out of personal reasons, but because it is the situation, the whole crux of the matter characterized in one symptom, that before I had any outward connection with the British Theosophical Movement, I gave some lectures in Berlin that were subsequently printed in my book titled Mysticism at the Dawn of the Modern Age. No one will find any influence from the West in this book, and everything in it is developed purely out of the intellectual life of Central Europe, out of the spiritual mystical movement from Meister Eckhart to Angela Silesius. And when I came to London for the first time, one of the leading lights of the Theosophical Society, Mr. Mead, who had read the book following its translation into English, said that the whole of Theosophy could be found in it. To the extent that people have admitted that they can go along with us, we could, of course, unite ourselves with the whole affair, but it has not really altered the situation. This is what it amounts to, 
that we are aware of our tasks within Central European spiritual culture and that we never deviate from them. Awards and medals of one kind or another have been sent back to the English, diplomas and the like. This is perhaps of less importance. What will be really important is that one sends back Newtonianism and the distinctively English Darwinism, that is, liberates Central European cultural life from them. And in this connection something can be learned from the way that, free from all other influences, Central European cultural life has made its mark in the form of spiritual science. But one must take this to heart, consider what is essential and stand firmly on this ground. It is quite extraordinary how mysteriously things actually work. Consider the following case. Ernst Haeckel has actually endeavored throughout his life to guide the German conception of the world along tracks that are wholly influenced by British thinking, by the British nature and character. His writings are completely pervaded by British thinking, British empiricism. And now he is the first to denounce everything about England. These are processes that are enacted in the unconscious regions of the Central European soul. They are also things which, in such a soul, are closely connected with karma. Just think what it means when Haeckel stands before the world and says that he has himself brought to fulfillment the first great deed of the great scientist Huxley, in that he coined the proposition that human bones are similar to animal bones, that he, Haeckel, has then referred to the great change in the conception of the descent of man, and that he introduced nothing into the theory of evolution other than what came from the West. And when one then sees that he is now compelled to denounce what his entire intellectual life has built up, it is the most tragic present outcome for such a soul that can be imagined. It is spiritual dynamite, for it shatters all the foundations on which such a soul stands. And so one sees into the depths of what is actually going on at present, but also into the awful side of it that we need to be aware of. Only when one really studies things in this way will one come to be able to broaden one's conception of them beyond the narrow horizon that often prevails today. One will, before all else, be able to discern a great teaching, and this will be the most beautiful and at the same time the most humbling and sublime teaching, the teaching of that to which the all-prevailing might of the world spirit has destined the people of Central Europe, who now surrounded by the Midgard serpent are enclosed as though in a fortress, surrounded by enemies on all sides. Only if what is happening becomes a great symbol of the deepest weaving and working of worlds, will we be freed from a limited conception of the difficult, destiny-laden events of the present. And only then will we feel that we must make ourselves worthy of what, say, Fichte has said, also at a time when Germany was undergoing great challenges, in the title Addresses to the German Nation, where, as he says, he wanted to speak, quote, quite simply for Germans and by Germans, and spoke in the way that a German had to speak at that time to a German. But just as Fichte spoke at that time of everything that has to do with the German mission, the German circle of duties, so are the difficulties that we are experiencing today within the encirclement of hate-filled enemies, that which we have to experience as the dawning light of Central European consciousness. Indeed, something that can be found at the end of Fichte's addresses can be reformulated today so that it says, For the healing of mankind, the spiritual world conception must flow into human souls. And the world spirit looks toward those who live in Central Europe, so that they become a mouthpiece for what it has to say and to bring to mankind in an ongoing process of revelation. One can therefore look upon what the sons of Germany and Central Europe have to defend with body and blood and soul, without arrogance and without national egotism. Nevertheless, one must also become conscious of this, 
Then alone the huge sacrifices that have to be made and the sufferings that follow can give rise to something that brings healing to mankind. For we stand at an important threshold, at a significant threshold, and one could characterize this threshold in human evolution by saying that in the future the abyss between the physical and the spiritual realms, between the physically living and the spiritually living, between the earthly and that which lies beyond earthly death, must be bridged. The time must, as it were, come upon us when not only are the souls who go about in a physical body alive to us, but when we feel ourselves to be part of that greater world to which the souls belong who live disembodied between death and a new birth in the world that in great style we call our own. The attention of human beings must be directed beyond what only our physical eyes can see. We indeed stand at the threshold to this new experience, to this new consciousness. And what I said to you of the widening of consciousness, of the raising of consciousness to a higher world, must become a familiar way of looking at things. Central European culture is prepared for making this a familiar experience. It really is prepared for this. I have shown you that the best minds of the 19th century still had a fear of having an awareness of what lies at the depths of the soul. And in any case, out of earthly forces, the soul is unable as yet to devote attention to this. To be sure that thinking to which supersensible forces and supersensible beings extend their influence is a present reality, and it makes itself manifest at that time when a person passes through the gate of death, Materialists are fearful of admitting that human consciousness could be thus extended, that the barrier between physical and spiritual experience, between what lies on this side of death and beyond it, can fall away. And because they are afraid, they reject it as fanciful, fantastic, and even as a sign of mental illness. But it will come to be recognized that when a person has passed through the portal of death, the forces that he develops are those that he has already now between birth and death. However, they work at such a deep level that he does not perceive them. They cause things to arise within him that are indeed enacted in him, but which he does not attend to in the ordinary course of life. With the forces of which a person has knowledge, with these forces of thinking, feeling, and will alone, physical earthly life would not be possible. If he could only think, feel, and will as he is able to now, he would never be capable of, for example, forming his body in such a way that the brain functions as it should. To this end, formative forces of a sculptural nature had to play their part. However, they already belong to what the soul no longer perceives in physical experience, to what forms part of a wider consciousness as a segment of the consciousness that we have in ordinary life. When someone passes through the gate of death, he does not have a lack of consciousness, but lives initially in a consciousness that is much richer and more full of content than the consciousness here in physical life. For the body carves out a portion of a more extensive consciousness and shows everything that can be shown, but everything is still only in the form of a reflection. Nevertheless, what is in the body and what a person carries across the threshold of death does indeed have a wider consciousness. And when someone has passed through the gate of death, he is within this wider consciousness. He has not too little, but on the contrary, too much, too rich a consciousness when he crosses the threshold of death. I have spoken about this in my Vienna cycle at Easter 1914. A person has a richer consciousness after death, and when, after that backward review, which has often been described, is over, he enters for a time into a kind of sleeping state, not an actual state of sleep, but a condition which is brought about through the fact that he is in a richer state of consciousness than he is here. And just as our eyes are dazzled by an excess, a surfeit of light, so is a person overwhelmed by the excess of consciousness. 
and he must first learn to orient himself. The apparent sleep consists only in that in this excess of consciousness he is orienting himself in such a way that he can attune it with what he can bear after the events of his life. It is therefore a process of dampening down the excess of consciousness which manifests itself after death to an endurable level. You must clarify these things through the details given in the Vienna cycle. I should like to illustrate this by means of two pertinent examples. I could give many such examples, for recently and also already earlier, many of the friends from our circle have passed through the gate of death. But through the particular nature of the circumstances, simply because these deaths occurred recently, these considerations are more immediate in nature. And I should like to begin with such examples in order to speak to you of what can come so close to our hearts, because this has happened among us from the circle of our spiritual scientific movement. We recently lost a dear friend from the physical plane and it was my task to speak for the soul who had passed through the gate of death. The impulses of the spiritual world that spoke to me sufficiently clearly in this case rendered it a clear necessity that I should characterize the particular soul qualities of this befriended soul. It was in Zurich, and we were in attendance at the cremation of a dear member of our spiritual scientific movement. In the relatively long time that had elapsed, between the onset of death on a Wednesday evening and the cremation on the Monday morning. Parenthesis, it is understandable that the backward review by the etheric body had already ceased. Close parenthesis. The necessity came to me quite involuntarily from the spiritual world to begin and end what I had to say beside the coffin with words which sought to characterize the inner nature of the soul. This inner nature of the friend who had departed in the midst of life was such that one had to immerse oneself in this being and through becoming identified with it, inwardly create it spiritually. That is, one had to enable one's thinking to dive down into the soul of the dead person and to make it possible for what was weaving in the soul of the deceased to flow into one's own thoughts. One then acquired the possibility to say, as it were, with respect to this soul, how the soul was in life and how it is now after death. And this resulted out of itself that it was clothed in the following words. I had to speak the following words at the beginning and at the end of the cremation. Quote, you appeared among us. The moving gentleness of your being spoke out of the quiet power of your eyes. An enlivening peace flowed in the waves with which your gaze conveyed the weaving of your inner being to all things and to other people. And this being was ensouled by your voice, which eloquently, more through the manner of speaking than the words themselves, revealed what lay hidden within your beautiful soul. Yet wordlessly they fully revealed the devoted love to those attentive to it. This being who, from a quiet, noble beauty, proclaimed a receptive awareness of world, soul, creativity. Close quote. This is how the being of this soul presented itself through my becoming identified with the soul in the days before the cremation, once the backward review by the etheric body was over. The soul had not yet found the possibility to orient itself in the overwhelming intensity of consciousness. It was, in a certain sense, in a sleeping state when the body was about to be cremated. The cremation address was spoken with these words at the beginning and at the end. What then happened was that the flame, what seems like but is not actually the flame, took hold of the body, and while the body was being engulfed by this flame-like element, which is, however, only the rising warmth and heat, a moment of awakening came over the soul. And now one could see how the soul was looking back at the whole scene which had taken place among the people who were at the cremation. It was looking back quite especially at what had been spoken. And there then began the natural sinking back into the state of excess consciousness, or as one might say, into unconsciousness. 
Later one could perceive a moment when there was again such a looking back. This then lasted ever longer until finally there would be a complete orientation in the excess of consciousness. But something important can be discerned from this. It was apparent that because words had been spoken at the cremation that came from her own soul, these words enkindled the backward review within it. It found something awakening in these words. From this one can learn that one of the most important things after death is to oversee one's own experience. One must, as it were, begin after death with self-knowledge. Here in earthly life one can indeed do without self-knowledge, even to the extent that it is true that someone who is no ordinary person and also no ordinary literary figure, but a renowned professor of philosophy, Dr. Ernst Mach, not Ferdinand Mach, I would not even mention him, in his title Analysis of Sensations, a very famous work, makes a confession along these lines. When I was a young man, I was walking along the road when I suddenly saw someone coming toward me. What an unpleasant, repulsive face, I thought. How astonished I was when I discovered that I had seen my own face in profile. So he had seen his own face, which he knew so little that he could return the verdict that he did. And the same professor relates a later instance of something that occurred when he was already a famous professor of philosophy, namely that After a long journey he boarded a bus, as a man also got on from the other direction. A big mirror hung opposite him, and he expresses his thoughts quite correctly when he says that he had thought, what is this down-at-heel, unkempt schoolmaster doing here? And again he recognized himself. And he adds, so I knew the demeanor of the type of person better than my own. This is a beautiful example of how little a person knows even his outer form in life unless he is a coquettish woman who is always looking in the mirror. But people have far, far less knowledge of their soul qualities, far more of which goes right past them. One can become a famous professor of philosophy without this self-knowledge, but one needs this self-knowledge when one has passed through the portal of death. A person must therefore look back to that point in his development from which he passed through death, and he must recognize himself there. Just as someone who is in physical existence and looks back with the ordinary forces of life is unable to perceive his own birth, in that this is never accessible to the ordinary powers of his soul, there is no one who can look back to his physical birth with his ordinary soul forces. It is equally necessary that in every instant the moment of death is a present reality to which one looks back. Death is always something that one keeps in view as the last significant event. When viewed from the other side, from beyond death's threshold, death is something altogether different than from the physical side. It is the most beautiful experience that can be perceived from the other side, from the side of life between death and a new birth. It is that which appears as the glorious picture of the eternal victory of the spiritual over the physical. Thus death is viewed as such a picture, the constant awakener of the highest forces of human nature. When this human nature is living in spiritual experience between death and a new birth, it therefore means that when the soul looks back, when it tries to look back, it must initially contemplate itself. Precisely in these cases that we have had to experience recently, it was so clear whence the impulse originated to characterize this soul in a particular way, so as to approach it in this impulse of gaining knowledge of itself in looking back. Thus the so-called living works together with the so-called dead. And such a correspondence between the so-called living and the so-called dead will arise with ever greater frequency. Another case which we experienced recently is that of our dear friend Fritz Mitcher. Although Fritz Mitcher is less known to the friends here, his influence has spread among many other anthroposophists through his lectures, through what he has in a wonderful way achieved from friend to friend, through the way that he engaged with anthroposophical life, 
an engagement which must be regarded as exemplary, for the reason that he, whose inner inclinations were forged by undergoing and receiving the benefits of a learned education, sought, in accordance with his disposition, to imbue everything that he endeavored to do with a scholarly quality, to encompass it with the intimate nature of his soul life, but then to make it part of his anthroposophical conception of the world. We need this way of working, especially in what we want to bring to the future, the benefits of spiritual scientific ideals. We need people who try to penetrate with understanding the culture of the time in order to immerse it in the stream of spiritual culture who in a certain sense make the sacrifice of pervading the culture of the time with the stream of spirituality. In this case, too, and I am speaking only of things which have arisen through the karma of necessity, karma ensured that I had to speak at the cremation, and here, too, it arose from inner necessity that I characterized the nature of our dear friend at the beginning and at the end of the cremation address. And this is the characterization I gave, quote, As a hope that gladdens us, so do you venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. Your longing had its deep affinity with a pure love of truth. The goal to which you tirelessly aspire throughout your life was creation, from the spirit light. You cultivated your fine gifts to follow with sure step the radiant path of spirit knowledge, unswayed by outward opposition, as a true servant of the truth. Your spirit organs you enhanced, that they boldly and persistently thrust error from you to both sides of the path and create for you a realm for truth. To fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within you, was your concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched your soul, for knowledge as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for you life's truest worth. As a hope that gladdens us, so do you venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit, a loss that deeply us aggrieves. So do you vanish from the field where earthly seeds of spirit have matured for your senses' spheres in the womb of soul-being? Feel how we look lovingly up to the heights that called you now, away for other creating. Extend your strength from realms of spirit to the friends you've left behind. Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. As a hope that gladdens us, a loss that deeply us aggrieves, let us hope that from far and near, unforsaken for our life, you shine as starry soul in spirit realms. Close quote. During the following night, the soul that had not wholly come to the point of orienting itself gave back, out of itself, something by way of an answer, which has a connection with the lines that had been directed toward its being at the cremation. Such words as these are spoken in such a way that one's own soul faithfully writes them down without any further ado. They are written as derived from the other soul to whom an orientation has been made. And I was utterly unaware that two verses are constructed in a quite particular way until I heard these words from the soul of the friend who had crossed the threshold of death. Quote, to fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul, for knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Close quote. 
Only now could I know why these verses are constructed as they are. I had myself spoken them in exactly the same form. Quote, to fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within you, was your concern and joy. Close quote. But every, in quotes, you came back as, in quotes, me. Every your came back as my. They came back thus changed by the soul speaking about its own being. This is an example of how there is a correspondence, how there is already a mutual relationship between the world here and the world there in the time after death. That this awareness penetrates into human souls is an essential part of the significance of our spiritual scientific movement. That the world also of those who live between death and a new birth becomes a world in which we know ourselves to be together with them is something that spiritual science will give to humanity and so expand the world from the narrow sphere of the reality in which man provisionally lives. However, this is intimately connected with what needs to happen in Central Europe, and anyone who has listened well will find in the words directed toward Fritz Mitcher's soul what is deeply connected with the significance of our spiritual scientific movement, for these words are spoken out of a deep inner necessity. Quote, Hear the entreaty of our souls, sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dear friends we owe. Close quote. It can sometimes be that, and even though this is not really the case, it may appear to be from a recent perspective, people may doubt whether the souls that are incarnated in the flesh here on the earth will actually do what must necessarily be done from a spiritual conception of the world for the well-being of humanity in the earth. But anyone who is fully and livingly involved in the spiritual scientific movement cannot have such doubts, because he knows that the forces of those who have ascended into the spiritual worlds, after they have felt themselves strengthened through having absorbed spiritual science into their being, are working into the stream within which we stand in life. And it is like coming to an understanding with the soul of a friend who has passed through the gate of death when one recalls its life, calling to mind what a spiritual movement can owe to the power of the friend. When one is able to come to an understanding with it, to remain united with its forces, so that we always have it among us, so that it continues to be active among us. It is not merely a matter of receiving ideas and concepts of a spiritual scientific nature, but that we create a movement, a spiritual movement here on earth, that we truly imbue with spiritual forces. It is in this moment appropriate that out of the feelings that will doubtlessly be living in the souls of the friends who are present, to direct thoughts toward the soul of someone who has always devoted his forces to this branch or group. As an indication of our wish to feel united with him, of our wish to know ourselves to be united with his forces after he passed through the gate of death, we are rising from our seats. The Leipzig friends all know of which befriended soul I am speaking, and they have directed their thoughts to this soul with moving hearts. These have been the ideas which it has been my task to bring to your attention today in the time that we have been able to be together. These words were ensouled by the awareness that the weight of the difficult and destiny-laden days in which we are living must be removed from those who will walk peacefully over the earth, in whom the forces of peace will be active. But because of the way that a great deal will and indeed must be strongly transformed by what is now happening in the life of earthly humanity, we who feel an allegiance to spiritual science must be especially mindful of how much it matters that on the ground for which so much blood is flowing, for which souls are so often going through the portal of death, on which so many fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters are mourning, what can be accomplished by those whose souls can be illumined by the future assuring thoughts of spiritual science must indeed be brought about. 
Yes, those thoughts which come from the consciousness of the living connection of the human soul with the spiritual world must be in the ascendant. These spiritual worlds will now pervade souls, and there will be spiritual forces that are brought forth by our destiny-laden days. Just think how many are going through the gate of death in this time in the flower of their youth. Consider that the etheric bodies of these people who are crossing the threshold of death between their twentieth and fortieth year are etheric bodies which could have maintained the body here in physical life for decades. These etheric bodies are being separated from the physical bodies, but they still retain forces within themselves to work here for the physical world. These forces will work further in the spiritual worlds, separated from the unspent etheric bodies that have passed through the gate of death. The spirituality from the unspent etheric bodies of heroic fighters becomes a source of radiant brightness for the spiritual salvation and advancement of mankind. But that which streams down must meet with the thoughts that can stream forth from the soul's that will be able to receive them in spirit consciousness through spiritual science. We shall therefore summarize the thoughts that we have brought before our souls in some words which represent the connection of the awareness that has been brought by spiritual scientific thoughts with the events of the present time, which express how the space for the coming time of peace must be filled with thoughts that have reached up from souls into the spiritual worlds from souls that have been imbued with spiritual science. Then will that which is struggled for in our time with such great sacrifice, with blood and death, will be able in the right sense to bear blossom and fruit when souls are found that turn their minds to the realm of spirit. Hence we who are mindful of days of such grievous destiny today may say, quote, From the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice. There will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. The end of Lecture 4 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death. This is 15 lectures translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This is Lecture 5 given in Nuremberg on the 13th of March, 1915, uh, entitled The Entry of the Christ Impulse into Historical Events, The Bridging of the Gulf Between the Living and the Dead. If spiritual science really is to be a kind of living draft for our souls, as it can indeed become, this spiritual science must also, on the other hand, proved to be a powerful and suitable means of widening the spiritual vision of the souls that have dedicated themselves to spiritual science in times when so much is being prepared and which are of such significance as ours. In this way, what is happening can be seen in a somewhat wider light than is possible today for those of our contemporaries whose vision is limited to materialism. In what has over the years been cultivated within our spiritual scientific movement, it has become possible to see that one of the aims has been to expand the nature of the soul's experience, so that one can be emancipated from merely thinking about the narrow limits of one's own self and one's surroundings, and is enabled to look somewhat more widely at the great impulses, the great manifestations of forces that pass through the whole evolution of earthly humanity. And when we have thus endeavored to broaden the scope of our feelings and sensibilities, we should, specifically in such times that, on the one hand, make so deeply painful an impression on the soul with their tempestuous waves, and on the other elevate it to a quite particular height, because so much of significance is concealed within them, 
be able to render the forces that we have acquired through spiritual signs capable of seeing something that is not so outwardly visible in the events, something that the ordinary intellect is unable to perceive in them. We should, above all, be able to raise the objection, does the terrible torch of war that has been set alight and is burning over our heads have any significance of a prophetic nature for our earthly evolution as a whole? Only those who view these events in so significant a light as to glimpse the possibility of this can rightly play their part in them. Friends within our ranks have often asked why in recent years it has been said in our circles that in the decades of the twentieth century there will be times toward which we must look with a particular attentiveness because the children and grandchildren of those who are now living will have to live through events that are great and important, but also tragic and painful. Those who are entrusted today with the task of giving something to enable the souls of children and grandchildren to remain upright in the face of what will descend upon humanity in the twentieth century must be aware that a strong inner power must be given to their children. Our descendants in the twentieth century will, to a far, far greater extent than we can imagine today in ordinary life, need strong inner forces as a support for their souls in order to carry with them the precious legacy of human culture that has been accumulated over the decades and centuries of human evolution. Moreover, the descendants of those now living on earth will be exposed to additional storms of life, I said that people may sometimes have been surprised that such things have been spoken of in our ranks. Perhaps, however, a sense of this may arise when we consider that we are living in the midst of the greatest and most terrible military conflict that has ever befallen mankind since recorded history on this earth began. Indeed, it would be quite wrong if we did not concern ourselves as fully as possible with the significance of the present moment, and consider the question, what does the spiritual knowledge to which we aspire with our deepest longing have to do with what is to enter into the evolution of mankind? Even if we look only superficially, do we not see a storm that arose in the East some time ago threatening to engulf the modern culture and civilization of Europe? One should at least know that very powerful forces reside in the East, of which it can be seen that, in the way that they are now making themselves felt, they have the aim of breaking up and destroying European culture. To what extent this is the case can only be surmised at present. With what we may call European culture and civilization, we are living in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period. It is the culture of the consciousness soul, in whose midst souls are among us who have something to give to mankind. If we look back upon Greco-Latin culture, this Greco-Latin culture is essentially, albeit in a quite different form, an echo, a repetition on a higher level of what existed on ancient Atlantis. Although it previously appeared there in a different form, In the fourth post-Atlantean cultural period, there was something of the nature of a repetition of it. The fifth post-Atlantean cultural period in which we are living is a new form. It is something entirely new that has been added to the existing evolutionary course of mankind. We should understand this not merely as an abstract truth, as a theory, but with the deepest and most intense feeling of responsibility. And we should also be clear that long periods of time in earthly evolution will have to elapse until everything that the divine world order has to give to earthly humanity through the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period has been brought to fulfillment from the hearts and souls of human beings. The most significant event of earthly evolution the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha, occurred in the fourth cultural period. 
the mystery of Golgotha will not simply continue to exert an influence in the fifth cultural period in the way that it did in the fourth cultural period. The fifth cultural period has the task of gradually approaching the mystery of Golgotha with full spiritual understanding, with all the cognitive forces of the soul, and not merely with the forces of the intellect or of a piety based wholly on feeling. The task of gradually understanding the Christ who went through the mystery of Golgotha with all the forces of knowledge and understanding that the soul is able to bring out of itself. Thus the words of St. Paul, not I, but Christ in me, will become a reality in a new way. And indeed, everything that we develop through spiritual science is the preparation for understanding the essential nature of Christ with all the inner cognitive forces of the soul. This is a significant and important task of the fifth cultural period. Let us now enter somewhat more deeply into what is being asked of the fifth cultural period by bringing before our souls the way that the Christ impulse has influenced mankind since the mystery of Golgotha. If the influence of the Christ impulse had been confined to what human beings have understood of it over the centuries, since the mystery of Golgotha was accomplished, the Christ impulse would have had little effect on them. However, it is not an impulse that has merely been imparted conceptually to the human intellect or to an understanding based on feelings, but it is a real impulse that has entered with living forces into the course of history. What is symbolized outwardly by the blood that flowed on Golgotha is the source of a living power that streams into the history of humanity. We shall try to understand through an historical event how this Christ event has exerted an influence without human beings having understood it, how it has been working as a livingly active force in human evolution. It is the task of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period to bring the whole inner nature and essence of the Christ impulse to consciousness. However, it had already been working as a living force in the subconscious regions of the soul before it could awaken to full consciousness within humanity. One of the figures whom the Christ impulse sought out in order to exert an influence and an influence of significance through her is, for example, and I could have chosen other examples, that of the Maid of of Orleans. When we trace the history of Europe back to an event which was enacted in connection with the personality of the Maid of Orleans, we must say, even if we observe history only from an outward perspective, what she accomplished at that time, when by rising up amidst the French people she drove back the English forces, for she did indeed achieve this, was the initial step in giving the form to the map of Europe that it has gradually acquired. Any other view of the history of the last few centuries, insofar as it relates to the arising of European nations and states, is a fabrication, a view that does not take into account the fact that the Christ impulse, which was at the time a living force in determining the boundaries and identities of the European nations, was working actively with the Maid of Orleans. One might well say that while learned people have disputed about many things, beginning with arguments about the question whether the Last Supper was eaten in this or that form, whether this or that should be interpreted by this or that formula, and while learned people have shown that with their conscious minds they have not arrived at an understanding of the nature of the Christ impulse. This same impulse was working through the simple country girl, through the maid of Orleans. It has been molding the shape of European history, for the influence of the Christ impulse is not dependent upon the understanding that one has for it. It was through its Michaelic representative that the Christ impulse exerted an influence on the maid of Orleans. However, the Maid of Orleans had to pass through something similar to an initiation for this to happen. 
we speak today of initiation. And for this purpose, we give to human consciousness the rules that are put together in the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? But such an initiation could not, of course, apply to the Maid of Orleans. In her case, one can only speak of an initiation that was in a certain sense a remnant of an older initiation and which was enacted more in the subconscious regions of the human soul. These old initiations have continued to exist as elemental forces even until modern times. And in old legends and fairy tales much is said about things that happened to one or another person which evoked within him the inner soul capacity enabling him to perceive certain aspects of the spiritual world. This is merely an indication that independently of human involvement and by virtue of the influence of divine spiritual forces that pervade the world, certain people who are suited for this through their karma are natural initiates, thanks to the place given to them by the karma of humanity, where this karma of humanity flows together with their own karma. A very beautiful echo of such a natural initiation, as one could call it, is given to us in a poem which speaks of how the, quote, son of the sun, S-O-N-S-U-N, Olaf Astason, abided during the thirteen nights and days that elapsed from the birth of Jesus until the appearance of Christ, until the 6th of January, in a kind of sleep condition. Olaf Astason's very name indicates that he possessed hereditary cognitive forces of a subconscious nature. For Olaf Astason actually means someone through whom flows the blood of his ancestors. Olaf Astason, the son, S-O-N, of the son, S-U-N, sleeps and dreams through the thirteen nights that are the darkest of the earthly year, or, at any rate, contain the greatest power of the year's earthly darkness, from the first day of Christmas until 6 January, the festival of Epiphany. Now the connection with these nights that features in such legends is not the result of some crazy superstition. The fact is that there are two times in the year that relate cosmically as two opposite poles to the life of the human soul in the body. The time of the year that lies in summer around the festival of St. John's is the season which is especially suitable for the human soul, together with all its passionate impulses, to be drawn up into and to be united with the cosmos through the outward physical power of the sun, which then attains its greatest strength. Thus when, in ancient times, people forgot themselves and were drawn up in the course of this festival into the strong outward physical forces of the cosmos, the St. John's Festival had the task of imbuing the human soul with the divine spiritual forces with which the cosmos is pervaded. But when the power of the sun reaches its physically weakest point in the middle of winter, the spiritual forces that are active in the darkness attain their greatest strength. And one would be right to say that the festival of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth is celebrated at this time in accordance with cosmic laws. When the outer physical world is at its darkest point, the soul can have the most powerful experiences when it feels united with the forces that spiritually pervade the aura of the earth. Hence it is during those days that Olaf Astason sleeps and sleeps and experiences all that we call Kamaloka, then what we call the spirit world, and finally the world of spirit. And the Norwegian legend tells us how once he has awakened after the thirteen nights, Olaf Astason is able to relate what he has experienced, how he has met with souls in the worlds of soul and spirit. These are pictures that correspond to an imaginative knowledge, but they are indicative of living realities accessible to human souls when they feel themselves to be transported at that time of physical darkness. Parenthesis, which is, however, a time of spiritual enlightenment, close parenthesis, to what is working and weaving in the earth's aura. 
At the end of the legend we see the forces of the Christ impulse, which powerfully enthrall Olaf Astason in his subconscious mind. Such legends speak, as it were, of natural initiations which were still possible in ancient times, of a direct perception of the spiritual world. At these times the aura of the earth has indeed a power that it does not have when it is flooded and irradiated by the physical power of the sun. And as Christ has, since the mystery of Golgotha, been united with the earth's aura, the power of the Christ impulse can exert a particular influence in the course of these days upon human souls, if they are receptive to it. Thus, before investigating anything historically, one might presuppose that also in the case of a figure such as the Maid of Orleans, the Christ impulse must have been working subconsciously in her soul for thirteen days, that she must have experienced an enlightenment through the Christ impulse similar to what Olaf Astason underwent in a state of sleep in the thirteen days and nights. The Maid of Orleans must then have been in a condition resembling sleep in the thirteen days that lie between 25 December and 6 January, and on 6 January, after her soul had been entranced in a kind of sleep, the Christ impulse must have taken hold of her soul. What can be thus presupposed did indeed take place in a particular way, albeit during a special time, when a person is abiding in a state of sleep. Before a human being takes his first breath in earthly life, before he is delivered from his mother's body and receives the first ray of earthly physical light, he spends a period as a developing human being in a condition which can truly be termed a state of sleep. Just as in the evening one enters into a state of dreamlike sleep, so is one in such a condition in the body of one's mother. And those days when dreamlike sleep is most receptive to the unconscious influences of the spiritual world are the last days that a person spends in the body of the mother. Thus it could also well be that in the case of the Maid of Orleans these days would have been used to implant the Christ impulse into her being before she perceived the physical light of the sun with her physical eyes and took her first breath outside her mother's body. This did indeed happen for the Maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. On the 6th of January, the whole village came together because something of an indeterminate nature could be discerned in its aura. This is an historical fact. The people did not know what had occurred. The Maid of Orleans had been born. Much lies hidden behind such things, and only when humanity comes to be able to see this mysterious fact in its true light will there also be any understanding of what is actually going on beneath the surface of outward events? The divine forces seek the most manifold ways of making their approaches to the human soul. Of course, the karma of the Maid of Orleans had to be suited to something of this kind, but because her karma brought it about that she was born on 6 January, this provided historically for making it possible for the Christ impulse to work in a particular way upon this figure of history and gave Europe a completely new form. These are things which one can imagine if one studies the course of history with a certain understanding. These are the things with which a spiritual understanding will connect in future when this present fifth post-Atlantean cultural period has brought forth from human souls all their forces of cognition. Human souls will then experience the existence of the Christ impulse with an ever greater degree of consciousness. But they will only do so if humanity enters into a state where spiritual science is no longer regarded as a mere theory, but is felt to be something living and is inwardly experienced. Spiritual science will then be able to fulfill its true mission in the evolution of mankind. In a time such as ours, we must be especially conscious that it is necessary to bridge the abyss that in a materialistic age increasingly opens up between the human souls that live incarnated here in a physical body and those that have already passed through the gate of death. And one will increasingly come to regard the souls living between death and a new birth as just as much 
belonging to humanity as a whole, as those who are in the physical life between birth and death. The awareness that we are all united in the earthly realm, also those who have gone before us into the supersensible regions, who are still active among those of us who are in physical bodies, albeit with different forces, must become ever stronger and more intense. But for this an understanding of the spiritually active forces is necessary. It is necessary that we learn to see the connections between earthly phenomena in that new light that spiritual science can give. Because spiritual science is intended to be something that moves our hearts while at the same time bringing our minds further on their path of knowledge, I want to speak to you of something that occurred in our circles in recent weeks. This is also a way of relating to and shedding light upon much that we have been preoccupied with recently in the wider context of our spiritual scientific stream of knowledge. I could, to be sure, also choose other instances, but these cases are linked so directly with our karma that I am again able to speak of them today. You can extend what I shall say to others both within and outside our spiritual scientific movement whose destiny and its relationship to their death bear a similarity to the cases of which I wish to speak. Last autumn we experienced a deeply moving event in the vicinity of our building in Dornach. Some dear friends had moved to Dornach with their children and had found somewhere to live near the building in order to look after the gardens. The eldest of the children a boy of seven, who was wide awake intellectually, but also had quite particular heart qualities, was indeed something of a son-child, S-U-N. One felt deeply drawn to the soul of this child, even if one saw him only fleetingly every now and then. When the father had to enlist in order to fulfill his duty as a German citizen, the seven-year-old boy was, I might say, wholeheartedly in the life situation of doing his best to replace his father by helping his mother in whatever way he could. He went to town by train and did the shopping completely on his own, despite being only seven. One evening he did not return. It was an evening when there was a lecture. Someone who knew us well came at about ten o'clock and said that the boy was missing. There seemed in the end a little doubt that the boy's absence had something to do with the accident of a furniture van, which had overturned near the building, at a place where most probably no such van had ever been before, and had not done so since, and in all likelihood would not for quite some time to come. It had fallen down a small slope into a field in such a way that the drivers said that there could be no question of lifting the van that evening. They unharnessed the horses, because they were very concerned about them, and left the van where it was with the intention of lifting it the following day thinking that it would take a whole day to restore the heavy van to an upright position. It was now ten o'clock in the evening. We had to connect the boy's disappearance with the accident involving this van. All possible implements were fetched, and everyone able to work helped, and in two hours the van had been lifted. Around midnight we found the dead boy beneath the van. Now if one considers the external facts namely that shortly before this happened many different strands came together, so that the boy, who otherwise always took a somewhat different path, which would have led him to pass the van on its right side, on the occasion in question chose a path which led him past its left side at the moment when it overturned, that he had been detained by some well-wishers for roughly a quarter of an hour. He had had some supper in the so-called canteen. With the result that he had come away later than he would have wished, that the incident took place in such a way that it was only a few minutes later that the boy was at the spot where the van toppled over, and no one noticed what happened to him. Some people who were not far away saw the van overturning, but they had not seen the boy. If one considers all of this, one recognizes this outward scenario as an excellent example of the kind of logical deception that one can so easily fall prey to. I have often spoken to you about this, and have shown that people can be subject to delusions in ordinary life, so that they become confused about cause and effect. I have given the example of seeing someone in the distance walking beside a river, 
One sees that he suddenly staggers and falls into the river. Shortly afterward his dead body is pulled out of the water. Now, one would have good outward reasons for supposing that the person concerned fell into the river and was drowned. And if one does not investigate further, one would adhere to this judgment. In this case, one only needs some external means to be convinced of this or a different point of view. One's initial judgment is strengthened by finding a stone at the place where the person fell into the river. But when the body is opened up, it is discovered that he had had a stroke, that he had fallen into the river as a result, and that he had died not because he had fallen into the river, but had done so because he was dead. Thus cause and effect are completely muddled up. For those with the requisite insight, this happens particularly in the realm of science. In our present case, where we are considering the death of this boy, we must say, the van conveying the furniture had been ordered by this boy's karma. His karma brought the van to this very spot. It is wrong to think that it was an accident. In this case, the boy was only to reach his seventh year in this incarnation. I might even say that the whole event was arranged accordingly. We must get used to viewing cause and effect altogether differently to the way that they are seen in ordinary life. When we look with the eye, E-Y-E, of a seer at the life of this soul, we will be deeply moved by a significant fact, which at the same time sheds light upon the spiritual mysteries of the world. Not long after the boy's death, the whole aura of the building in Dornach changed. In saying this, I am telling you something connected with my own experiences. If one has oneself to work for this building of the Anthroposophical Society, if one has to arrange what is to happen there, one knows what one owes to the helping forces that stream into one's soul from such an aura. Since the event that I have described, the unspent etheric body of the boy has actually been connected with the aura of the building in Dorna. The etheric body is what is laid aside by a person. The individuality, consisting of the ego and astral body, goes further on its way. That is something quite different. But when an etheric body of a child of so tender an age is laid aside, it has forces within it which could have sustained the physical body and physical life for decades. These forces have now passed through the portal of death, unused. They are laid aside after a few days. These forces are now active in the aura of the building. One cannot therefore say that in the case of this individuality it is the soul that is involved, but rather the unspent etheric body. Nothing is lost, even in the spiritual world. The physicist knows that nothing of physical forces is lost, that the forces are simply transformed. Similarly, in the spiritual world, we must look for transformed forces, unspent etheric forces that rise up into the spiritual world from people who have died young. We come close to these things when we observe them by means of actual instances. It is only for this reason that I am speaking to you today about them. A dear anthroposophical friend died some weeks ago in Zurich after a life which had brought her much testing, and the karma of our movement brought it about that I had the task of speaking at the cremation. The time from her death until the cremation lasted from six o'clock in the Wednesday evening when her death occurred until the following Monday at 11 a.m., thus a longer time than normal. The separation of the individuality from the etheric body had already happened by the time of the cremation. The remarkable thing was that during the time when the soul had released itself from the etheric body, in the interval between the onset of death and the cremation, I was confronted with the necessity of speaking certain words, both before and after the address at the cremation. My own verbal faculties had very little to do with the way these words were formulated. But by identifying with the soul that had crossed the threshold of death, the necessity arose of characterizing this soul, but in such a way that the characterization was given as an inspiration, an illumination that came from the soul itself. It was as though the soul said, Formulate words, 
whereby that which characterizes my soul appears in the words that sound. But there was in my mind still a certain unconsciousness. The words did not have a conscious origin, but they derived from the being of the soul. I had to characterize it as it wanted to be reflected, not in an egotistic way, but as it appeared to itself when another soul contemplated it. And this other soul was obliged, by necessity, even in the way that particular words were formulated, to speak what follows at the beginning of what one might call a funeral oration. The following words had to be spoken as though addressing the soul that had passed through the gate of death. Quote, you appeared among us. The moving gentleness of your being spoke out of the quiet power of your eyes. An enlivening peace flowed in the waves with which your gaze conveyed the weaving of your inner being to all things and to other people. And this being was ensouled by your voice, which eloquently, more through the manner of speaking than the words themselves, revealed what lay hidden within your beautiful soul. Yet wordlessly they fully revealed a devoted love to those attentive to it. This being who from a quiet noble beauty proclaimed a receptive awareness of world soul creativity. Close quote. As said, these words had to be spoken at the beginning and at the end of the funeral. Now, this soul was in a certain sense sleeping during the whole event, during the funeral ceremony. Then followed the cremation. The remarkable thing was that the first moment of a lighting up of consciousness, later gradually to fade again, occurred for the soul at the moment when not the flame but the warmth took hold of the corpse. Thus one could say, this soul has now passed through the gate of death. It had put aside its etheric body, and now it could be seen how such a soul looks back. In this backward review, the whole funeral ceremony stood before this soul, that is, it perceived what had been said. And one could see the mystery of the working of time for the soul once it has passed through the gate of death. This could always have been seen in such a case. When one is here in the physical body and looks at something in the spatial realm and then goes away from it, this object does not go away but remains where it is and one can continue to look round it, one sees that it is still there. This is not how it is with what we experience in a temporal sense in physical life. We have only a memory picture of events. But when one looks back at events after death, they continue to be there. One looks at the sequence of events as though through space. Thus, what had been spoken had continued to be there and the soul looked back at it through the passage of time as at an object in space. This is what perceiving the phenomena of the Akashic record is like. Then there, again, ensued a kind of sleep. But especially in this case, it was so clearly apparent that the materialistic soul's fear that when the soul crosses the threshold of death, one's consciousness would be diminished is without foundation. For... When we sink into a kind of sleep after death, we do not have no or too little consciousness until we subsequently awake, but we have too much consciousness. When we have laid aside the etheric body and when the life's tableau has come to an end, we are initially so filled with consciousness. I have spoken about this in the cycle entitled The Inner Nature of Man and the Life Between Death and a New Birth that the consciousness becomes dazzlingly bright and the human individual has first to orient himself and he orients himself by looking back upon his own earthly life and his character in this earthly life. He has to orient himself through self-knowledge. It is there that the power of orientation can gain a foothold. And through this what is in a certain sense an excess of consciousness is dampened down to the extent that he is able to come to terms with whatever he may have undergone in this last incarnation. It is therefore a dampening down of the excess consciousness that was present to the extent that the person can bear it. But this can occur in stages. 
and under the impression of the warmth, the heat, taking hold of the body, there arose a first lighting up of real consciousness in the soul of this personality with whom we were befriended. That a soul that has passed through the gate of death does, however, endeavor to bring together what resides within it manifested itself to me, especially clearly through another case. I said that these things can be experienced with every death, but I am giving you characteristic examples from the most recent time. I was able to see this with quite particular clarity in another instance, when a personality well known to us crossed the threshold after she had reached old age. During the last years that she spent on the earth, she had devoted herself in a quite unusual way with all her feelings and sensibilities to what one may call the impulses of spiritual science. She embraced all the different aspects of spiritual science more with her feelings than with her intellect. She united with her soul the kind of sensibility that results from a non-theoretical, true-to-life conception of spiritual science. Now, the situation with this personality was that shortly after her death, during the experience of the tableau of her life associated with her etheric body, there radiated from the soul with which one then identified that which this soul was now seeking to take hold of as its self when it had laid aside its body. And shortly after death it occurred, when the soul was still united with the etheric body, I had to write down some words, which again I had not formulated through my human knowledge, but which are none other than an account of what the soul was working on within itself, in order, as it were, to bring together, as though in a kind of resume, what it had been able to receive from spiritual science, in order to come to an inwardly full self-consciousness. This resounded in the soul with words that, in accordance with an inspiration, I also had to speak before and after the funeral address. You will immediately notice the great difference between the whole tone of these words from those that I previously cited in connection with the other personality. Quote, in world expanses I will bear my feeling heart, that warm it may become in the fire of the working of holy forces. In world thoughts I will to weave my own thinking, that clear it may become in the light of the eternal life in becoming. In soul foundations, I will to immerse the sense of what has been, that strong it may become for true aims of human working. In God's peace I so aspire midst life's struggles and concerns, myself for the higher self-preparing, striving for peace in joyous work, sensing world being in my own being, I would fulfill man's highest duty. May I live expectantly in the light of destiny's star that grants me the place in the realm of spirit. Close quote. Self-characterization of the soul in a personal form. In the former case, you have the clear character that the soul that is observing must delineate the other soul out of a mutual mental association with it. Here, the observing soul had nothing to do other than put itself wholly in the place of the soul that was still seeking to understand itself in its being, enriched as it had been by spiritual science. With the forces of the astral body, in order to gain some degree of clarity as to how it had now to orient itself in the spiritual world. There are cases where it becomes so fully clear that when a person has gone through the portal of death, he is instructed to look back at his self in self-knowledge. Moreover, it has been clearly apparent that it is to a certain extent helpful for the dead person if someone still dwelling in a physical body helps him to formulate in words what is living and weaving within him. 
Of course, the times when the individual concerned perceives his weaknesses and his errors in the soul world are still to come. But we must state that to the extent that death is at times feared by those who still abide in the body, death takes a very different course when viewed in retrospect from the other side. Here in the physical body, no one can look back with ordinary human forces to the hour of his birth. Indeed, there is no one who does not have clairvoyant powers for whom it is possible to look upon his entry into the world. Only later does the point of time arrive to which one is able to look back. The precise opposite is the case with that birth into the spiritual world which we call death. A person perceives this moment constantly in the life between death and a new birth. This moment alone is one of the most glorious, most wonderful and most beautiful things that one can see in the spiritual world. Viewed from the other side, death is always the direct proof that the spirit unremittingly celebrates its victory over physicality, something that one experiences through one's own being. Hence this aspiration to experience within the soul, after death, what one is able to be. It is therefore a help If a soul living in a body formulates in words that toward which the soul is aspiring, so that what it is appears, together with all the best that it has, before its own spiritual sight, after it has passed through the gate of death. One could precisely in this case see so rightly how such words that relate to the self of the soul in question come to one with an inner necessity when one has to speak at the funeral, and where one speaks not arbitrarily, but obeys the divine voice that bids one to do what one has to do. This became apparent to me through the karmic course of recent times in yet another case, when one of our friends, in whom great hopes for the future of our movement were invested, died in his early youth. He died in his thirtieth year. He would have been thirty years old on 26 February and died shortly before. This friend, our dear Fritz Mitcher, was someone who with infinite self-sacrificial devotion infused out of his scholarly nature what he was able to attain in his scholarly pursuits with spiritual science, and hence indeed had something in his sights that is so necessary for our movement embracing the full extent of our modern science in such a way as to imbue it with spiritual science and to express it in spiritual scientific terms, so that one stands fully on the ground of scientific understanding. He was well prepared for this. Even if the course of karma is such that such souls pass prematurely through the gate of death, this has its significance in the course of the world as a whole. And just as in the other cases, because I had been urged through karma to speak at the funeral, it also happened then that I had to speak words at the beginning and at the end of the funeral address, which had likewise to be spoken in the same way by putting oneself in the place of the being of the soul, so that the words were again not formulated arbitrarily but were composed in living association with the soul that had crossed the threshold of death. This is what I was obliged to say. Quote, As a hope that gladdens us, so do we venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. Your longing had its deep affinity with a pure love of truth. The goal to which you tirelessly aspired throughout your life was creation from the spirit light. You cultivated your fine gifts to follow with sure step the radiant path of spirit knowledge, unswayed by outward opposition as a true servant of the truth. Your spirit organs you enhanced that they boldly and persistently thrust error from you to both sides of the path and create for you a realm for truth. 
to fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within you was your concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched your soul, for knowledge as the light that to existence meaning gives held for you life's truest worth. As a hope that gladdens us, so do you venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. A loss that deeply us aggrieves, so do vanish from the field where earthly seeds of spirit have matured for your senses' spheres in the womb of soul-being. Feel how we look lovingly up to the heights that called you now away for other creating. Extend your strength from realms of spirit to the fields you've left behind. Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands which to our dead friends we owe. As a hope that gladdens us, a loss that deeply us aggrieves. Let us hope that from far and near, unforsaken for our life, you shine as starry soul in spirit realms. Close quote. Already during the following night, I could experience that these words resounded from this soul, from out of the spirit realm. Quote, to fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul, for knowledge as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Close quote. I can assure you that when I had written these lines down, I had not even remotely thought that the two verses were as they were, with every you changed into me and every your into my. I only became aware of this when the two verses sounded back to me from the other soul as an answer during the following night. Thus the verses remained exactly as they were, except that they were transposed from the second person to the first. If I mention this, it is because a heart understanding can arise within us of how the possibility will remain in the future of human evolution of speaking from soul to soul, when the mouth can no longer be used as an instrument. For just as we receive an answer through the mouth of the other soul for everyday life, so it was exemplified here, where the soul gave an answer even from the unconscious part of its being, as if it were saying, I have understood, for this is indeed how it was with me in life, now that I have laid the body aside. I can understand what I was striving toward in life. It is not only a question of receiving concepts, thoughts, and ideas about the spiritual worlds, but of living as a human being in a certain way, in a particular life. In that, as people of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period, we are approaching the sixth and seventh cultural periods. It is essential that the abyss separating the living from the so-called dead is bridged, that humanity increasingly becomes one, not only in so far as it is incarnated in the body, but also in so far as it has acquired those forms of existence that people experience between death and a new birth. Spiritual science has the task of not merely bringing this to mankind, but it is the first, I might say still stammering, attempt to do so for the life that the earth needs for the rest of this post-Atlantean evolution. For what can be given in spiritual science is indeed now still merely a tentative beginning to what future generations of humanity will experience through spiritual science. I wanted by means of this description which seeks through the power of the heart to shed some light upon circumstances relating to life and death, to give some indication to you today 
of this focus of spiritual science upon life, so that you may develop an understanding different from one oriented around the head, namely an understanding of the heart, such as we seek in a living way through spiritual scientific study and is accordingly the task of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period. It will be followed by the sixth and the seventh periods of culture. However, one will only rightly grasp what it is about Central European culture that is to be defended if one intimately feels its connection with what mankind has to achieve in the fifth cultural period. A start can then be made with what I referred to at the beginning of today's lecture, a broadening of the perspective of what lies hidden within our destiny-laden times. In the East, a kind of human life is being prepared, which will have a significance for the future. We need only to read about this in the cycle about titled The Mission of Folk Souls that I gave in Christiania. But the soul nature of the East European not to speak of the Far East, is fundamentally different from that of someone from Central Europe. And we must, through what spiritual science shall represent for us, come to have an open mind for such matters. It is a familiar story that the Varangians were summoned by the Russian Slavs and that they were told, we have a wonderful country, but we cannot create order in it. Come to us and bring us order establish some kind of government for us. This is a nice story about the origins of Russian history, but it is no more than a legend without any historical basis. Things did not happen like this. The truth is that these Varangians went out as conquerors and no one asked them to come. Nevertheless, what is thus related in the story has a greater significance than it would have if it corresponded with an historical truth for it has a truly prophetic significance. It represents something that has not happened but will happen in the future. What is to develop in the East will have to unfold in such a way that the capacities of the Eastern peoples are used for taking up what the culture of the West has created and allowing it to be elaborated further and fructified with what originates in the West. This will be the task of the Eastern peoples at some point in the future. The actual nature of the Russians of Eastern Europe can be briefly characterized by looking not at that mendacious group of individuals that now rules the Russian people, but at the people themselves. Then we must be quite clear that the Russian soul has an immense range of gifts, that it is, so to speak, gifted in all sorts of ways. But as it increasingly unfolds its mission in the evolution of the world and of humanity, it will become apparent that the phenomenon that it presents is one of gifts without the power to realize them. The range of gifts will grow increasingly and will become ever greater. But what, for example, distinguishes the Central European is that he has united his gifts with spiritual power that he evokes that quality of endeavoring constantly to strive and lives intimately with his folk spirit, that he wants to make a reality of what he seeks to understand. This is magnificently apparent in Fichte's philosophy, where the ego, in order to understand itself, seeks constantly to create itself. The greatness of this philosophy will one day be appreciated. And this so characteristic quality of Central Europe is present in a polar opposite form in Russia, in the east of Europe. These Russian souls are receptive to an extreme degree. They have the greatest gift for absorbing things. But if one attributes to them a productive capacity, one is under an illusion. They are called upon to develop gifts without the capacity to realize them. The very idea is difficult to grasp, because this is something that has not existed before in human evolution, but it must gradually take this course. And in the future it will indeed happen that the call will go forth from the east to the west. We have a wonderful country, but no order, for the disorder will become even greater. Come and create order. 
Central Europe is called upon to bring the productive capacity of the spirit to the East. What is happening at present is an unreasoning resistance to what must occur in the future. People try to stamp out what has to come about only to say, come to us and create order. In the history of human evolution, what is most strongly resisted and rejected is that which in the end is most longed and striven for. The greatest misfortune that could arise is that Eastern Europe, that Russia, should be victorious in this process. It would be the greatest misfortune, not for Central Europe, but for Russia itself. The very greatest misfortune, from an inward perspective. For this victory would have to be reversed. Its effects could not be allowed to remain. Thus we are facing a tragic moment in human evolution, that the East is defending itself against something for which it will long in future and with all its forces. For it would be doomed to disaster if it does not allow itself to be fructified by the spiritual and intellectual life of what is for it the West, the peoples immediately adjacent to its Western boundary. And the West in this context must itself, in the further course of its cultural development, bring forth not merely idealism, but a living spiritual life. This living spiritual life will be like a spiritual sun which will move from west to east in a direction opposite to the course of the outer sun. And in an outward sense, Russian people will increasingly see how little they are able to achieve through their own forces and that they must set about finding their true place in the whole evolutionary process of mankind and that they would be committing the greatest sin if they repudiated or misinterpreted the culture developed by the peoples on their western fringe. We have been able to experience what I might call some strange anticipatory indications of this. Did not something arise in Eastern Europe which would have been an impossibility in the West, the so-called world conception of the barefooted? This is a kind of philosophy that has quickly become widespread, although a few years ago it did not exist. The barefooted the world conception of those who make a lack of faith in man and in humanity into a philosophy. Since they cannot believe that man is actually anything other than a being who wanders about between birth and death amidst toil and fear, such that the words freedom, brotherhood, compassion, pity and love are empty clichés, and that the only wisdom consists in wandering through the world as a pilgrim with bare feet, who looks upon the whole degeneracy of Western European culture, to express it in barefoot terms, as a great illusion, and who considers the ragged clothes, the bare room, and the broad road to be the path that a person follows when he has attained the heights of barefootedness. And when a writer gives expression to this world conception of the barefooted in significant words, spoken by one of his characters, it must make a strange impression on us, inasmuch as we try out of our Central European world conception always to discover what may kindle for mankind the light of the future. When a writer lets one of his characters express what is actually a kind of summation of the barefoot world conception and of the philosophy of those who adhere to it, what do we make of it? Quote, Indeed, What does man mean to you? Do you understand? He takes you by the scruff of the neck. He squashes you like a flea with his fingernail. Then you are to take pity on him. Well, now, you can then show him how foolish you are. In return for your pity, he will stretch you with seven tortures, wind your intestines round your hand, and tear every vein out of your body, an inch every hour. You fool! Pity? Pray to God that they may whip you without mercy, and there's an end to it. Pity? What nonsense! Close quote. And Gorky, of whom you will have heard much, says of such words, quote, cruel but true, close quote, in that he is not only recounting the world conception of a fictional personality, as the writer expresses it, but his own world conception, which is the way that he views the world. 
This is the world conception of a barefooter, a world conception that one can speak about as one might of any other current world conception. It is the world conception that has lost the possibility of transcending itself, of reaching beyond itself to something that sends light into life, that has to wait until it is fructified by this light and is then able to fulfill its mission, but is now rebelling against what it should be doing. Many are the slogans that one will have encountered in the world, but one of my most painful experiences has been of the empty words that were bandied about by the various parties in August 1914 at the war assembly of the Russian Duma. Such a mountain of clichés surpasses everything in its empty verbiage. Such things as this are spoken only when all living creative power of the soul has been exhausted. The East is truly standing at the threshold of things to come, and it is developing a force that is opposed to what will one day be the source of its greatness. And we in Central Europe must say to ourselves, the East is waiting for the spiritual wisdom which must rise up from Central Europe. My dear friends, try to transform into feelings what I have sought to characterize in a few words, with, if I may say so, a heavy heart, so that this can shed light upon what we as spiritual scientists are able to encompass with an extended awareness, and into which we may penetrate in order to grasp the true present necessity of the spiritual scientific conception of the world. We shall then be imbued with thoughts, filled with understanding, which rise up from our souls into the cosmic expanses, thoughts which will then encounter the forces that will send their influence down from these worlds of spirit when peace will once more reign in the earthly domain. Today I have shown you how the influence is extended of those etheric bodies which as unspent etheric bodies are separated from souls and could have continued to work on behalf of physical life for years, even decades, here in the physical body. We cannot help thinking of the many unspent portions of etheric bodies rising up into the spiritual world. In addition, to what those people passing on the battlefields through the portal of death bring into the spiritual world through their individuality. These etheric bodies will form a great quantity of spiritual forces, and these forces can work from the spiritual spheres on developing a spiritual conception that will gradually take hold of humanity. However, in order that these forces, deriving from the unspent etheric bodies, can send down their influence from the spiritual spheres, they must be met with thoughts that likewise ascend into the spiritual spheres from earthly human beings, thoughts that bring understanding for the secret influences of the spiritual world, imbued as they are with the forces of these unspent etheric bodies. This should be for us a source of encouragement that we fully explore the great truths of spiritual science. For these truths will stimulate within us thoughts which will then go on working in other people. And as the destiny-laden content of our present time takes its course, a time of peace will ensue when that which has come to pervade our souls from spiritual science will rise up and meet with the forces that have gathered and now streamed down from the etheric bodies of those who, on the battlefields of the present, have passed through the gate of death. And then will occur something that I should like to summarize in a few words, which arises as an outcome of spiritual scientific research. If we rightly bring the fruits of spiritual science to bear upon what is taking place in our time, the result will be something that I should like to express in the following words. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice. There will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. The end of Lecture 5. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.podbean.com. 
please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death, 15 Lectures, translated by Simon Blackslund de Lange. This is Lecture 6, given in Nuremberg on the 14th of March, 1915, entitled Moral Impulses and Their Results, The Relationship of the European Peoples to Their Folk Spirits, The Cultural Impulse of Eurythmy. It might at first seem, and also does seem to many people, as if that which one calls, in the true sense, clairvoyant powers, through which the beings and processes of the spiritual worlds can be recognized, are not available to people in everyday life, and are not developed within their souls. But this is not so. Clairvoyant powers are not forces which are necessarily unfamiliar and alien to people in their daily lives. This is not the case. On the contrary, what we develop in order to gain insight into the spiritual worlds, what we must draw forth from the deep foundations of the soul, is with a certain soul activity also present in a person's ordinary life. It is present in what one calls man's moral impulses. A truly moral deed A truly moral impulse derives from the same faculties of the soul that lead through the corresponding development to clairvoyant faculties. As far as ordinary life is concerned, the fact is that everything that a person does can come out of what resides within his bodily nature or what he has acquired in the course of life for and through his body. When someone develops desires, When he does this or that which he is induced to do through his education or his other life circumstances, it is the bodily nature from which the corresponding impulse proceeds. But there are in human life impulses that do not come from the bodily nature, where only the soul is involved when a person takes hold of these impulses. These are moral impulses. A truly moral deed is one for which the body is called upon for help in order that one can have a conception of the moral deed. But the impulse, the drive toward the moral deed, lies in the soul spiritual realm. And this is independent of the body. One will never be able to give a definition of morality with mere philosophy. And it is characteristic of any philosophy that seeks to be a moral philosophy that it does not come to a right, satisfactory definition of morality if it does not start from the premise that it is possible for man to experience his soul spiritual nature independently of the body. The only right way to define morality is to say that something is moral where a person decides what he does through forces that are independent of his body. Now, we know that human life is composed of moral, less moral, and immoral actions. The difference that exists between moral and immoral actions manifests itself in its true light only to occult investigation. In the smallest cycle of his life, the 24-hour period, a person enters into the state of sleep. This state of sleep consists in that the ego and astral body essentially leave the physical and etheric bodies and then live outside this physical and etheric organism. Now, it is not enough simply to state that the ego and astral body leave the physical and etheric bodies, for one must also be clear that in that the ego and astral body depart from the etheric and physical bodies, they are received into the spiritual worlds that supersensibly hold sway around us. We enter the supersensible worlds with our ego and astral body. If during the day in our waking state we have had a moral impulse and have accomplished a moral deed, there is the following situation. 
We must, as regards our ego and astral body, be received by the spirits of the next highest hierarchies, by the spirits that we include among the hierarchy of the Angeloi, Archangeloi, and so on. They must receive us. We, as it were, enter into them when we go to sleep. Just as by day we live in the body, so while we are asleep are we within the beings of the higher hierarchies. Thus we have this clearly in mind. Now if we have accomplished a moral deed or have had a moral impulse, the possibility exists for the beings of the next highest hierarchies to receive our ego and our astral body together with our moral impulses or whatever has continued to exist of them in our soul, in accordance with spiritual cosmic laws. If we have committed an immoral act or had an immoral impulse, we cannot enter during sleep with it. And with the residue of what has been formed within us as a result of the immoral impulse into the beings of the higher hierarchies. That within us which is immoral is indeed thrust back again into our bodily nature. The consequence of this is that everything that we bring into the spiritual worlds during sleep that is an after effect of something moral does not work within our physical and etheric bodies for it is taken away from them. On the other hand, immoral thoughts, immoral impulses, and immoral actions become something that is thrust back into the etheric body and physical body. It continues to work within them. Thus there is the possibility that when someone is in the state of sleep, between going to sleep and waking up, the results of his immoral actions are working within his physical and etheric bodies. In this respect, it is easy to recognize something that I have often spoken about in lectures, namely that language has a wonderful genius, that it works in a wonderfully genial way. When we speak of guilt, the German word schuld conveys the precise meaning of what is involved here. We equate what we owe to the spiritual world with our moral actions, but we remain in debt to the spiritual world with respect to what we have to leave behind in the body, our immoral thoughts, our immoral impulses, our immoral actions. Now consider the following. If we were to spend our life in such a way that we would perceive and think about only the things of the outer world, the processes in our physical body would themselves be quite different than they are, since we do not only think and perceive, but also remember what we have thought, perceived, and experienced. What we think, imagine, and feel goes right down into our etheric body. But the etheric body imprints it on the physical body, and that which the etheric body creates in the form of impressions in the physical body is memory. When in later life we recall something that we have previously experienced, this means that our astral body, which has then united itself with the etheric body, is directly juxtaposed with what has remained as an imprint, as a seal's impression in our physical body. The materialistic conception that has developed is naive. It is, so it is thought, as though one memory would be sitting here in the brain and another one there, as though arranged in little boxes. This is not true. Every memory has an impression which fundamentally corresponds to the whole head, and to much else besides in the human form. And memories are intertwined rather than next to one another, as the naive materialist notion supposes. The activity of the memory is therefore dependent upon our astral body and etheric body being able to bring about impressions in our physical body. It is actually the same activity that occurs outwardly when we make a note of something for ourselves. When we look at our notes, what we have in our soul does not, of course, bear the least similarity to the signs that we have on the paper. On the paper are signs of some form or other, but through what we then make of them, we are stirred in our soul to re-enliven what we have noted down. A mental process takes place. And so it is with memory. 
what remains within us actually has essentially no more similarity to what appears in the soul when we recall it than what is on the paper has to what appears in our soul when we read what we have written. When beheld clairvoyantly, the situation where someone recalls something that he has previously experienced is like this. What lights up in his physical body is a sign that is in some way a copy of the human form beginning from the head and extending a little below it. These are signs. It is something else that appears in the memory, but these are signs. And what we experience as we remember is what the soul makes out of the signs. It is truly a subconscious reading that appears as memory. When natural science makes somewhat further progress and investigates the physical processes, it will come to be a help for spiritual science in that it will show that what remains in the body must first be subjected by the soul to a process that in the soul is fundamentally similar to reading. This process of remembering is a regular activity of the human soul. However, if we now send down into our body when going to sleep the results of immoral impulses, thoughts, or actions, we do not bring the immoral impulses that we have had forth from our physical body. As a result, something happens similar to what ordinarily happens in memory. The work on the physical body is imprinted there. And when a person now wants to go to sleep and his ego and astral body want to leave his physical and etheric bodies, this process begins. What he has to leave behind makes its impression in the way that memories do. And then come the pangs of conscience. Thus they are reflected back from that which was imprinted upon our physical body and also our etheric body through the events in question. This then remains. And because it remains like ordinary memories, these pangs of conscience remain and develop in intensity and then appear in the form of self-reproaches throughout our further life. That is the important thing that we come to, to see that moral behavior is a real process, that it is not something abstract, but that this moral behavior is a matter of bringing what we do here on earth up into the spiritual worlds. And as we surrender the results of our moral conduct to the higher hierarchies, they also in a certain sense remain within these higher hierarchies. But what we cannot take with us and goes on working within the physical and etheric bodies remains here on the earth. It is within the earthly process. When someone has passed through the gate of death, he must always look back at this. In that he does so, the impulse must arise within him to clear it away from the earthly process. This is the basis of the working of karma between death and a new birth. Thus we do indeed take the results of our moral impulses into our karma, but in that we bring them up into the spiritual worlds during sleep, they also make an impression there. We can say that the angels, the archangels, and also the spirits of personality now have that which we bring to them by way of moral impulses. What do they do with them? These moral impulses that are henceforth in the spiritual world are for the evolutionary course of the earth. They are the real fructifying seeds for later periods of the earth. It is not only that we preserve these results in our karma, but we bring up the impressions. And in future earthly epochs, the spirits of the higher hierarchies bear them down again. And these results of the moral impulses, then in later earthly epochs, form the fructifying seeds for the creative thinking of human beings and for human thinking as a whole. One may think that a period in earthly evolution is completely immoral so that no impressions of moral impulses would be born aloft into the spiritual worlds. 
A period would accordingly follow in earthly evolution when little would occur to people in relation to earthly life, when they would have few ideas and concepts, when there would be a poverty as regards what can pervade and inspire life with soul qualities. Thus we stand with our moral impulses in a real cosmic process. And spiritual science, which makes this apparent to us, is therefore well able to heighten and energize our self-responsibility. For it is only through it that we are aware what it means to be moral or immoral in human life. To be immoral means to take away from the earth its seeds of future life, to incorporate them in the physical earthly process in which they then become seeds of destruction for forthcoming earthly epochs. For, of course, they continue to be preserved there because nothing is lost. They then obliterate what should continue to live vitally within human souls. Let us suppose that a significant number of people would decide to live immorally in a certain epoch. This would then bring about a later epoch that was impoverished in thoughts, and souls would come down to the earth and find a poverty of thought on the earth. They would be condemned to a barren life. Now there is the possibility that we not only become aware of the nature of morality, If we do not take active account of the true reality of morality, we create desolation on the earth. But we need and we have the possibility to receive something else into our soul development, and that is the knowledge of the supersensible. The earth has actually never been wholly without knowledge of the supersensible. We know that in ancient times humanity received a certain inheritance of clairvoyant capacities and faculties, and hence also of clairvoyant knowledge. And it is not so long ago that the after-effects of this clairvoyant knowledge still existed on the earth. We also know that we live in a time when this clairvoyant knowledge has for some centuries been depleted to the point of disappearing altogether, and it must be replaced by clairvoyant knowledge that is consciously attained. We are living in this important time. And yesterday we called to mind the fact that the fifth cultural epoch and those who are its bearers have the task of consciously re-establishing clairvoyant knowledge in human souls. The fifth cultural epoch will not come to an end before a certain amount of clairvoyant knowledge has taken hold of a relatively large portion of humanity. It is true what Herder says, that Enlightenment will spread over the earth. All knowledge that we acquire from the purely sensory outer world, all thoughts that we have purely as after images of this outer world, cannot be brought so unconditionally into the spiritual world while we are sleeping. It is true that the thoughts, the ideas that we have, extend to a certain degree to the beings of the higher hierarchies, with the exception of immoral impulses. The images of the outer world that we acquire do indeed reach into the spiritual world to some extent, but they do not extend very far, and above all, no further than the sphere of the archangels. Thus, if a person is full of ideas that derive from the sense world, he cannot bring ideas developed solely from the world of the senses very far into the spiritual worlds. However, such supersensible ideas as we may experience are brought far into the spiritual worlds, and those beings who belong to the hierarchy of the archangels receive their impressions and bear them into later times. And the supersensible knowledge that is borne aloft into the spiritual worlds through the ego and astral body of human beings is subsequently related to the process of earthly evolution. What is now formed is not the active influence associated with moral impulses, the fructifying seeds, but the seeds for what we call the advancement of the earth. The rejection of supersensible ideas by an age signifies the condemning of a future age to make no progress in earthly evolution. 
someone who rejects supersensible ideas, hinders the progress of future ages, insofar as it is up to him. If a whole people became completely materialistic, this materialism of a whole people would condemn the earth to come to a standstill in its evolution for a future age, naturally to a certain extent, because the other peoples would not necessarily reject supersensible ideas. Thus here too we see again that the acquisition of supersensible ideas has a significance in the earthly process itself. Causes and effects, therefore, have a connection with the earthly process as a whole. Those people who are, in a certain sense, conscious materialists in our present time have actually been seduced by Aramanic spirits, for Araman has a great interest in obstructing rightful progress. Again, we see that spiritual science is in a position to intensify the individual human soul's feeling of responsibility toward the totality of the world. We see that spiritual science draws us away from the self and makes us participants in the whole unfolding process of humanity, that spiritual science is in its very nature a selfless activity of the human soul. In a certain respect, everything living in supersensible ideas is reflective of the moral life. Thus there is nothing more disturbing for knowledge of the supersensible worlds than filling the human soul with immoral impulses. Basically, we see from this what a deep foundation there is for saying that as preparation for clairvoyant development, an eminently moral way of thinking is demanded of human beings. It is indeed the task of the fifth epoch to ensure that human beings undertake to develop spiritual knowledge in a conscious way, so that in the post-Atlantean age that is still to come, the further advance of humanity is not impeded, so that such an advance may truly take place. And if, after all that has been spoken of now in recent days, we have to a quite particular degree ascribed the predisposition for spiritual knowledge to the Central European peoples, it must be clear to us that the further existence of the undisturbed development of Central European culture is of considerable significance. If in the context of what has been said we now turn our attention to the horizon of specifically European life, what do we find? There is, in the first place, a connection between the life of the various peoples and the life of the higher hierarchies. You need only to study the cycle about the development of the folk souls that was held in Christiania, and which is especially important at the present time, you need only to give it your serious attention, and you will see how archangelic beings influence the life of peoples, how this life of the various peoples, as it interacts with the higher hierarchies, is made manifest in what takes place here on earth. When we consider an individual human being, we know that his ego development is a slow and gradual process. It is true that consciousness of the ego begins in early childhood, from the time back to which one can remember. But this ego becomes ever more mature. It advances in its development. In our time there are considerable errors with respect to this ego development. There is far too little awareness that such a development of the ego is taking place in life. And one may have the experience that people today reckon themselves sufficiently mature in their earliest youth to judge everything, because they do not know that a certain age must first be reached in order to judge particular things, since only through this will the ego have reached sufficient maturity. As it is in a person's individual life, so it is also with the life of peoples. However, we must bear the following in mind if we want to understand the life of peoples in relation to individual human life on the physical plane. A human individual matures with respect to ego development by becoming more and more mature in himself. He also learns to have a better overview of the outer world. What do we know of the outer world? when we have reached the age of twenty or twenty-five? And what can we know if we spend our lives in a proper, orderly way? 
if we have lived for a further ten years. A spiritual scientist has to acquire a sense for such things. Thus this is how the ego stands in relation to the outer world, in relation to what surrounds this ego. It is different with the beings of the higher hierarchies. These beings of the higher hierarchies stand, for their part, in such a relation to our ego as we do to the things of the outer world. For us the phenomena and beings of the mineral, plant and animal kingdoms are the object. For the beings of the higher hierarchies, for example, our egos are the object. However, the relationship of the beings of the higher hierarchies to our egos is not one of perception, as we have with respect to the outer world, but is more an irradiating of our ego with the will of the higher hierarchies, an influence of the will of the higher hierarchies. Those archangelic beings that have the task of guiding the peoples truly stand in such a relation to the human individuals belonging to the peoples, as we stand with our faculties of perception toward the things of the outer world. We are the objects for these archangelic beings. What for us is the outer world, we are as human beings for the archangels, except that with us it is more a process of perception and with the archangels more a process of will. But with regard to this will process, the archangel also undergoes a development. This archangel, likewise, undergoes a maturation of his soul, though not with respect to his ego, but with respect to deeper forces of his soul. He undergoes a development through which he then gradually attains a different relationship to the human individuals belonging to his people. Just as with our more mature ego, we achieve a different relationship to our surroundings. Let us, for example, take the archangelic being to whom the guidance of what we know as the Italian people has been assigned in the course of history. This archangelic being has, for a long time, had a relationship to the Italian people such that it has essentially come to influence the higher parts of the soul. In its further course of development, however, this archangelic being has been working not only into the higher regions of the soul, but also into its lower aspects, into the passions and impulses of the soul that are still connected with the body. Thus the development of the archangelic being goes further. Firstly, it works more upon the soul nature itself, in the later course of its development, it becomes more powerful and works into that aspect of the soul that is more connected with the body. And we can, with respect to the Italian people, state that around the year 1530, the archangel underwent the stage in his development which can be characterized by saying, formerly he worked more upon the soul. Now he begins to impregnate with his will the soul in so far as it pervades the body. And now for the first time, the Italian people really begins with respect to its outer world to set about developing its national character. Study the history of the Italian people before the period specified, around the middle of the 16th century, and you will see that the archangel has still been influencing the inner soul qualities of the people in the Italian peninsula, but that then the outward national character, as we know it at present, really developed for the first time. Before this time, and such a point of time exists for every people, the soul life of the people is still vitally alive. This is so that the soul life of a people can receive this or that quality. The qualities are not yet so energetically imprinted. After this time, when the archangel has developed his will relationships to the deeper qualities of the soul, the character of the people becomes fixed. It enters into actual physical qualities. And the time begins when one can hardly approach the people with something that does not correspond with the national character. When a certain nervousness becomes apparent if one comes with 
something that does not wholly lie in the national line or stream. For the French people, this point of time can also be determined fairly accurately. It is, of course, only approximate, but for the French people, it can be assigned to the period around the year 1600, at the beginning of the 17th century, and for the English people, in the middle of the 17th century, around the year 1650. If you go back before this period to the time of the Middle Ages, you will see how much of a sense of community the peoples of Europe still have, and that the forming of the national characters of the various peoples begins in the periods that I have indicated. The archangel undergoes a development such that one can say, formerly his forces were still weaker, so that he could only influence the inner regions of the soul. Subsequently, the forces became stronger. He is able to extend his forces to the physical realm and thereby brings about the sharply delineated national character. Certain phenomena begin to become understandable if you apply such insights to historical study. Consider that at the time when the English people had its Shakespeare, the national character had not yet been formed in this way so that the fact that Shakespeare could no longer be understood precisely on the part of the English people has its origin in that the archangel has bound the differentiated national character in his firm embrace. There will only be a real study of history in the future if people no longer, as was generally the case in the 19th century, base their study of history on the premise that ideas are effective elements in history. A person can have ideas, but ideas cannot work as forces in history. Angels, archangels, and primal forces can also have ideas, but ideas must always proceed from beings. What exerts an influence must be a being. The whole study of history of the 19th century in so far as it speaks of ideas in history, is a chimera, because it is based on the belief that ideas are able to develop and freely move in a continuous stream of time. We can now raise the question, how is this with the German people? Was there also a specific time when the archangel reached a particular stage? Such a time has already come. But there is a certain difference between the German people and other peoples. We know that the human soul consists of the sentient soul, intellectual or mind soul, and consciousness soul. You can also see from the lectures about the folk souls that the archangel of the Italian people dedicates the forces available to him to working mainly upon the sentient soul, in the case of the French people, upon the intellectual or mind soul and in that of the British people upon the consciousness soul. And with the German people, the influence is upon the ego, which extends its authority over the three soul members. Thus the relationship of the archangel to the individual egos of the German people differs from that of the Western peoples. A point of time has already come when the archangel of the German people has taken hold of physical life, or the lower aspect of soul life, insofar as it enters into the physical domain. This is approximately the time between 1750 and, say, 1830. If one cares to study these things properly, one will discover some amazing insights into the course of development of various peoples. And if someone would but involve himself in studying the truly immense difference that exists in German life between people of the 19th and 20th centuries and those who lived 200 years earlier, he would see how considerable this difference is. At that time the archangel exerted his influence upon the national character of the German people, just as the archangels exerted their influence upon the other peoples at the times that I have indicated. But one could say that he withdrew it again, 
He did not leave his mark so energetically and so thoroughly upon the physical organism as happened with the other peoples. Hence it came about that what occurred in the second half of the nineteenth century was that the German people unconsciously received all manner of influences from the other peoples. And this has in our time already led to tragic conflicts. Just think of something such as the fact that in his whole world conception, insofar as he has based this world conception on science, Ernst Haeckel is utterly English, completely anglicized, that he has embraced English thought forms. Everything that he thinks is influenced by English nature. He takes Darwin and Huxley as his starting point. He regards Spencer as his philosophical god. And whereas one cannot really translate a book by Hegel or a book from our spiritual science into English, it is very easy to translate Haeckel into English. You will be astonished that I say this, because you are well aware that spiritual scientific books are translated into English. But what is in the books can only approximately be rendered in English translation. It is not really there, but only approximately. One cannot, for example, ever really translate into English the archetypically German sentence that belongs together with the sensibility of Meister Eckhart and everything that has developed in German culture in relation to Meister Eckhart. One cannot really translate this sentence into English, quote, In dem Gemüte lebt das Fünklein, in den sich in der Menschenseele die Weltseele offenbart. Close quote. Parenthesis, the spark wherein the soul of the world manifests itself in the human soul dwells within the heart. Close parenthesis. It is impossible to translate it properly into English since there is no equivalent for what is experienced in the word gimit. It is similar with the Hegelian dictum that forms a basic nerve of German philosophy. Sein und nicht sein vereinigen sich zur höheren Einheit im Werden. Parenthesis, being and non-being are united in a higher unity in becoming. Close parenthesis. Impossible to translate into English. Of course, one can translate everything, but that which is experienced through such a sentence cannot be reproduced in this language. The German language also has the particular property that it permits a certain fluidity, Think how infinitely easy it is to say when something is translated into English or French. This is wrong. One does not say such a thing. We Germans may not develop the bad habit of saying that something is wrong, but we must keep our language fluid. That is a radical way of putting it, of course. But if you go through our lecture cycles, you will see how much effort is devoted to finding ever new word structures, also word structures from which new words are formed. This derives from the fact that the activity of the archangel of the German people has ceased to be so sharply defined. He merely made an approach in the course of something less than a century and then left the people free again. There is infinitely much substance in what I am saying. But this also has to be so, for the German people has the task of transforming its idealism into spirit knowledge. Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, who are so attacked today, have created a thinking which, it is true, is not spiritualism or spiritual science, but which, if one inwardly meditates upon it, does indeed lead to spiritual science. But if this is to happen, the German national character must continue to be fluid. It must make it possible for one to say that whereas One can be an Italian, a Frenchman, or an Englishman. One is constantly becoming a German. In the case of the German people, the archangel has only established the basis for forming the national character. And in the same way being nationalistic or chauvinistic, in the way that the West European peoples are, would be an untruth for a German, something that he cannot be. Of course, one can do anything but it does not correspond to the true nature of a German person. 
Something entirely different applies to the Russian people. With the Russian people, it must above all be clearly perceived that the archangel relates to the individual egos of the people quite differently than is the case with Western and Central European peoples. The situation with the West European peoples is that the archangel influences, with his will emanations, the sentient soul of Italians, the intellectual or mind soul of the French, the consciousness soul of the British, and the ego of Germans. But with the Russian people, the folk spirit does not directly influence human souls. He, as it were, hovers over the people like a cloud, and the soul can only have a dim sense of and a yearning for him. He has, in a certain sense, remained a group spirit, and there is no inward interaction of the folk spirit with the individual human egos. One can hardly have a more tragic, more serious impression than if one is present at a Russian Orthodox service where the human ego of those who participate in it as believers is almost completely excluded. A totally impersonal universality that disregards the individual personality pervades everything that happens A quality not addressed to a human nature holds sway in this service. This is a direct expression of the fact that the Russian soul has not yet awoken to that enlivening quality deriving from the contact of the individual soul with the folk spirit. Everything tends toward rigid patterns and stereotypes, as exemplified both in the way things are done and in icon painting. We are confronting an entirely different phenomenon from what is the case in Western Europe. We find that the archangel has not yet come to the point of influencing the national character. Nationality is, therefore, still a dream of the soul for Russians. They do, of course, constantly speak of the truly Russian man, and Russian writers do the same, but this is a dream of the soul which is especially emphasized because the folk spirit is not embodied within human beings, and because the Russian has a longing for a folk spirit that lies above the purely personal. One must look into these deep mysteries, and one will then understand how the cultural realms of Europe relate to one another. It would, of course, never occur to me to see in this interface between these cultural realms the cause of present events, but indirectly it does indeed play a part. In particular, one must be quite clear that the flames of war that are now burning are a mighty sign that we must make ourselves familiar with what is working and weaving within the cultural life of Europe. We look up to beings of the higher hierarchies. We also see these beings of the higher hierarchies in course of development. While we as individual human beings develop our ego, we see these beings develop in such a way that they acquire more and more power to imbue the ego with the will. At first they still keep themselves distant from the ego. They overlight it from above, as with the Russian people. Then there is simultaneously a more intimate overlighting and living with, as is the case with the German people. And then there is a stricter and more inflexible working of the national character into single human individuals as is the case with the three West European peoples that have been characterized. From this you also see how the present phase of human evolution has come about. If you but look at European history, you will find, if you disregard Russia, where the circumstances are quite different, how similar, especially the life of the West European peoples, and in a certain sense also of the Central European peoples is, how a European internationalism reigns. And then we see that from the 14th century onward, a new age dawns for the various peoples. We see that with the coming of this more recent age, the peoples are gripped with a distinctive national character. We see that so much is given to the German people by way of national character at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries that German people feel something of a national character but do not receive as much in this respect that they ever become absorbed in an inflexible national character. 
one will find that it lies deeply in the German nature not to need to be absorbed in matters pertaining to national character, that it really has a deep significance when Fichte says, All that freedom wishes of the human soul, all that aspires to the most universal aspect of mankind, belongs to us. Herein lies a free possibility for development of the Central European German character. But there is also that which leads directly to the insight that the West European peoples must indeed reckon with this national character, this fluid national character of the German people. I am well aware that the fluid national character can, precisely in our time, lead to a tragic outcome. Let us think again of Ernst Haeckel. We have seen that in the second half of the 19th century, because the development of the national character was again freely bestowed, he could be influenced so strongly in an English way. And now we come to our own times. This man, Ernst Haeckel, who bears the whole English nature within himself, has hurled the strongest possible words of hatred at the English people. He was the most prominent of those who have returned all English diplomas, prizes and awards. It would be far more important that people in his position sent back materialistic Darwinism, materialistic Newtonism and everything that has issued from them, In this respect, we must also simply learn to understand ourselves rightly. We must be able to learn to see things objectively, without nationalistic hatred. It was essentially a kind of cultural prelude of things to come when a few years ago the split necessarily took place between our anthroposophical movement and the theosophical movement with its Indo-English character. This had to happen. Those whose task it is to develop the spiritual view of reality cannot ally themselves with the materialism of a Christ embodied in the flesh. And within our ranks it had to emerge that the second coming of Christ will in reality be the reappearance of Christ in the etheric. This has already been spoken about frequently and can be heard from the mouth of Theodora in my first mystery play. To be sure, we now read in an English theosophical journal I am not making this up, and it is moreover the president of the Theosophical Society who writes this, that the way that the Germans are conducting the war shows what was actually hidden behind the German Theosophical Venture at that time, for it is now, according to her, apparent that it had been taken amiss that the president, Annie Besant, had always allied herself with the Prince of Peace, who had such good intentions toward Europe. Edward the Seventh. We are said to have regarded this with immense aversion, and therefore sent to England the agents who were to present our version of theosophy in order to lay our hands on the theosophists there. If we had succeeded, relates the President of the English Theosophical Journal, in getting as far as laying our hands on the whole rich administrative machine, as she puts it, of Indo-English theosophy, Of course, we wanted nothing of the kind. Our plan to bring the poison of our views to India and thereby gain influence over the British government would have come to fulfillment, as would our plan thereby to cause the British people to acknowledge German sovereignty over England. This is the explanation that is now given to theosophists in English theosophical journals. Now see the truth. We must bring it to consciousness for it does not work if we think about these things as though in a dream. The truth is actually that all that I have written in my book titled Mysticism at the Dawn of the Modern Age is written solely out of the way that spiritualism lives in the cultural stream of Central Europe. The book was at once translated into English, and it was said to us at the time, to me at any rate, that in this book the whole of theosophy can be found, We could now say, if people in London find that the whole of theosophy is to be found in the book, they can go along with us. But we have not taken a step that was anything other than an expression of the evolving spiritualism of Central Europe. And a few months before the outbreak of the war, I was quite particularly touched. It is appropriate that I mention this today, that some of our ladies who are Eurythmists came over to London in order to give a course there, People like Eurythmy, 
That is good. It should give pleasure. But they did not notice that eurythmia is something spiritual, the polar opposite of materialistic sport. That on the one hand one has something sweeping through Europe that belongs wholly to materialism and brings materialism right into the movement of human beings through sport, which serves people's amusement and the craving to make oneself healthy, which is completely materialistic, whereas with us every movement is the expression of the spiritual and corresponds precisely with central European spirituality. It is always a matter of working on this foundation and deriving the fruits of spiritual development from it. How sport too has invaded Germany in the second half of the 19th century. We also have more refined sportive activities. The method of Dalcroze is especially worthy of note. How these things have taken hold. One will not now be especially warmly inclined toward him because he is one of those who so dreadfully mock, in quotes, German barbarism. But the movement, discipline that belongs to the German spirit, is eurythmy, whereby the spiritual element that resides in the movements of the etheric body, that belongs naturally to the etheric body and works within man's supersensible being, is brought to expression in the movements of the outward physical body. Eurythmy rests on the following principles. We have an organ through which the etheric body is prompted into activity, so that the physical body becomes an image of the etheric. This is the case when we speak. But it is not the whole physical body, but the air that is an image of the etheric. The sounding word in the air, the way that the air vibrates, is a direct expression of the etheric. If one now takes hold of what lives in the sound, in the word, and extends it to the whole etheric body, and then lets both hands and feet move as the air is moved quite naturally in speaking and singing, then one has eurythmy. For eurythmy is a speaking of the whole human being, so that the help not only of the moving air, but of the human organs is called upon. You can see from such a matter on how universal and all-encompassing a scale the involvement of spiritual science in modern culture is conceived. In order to understand the essence of this, we have been hearing certain things that people do not even think about today, as if through these two lectures that I have now given in this intimate circle, I have achieved nothing more than awakening within you the awareness one should look still further at what spiritual science wishes in a universal respect for human life as a whole. That is already sufficient. For the task of spiritual science will not really be fulfilled by our familiarizing ourselves with specific theoretical concepts. This task of spiritual science will be fulfilled when it enters into everything, into the whole of life, and imbues this life with spirit, And in our fifth cultural epoch, it is necessary to bring about the spiritual awareness to understand these things within that people to whom this task especially falls, to bring about a sense of responsibility with regard to evolution. It is easy, really easy, to criticize the evolution of humanity. But this is not the point, for the things that happen occur with necessity, even if they are at variance with what the good progressive forces want with human beings. We now have, in a certain sense, to have living on an ongoing basis within our culture something opposed to these good progressive forces. Among the many things in this category is, for example, this, that because of the present cultural standpoint of our time, we are, for the sake of progress, as one says, really beginning to maltreat our children from the most tender age. For there is indeed nothing more contradictory to human nature than to let children from their seventh year to begin to learn school subjects and to teach them in a school environment as one does at present. It would be the greatest fortune for someone to grow up quite differently and to receive what is being brought to people in their seventh year only in their ninth or tenth year. But this is not, be it noted, said with the intention that it should not happen, 
for general cultural progress demands it, it must be so. Nevertheless, the counter-pole must be created. And whereas, on the one hand, we badly maltreat the etheric bodies of children through having certain kinds of schooling, because we inculcate something in them that is entirely unsuitable for them in these years, we must create a counter-pole by introducing eurythmy and bringing to the children what eurythmy represents, so that the etheric body has the balance in these movements that are innate to it. Eurythmy will become something that is quite general, for evolution does not reach its goal through moving forward in a one-sided way, but through moving forward by means of opposites. One must always create the counterpole, assert the value of the counterpole. Evolution is motivated by opposites, and a counterpole must be created to the maltreating of the etheric body through modern schooling by making the etheric body more elastic by bringing it naturally into movement in the sense that this is attempted in the first rudiments of our eurythmy. Thus, something that perhaps many people today still refer to as our eurythmy is indeed connected with what I have to call the universal character of our spiritual movement. When, on the one hand, we see how this enters into the fabric of outer life and, on the other, we become deeply aware that the depths of the Christ impulse are connected with what we bring together in spiritual science. We have a full range of knowledge of the universal character of spiritual science. A great deal depends on our capacity to form for ourselves a sense for this universal character of spiritual science. And I have to say that it is at this time an experience of the weightiest kind that the present destiny-laden events are not felt at a deeper level, that they do not make stronger impressions on our contemporaries. For, quite apart from everything that one can observe outwardly, these fateful events are a warning signal, a warning against perpetuating what the last centuries have brought to humanity by way of materialism, a warning to make an abrupt change in the evolutionary path of mankind. And all that is being undergone in terms of blood and death should be experienced as if it had been sent to the earth from the gods in order to teach us how necessary spirituality is to the further evolution of mankind. It is, for example, really lamentable when we experience in these times that people give lectures and also write articles where they say, if only the time might soon come when free contact and communication of the peoples is restored to its former state, since otherwise the Germans could succumb to the delusion of returning again to the metaphysics of Fichte and Hegel and developing metaphysical impulses. Even in these fateful days, it is presented as a fear that something of the nature of metaphysical impulses might reappear. These months should be awakening metaphysical impulses. We see in so many cases, to the sorrowful experience of mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, sisters, brothers, and further human connections, that an unconscious belief in the significance of the supersensible is passing through the world like a breath of magic. Thousands and thousands of people are sacrificially crossing the threshold of death. And when peace is restored to our earth, should people be allowed to go on preaching that human life is circumscribed by birth and death? The sacrificial deaths would then have been offered for nothing. For these sacrificial deaths derive, even though not with any clarity for many, from the firm belief that these deaths are the dawn of a new age. Anyone who dies on the battlefield truly wants to affirm something other than merely saying, here ends my body. How meaningless it would be to fill European earth in our time with corpses if the materialistic world conception had even only a smattering of legitimacy. We must inscribe this in our souls above all else. Those who will survive this time will live in the period when peace will again reign and they will be betraying those who have died if they do not work on the spiritualizing of human evolution. 
for not to work on the spiritualizing of mankind actually signifies none other than saying to those who have shed their blood and lost their lives, you died for nothing. For if materialism is right, they have all died for nothing. A spiritual scientist must be especially imbued with this feeling. I have during these days been able to read again that there are people today, and in the 19th century these people became increasingly numerous, who maintain it was a prejudice of St. Paul that he said that if Christ had not risen, our words and our faith would be in vain. But these words of Paul are true. For only through what happened, through the mystery of Golgotha, has the human soul again been invested with powers that lead it into the spiritual world. We have spoken of these powers, but our time calls us with clear tones. The death of so many is in vain if materialism is right. If materialism is right, they will have all died for nothing. If we imbue ourselves with such thoughts, those who have made their forces available to the great advance in human evolution in a death that occurred in the flower of youth will have their forces strengthened by the thoughts that rise up from our souls. If human souls direct spirit words, what they have by way of spiritual thoughts and feelings, then, as I said also yesterday at the end of my lecture, the forces from above that have gathered, the unspent etheric forces, will meet with the spiritual thoughts of human beings and usher in a new age. We shall therefore conclude also today with the words that have during these days given us the meaning, the felt significance of the position that we occupy as spiritual scientists in our time. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice. There will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com as well, you can hear these podcasts at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death. Fifteen Lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lang. This is Lecture 7, given in Vienna on the 7th of May, 1915, entitled Cosmic Influences Upon the Members of Man's Being, The Occult Foundation of the Christmas Festival, The Significance of Sacrificial Death. It is my intention in the course of these days to bring you something from the standpoint of spiritual science that can shed some light upon the great events of our time. This coming Sunday, therefore, it will also be my task to direct our attention toward certain themes which can cast light upon these events that so deeply move our hearts and souls at this present time. My purpose today is to establish a preparatory foundation by guiding you toward an awareness of certain powers and forces that are active in the historical life of humanity, but which can only be recognized through those insights that spiritual science is able to give and are not directly perceptible to ordinary everyday consciousness. I shall make reference today to certain facts of human development working at a more or less subconscious level as they come to expression in the course of human history. But as you know from what is described in my book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? We should be aware from the outset that what takes place in the hidden depths of every human being can be discerned in successive stages of supersensible knowledge, in so-called imaginative knowledge, inspirative knowledge, and intuitive knowledge. In yesterday's public lecture, I have already emphasized that it must always be borne in mind that the spiritual scientist who reveals something about the spiritual worlds 
as a result of imaginative, inspirative, and intuitive perceptions, does not bring anything that does not already exist, even without his knowledge, in those spiritual regions in which every soul dwells. The spiritual scientist only draws attention to what lives and weaves in the world and to how the individual human soul finds its place there. Hence, such knowledge is important, not only for those who intend to penetrate into the stream of occult experiences, but also for every human soul, in that it constitutes an inner reality under all circumstances, albeit one that cannot be recognized by ordinary, everyday perception. I should like to begin by mentioning a few facts about human nature that have arisen from imaginative perception. We observe on a daily basis an enigmatic process, enigmatic, that is, to ordinary science, that takes place in our life in rhythmic alternation, waking and sleeping. We are well familiar with the idea that in the waking state we belong to the physical earthly world with our four bodily members, the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, and the ego. We know that while we are asleep, thus from going to sleep until waking up, we are in the physical world only with our physical body and our etheric body, and that our astral body and ego have, as it were, withdrawn into the purely spiritual world. We can characterize what presents itself to the spiritual perception of the spirit researcher by saying that the spirit researcher sees what, for example, takes place whenever a person leaves his physical and etheric bodies on going to sleep and enters into the region of the higher world with his astral body and ego. The spirit researcher simply perceives what happens every time that someone goes to sleep. We can therefore say that the spirit researcher only observes what would present itself to every human soul if it could look down upon the world not in a dreaming state, but in the state of dreamless sleep, and thereby find among the things of the world its physical and etheric bodies as something existing outside the sleeping soul. Now, we should not imagine that from the standpoint of sleep we see our physical and etheric bodies which we have left behind in the same way that we perceive what surrounds us in the physical world with our physical eyes. In order to see what surrounds us in the way that we perceive it from waking up until going to sleep, we have to use our physical eyes, our physical sense organs. We do not use them when we are outside the physical and etheric bodies. If we were suddenly to become clairvoyant while we were asleep, we would not perceive anything of what we see while we are awake as it is in our waking state. Moreover, we do not perceive our physical and etheric bodies in the way that we behold our physical form when we look at a mirror. It is totally wrong if one thinks that one perceives the physical and etheric bodies as if one's astral body and ego were bending over them. This is not the case. What presents itself to imaginative knowledge, and I really mean imaginative knowledge, is that everything that we are accustomed to seeing in the waking state ultimately disappears. It momentarily vanishes. Moreover, as we perceive our physical and etheric bodies, they appear to us not as they are in the waking state, but as though expanded into a world. They appear to us as connected with the whole of the earthly world. We behold them. We are aware that we are looking at our physical and etheric bodies. But we behold them in such a way that they initially, as it were, constitute for us the only world there is. Just as in our waking state we are surrounded by mountains, rivers and clouds, sun and stars and so on, and look upon them as our environment, So when we are outside our physical and etheric bodies and look upon our surroundings, we behold these physical and etheric bodies of ours as though extended into a world. We do not perceive anything else. We behold this as we otherwise look upon the various objects of our earth. We look upon our own bodily nature as upon a whole world. Remarkably, 
This world that we behold is such that when we fall asleep, we experience it as we experience the earth in spring, when, after it has been liberated from its winter mantle of snow, it brings forth green shoots, when it once more prepares itself for growth, when everything begins to sprout and germinate again. As when we fall asleep we behold the physical and etheric bodies enlarged into a world, we see them in such a way that we experience them as a planet that is awakening in the spring. This continues throughout the state of sleep. The mighty pictures that appear to us in their extension as a planet prepare to pass over into summer, just as the earth prepares to pass into summer when spring comes to an end. This is how we experience sleep if we live through it in the right way. While we are asleep, we reach the point that we feel that our physical and etheric bodies are bringing the process of budding and sprouting to the blossoming state and indeed to the forming of fruit. Everywhere we find everything growing and flourishing. To be quite specific, I have to say that what presents itself to imaginative perception has something paradoxical about it. Whereas with our physical perception we survey the surface of the earth and we are aware that what is growing there reaches upward from below, when we observe from outside what is going on with our body and compare this with the plant world, it is as though its roots were penetrating into our body from above and its blossoms were growing into it. We therefore experience a world that is completely upside down and fruits grow into us. We then discover that these fruits which penetrate into us are bringing to expression the strengthening that we are aware that sleep brings to us. Through this we know, and indeed, what we behold thus in imagination are actual forces, that our physical and etheric bodies receive forces from the whole cosmos while we are in a state of sleep. We behold how forces that express themselves in the forming of plants growing forth from the world come from the cosmos. We see that the cosmos transmits a whole vegetation into our bodily nature. And we then acquire the sure knowledge that when we go to sleep we leave our body, because from waking up until falling asleep our astral body and ego withdraw our physical and etheric bodies from the influences of the forces of the cosmos. By going out in this way, we free up our physical and etheric bodies for the influences of the whole cosmos, which sends these forces, whose nature is elemental rather than physical, into us as expressed in the imaginations described. Thus every time we go to sleep, a connection is formed between the physical and etheric bodies and the whole cosmos. Whereas in the waking state we live in the physical world, during sleep our physical and etheric bodies live in what we call the elemental world, the world of pure forces that is represented in the imaginations that have been described. And where are we ourselves with our ego and astral body? This has been frequently described and it has also been recounted in several of my books. With our ego and astral body, we are in the world that has been referred to as the world of the higher hierarchies among the beings we call Angeloi, Archangeloi, Archai, and so forth. The ego and astral body immerse themselves in these beings and their world. Just as during our waking state, we know of the beings of the animal world, the plant world and the mineral world and, as it were, preside over this world as human beings by taking them into our thoughts, so are we received as thoughts by the beings of the higher hierarchies. Just as we think nature, so do the beings of the higher hierarchies think us. Hence, to be precise, it is not correct to say that When we leave the physical body, we bear the world in our thoughts. A more correct way of describing our experience is to say that we are being thought by the world of the higher hierarchies. As a thought would experience itself during waking life, if it had consciousness, so would we have to experience ourselves as the thoughts 
of higher beings when we are outside our physical body. And how is the moment of waking up experienced by our imaginative knowledge? As we gradually approach the moment of waking up, we do indeed experience it, and we can again compare the imagination with outward nature as the arrival of winter with its destructive and paralyzing effect on the budding and sprouting life of summer. And just as winter brings frost and cold over the earth and destroys the glory of summer, so do we immerse ourselves into our physical and etheric bodies. In the same way that winter brings the destruction of the glories of summer, so as we wake up do we bring the destruction of the forces that entered into our physical and etheric bodies from the elemental world of the cosmos as a vegetative growth or from the animal world. And while we are awake, our presence in our physical and etheric bodies brings them into a state comparable to the conditions in which the cosmos places the earth when it is winter. We spread winter over our own physical and etheric being when we enter into it. You also see from this that what is often used as a comparison derived from physical circumstances is not applicable to a spiritual perception. To be sure, people have the feeling that they are connected with the whole cosmos and that in a certain sense what they experience is a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm. But when they actually want to compare something in their microcosmic lives with the life of the macrocosm, they like to say that waking up is like the arrival of spring into our life. Waking life is like summer. And autumn is the fatigue that descends on us in the evening. Sleep is like winter. The reality is the exact opposite. Summer is the life of sleep. Winter is waking life. That is the truth of the matter. When the spirit researcher really investigates these relationships, he finds that while his ego and astral body rise into the regions of the higher hierarchies and are thought by higher beings, not only does that which derives from the elemental world influence his physical and etheric bodies, but certain beings of the higher hierarchies also work right into our physical and etheric bodies. Not only is it the elemental world consisting of forces, but actual beings, beings of the higher hierarchies that are active in our physical and etheric bodies. And what is remarkable is that we can be aware that at the moment when we go to sleep, we enter into conditions that are quite different from those that prevail while we are awake. As said, everything that can be expressed in this way is based upon the fact that spiritual research enables us to contemplate the processes of going to sleep and waking up. And it then becomes apparent to it that that being from the higher hierarchies whom we must experience as the folk spirit, the folk soul to whom we belong, is influencing our physical and etheric bodies. When a person wakes up, he not only dies down into his physical and etheric bodies, but also into the processes that take place in his physical and etheric bodies as a result of what his folk spirit brings about. The remarkable thing is that I beg you to note this well, for it behooves those of us who want to penetrate into spiritual science to study the connections between things more deeply than is possible for ordinary outward perception. When someone goes to sleep, he not only dives down into those beings of the higher hierarchies that correspond to his individual development, but also into such spiritual beings as we must regard as folk spirits. Moreover, from going to sleep until waking up, he immerses himself in the connections of all folk spirits other than his own. So let us note this carefully. While we are awake, we live immersed in the spiritual facts that our own folk spirit enacts in our physical and etheric bodies. We live, as it were, together with our own folk spirit from waking up until going to sleep. But in addition to our folk spirit, there are all the other folk spirits of the other peoples. When we go to sleep, we become immersed in the connections of the other folk spirits. 
not in one other individual folk spirit, bear this strictly in mind, but in what they accomplish together, what they accomplish in association as a community. Only our own folk spirit is excluded from this context during the night. We cannot avoid having a connection with all those folk spirits belonging to the other peoples in which we are not incarnated in a particular incarnation. For in that we belong to our folk spirit when we are awake, we belong to the other folk spirits when we are asleep, though only to their interaction with one another. When we are awake, we belong to the intentions of the particular folk spirit in whose realm we were born in a specific incarnation. But there is a means, also during sleep, of becoming immersed in the being of one other particular folk spirit. Whereas we normally live within our own folk spirit together with his activity when we are awake, and in sleep in the interaction between the other folk spirits. We can dive down when we are asleep into one particular folk spirit if we acquire in life a really burning hatred of what this other folk spirit brings about. However grotesque it may sound, it is nevertheless true, and in our movement we must be able to cope calmly with such truths, that if someone feels from his innermost being so intense a hatred toward another people, he condemns himself to sleeping with the folk spirit of this people during the night, to being together with it. Here we are dealing with truths with respect to which we can see that behind the veil that conceals the spiritual worlds for ordinary observation, life begins to acquire a deeply serious character, and that it is in a certain sense uncomfortable to be an adherent of spiritual science, for spiritual science begins to approach with a considerable degree of seriousness certain matters from points of view that people find uncomfortable and from which we are mercifully spared through the fact that life in the ordinary sense does not reveal them to us. Although we must, of course, stand fully in outer life on the ground that this outer life demands of us, we must regard such a principle with full seriousness if we raise ourselves in the realm of spiritual science to those realms where other facets of life begin to reveal themselves. In the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, it is stated that in the moment when one rises into the spiritual world, and every human being is in the spiritual world, it is only a question of acquiring knowledge of what is always there, that comfortable unity of human nature in which we live in the physical world ceases to exist. Divisions arise within it. But apart from those divisions that are mentioned there in which one can observe, after the meeting with the guardian of the threshold, many other divisions appear, including one that is of deep significance for our whole life of feeling. We should recognize that while in a particular incarnation we must fully do our duty toward the people to which we belong and offer it our unstinting love, this national entity plays its part in the whole evolutionary process of the earth. We must be clear that in that we are, through our ego and astral body, also spiritual beings, we belong to the whole of mankind and should share our impulses with humanity as a whole. It is not the case that spiritual science allows us to live in a one-sided attitude. We must be able to bring the two sides of our being into full harmony with one another. We must be clear that even though as people of our present incarnation we can, while being spiritual scientists, identify lovingly with our own people, just as anyone can love his national heritage, we must bring this feeling into harmony with what unites us with the whole of mankind. Spiritual science emphasizes, in a particular way, this leading us into ever greater unity with humanity as a whole, because it reveals to us that through our ego and astral body we are connected with the whole of mankind. It increasingly demands of someone who dedicates himself to it with heart and soul that he creates harmony between opposites. 
It would be disastrous if one were to confuse true spiritual science with that vague mysticism that would forever like to combine the needs of outward physical life with that to which we must aspire by reaching into the spiritual world. For that vague mysticism, which would seek to bring into ordinary life the things which spiritual science reveals in their true light, will, for example, never be able to bring the love of one's own nation into harmony with love for the whole of mankind and will lead to a vague, mystical cosmopolitanism. One can, as I have already done, compare this with what nebulous-minded theosophists are forever saying about equality and about the equal values of all religions of the earth. To be sure, one can say, in abstract terms, all religions of the earth contain the truth. But that is exactly the same thing as saying that on the table there are pepper, salt, and paprika, and all sorts of other things. And all these are condiments. Sugar, pepper, salt, and paprika, they are all the same. So I put paprika in the coffee and sugar in the soup, because they are all condiments. Those who blather in a vague mystical way about the unified essence of all religions, instead of penetrating into the true nature of each one as it appears in our earthly evolution, are basing themselves on the same point of logic. It is not a question of constantly saying that all peoples are merely the expressions of the universally human, but rather that we recognize the specific tasks that the various peoples are given by their folk souls. Some indications in this direction were given in the lecture cycle, which was printed some time ago and was held several years before the outbreak of the war. And since the lectures were not given under the influence of the war, It cannot be said that they resulted from impressions of the war, titled The Mission of the Individual Folk Souls in Connection with Northern Germanic Mythology. It is important, especially in our time, to reflect about such serious things as this, so that harmony between universally human love and the love of one's own people can be found. One does not need to shy away from characterizing the particular qualities of an individual nation, insofar as it is a nation, the individual human being always rises above his nation. However, as is apparent from the observations that I have already made, this must, of course, be done without any hatred. Just as little as one recognizes the true nature of individual plants, if one hates the plant, and describes the hatred that one feels, so is one unable to recognize the qualities of a nation if one describes what one hates about this people or if one incorporates in one's description what comes out of feelings of hatred. Moreover, it must be the constant endeavor of those who are able to rise to the viewpoints of spiritual science not to see the nature of the world in a uniform singularity but in the harmony of its manifold characteristics. A person must be able to feel every possible warmth for his own people, a warmth that does not need to be any less than that of someone who does not aspire to spiritual science, while, on the other hand, he should be able to unite this with everything that brings us together with the whole of mankind, to which we belong as one great all-encompassing being. As already stated, we shall turn to matters such as this the day after tomorrow, What I want to say now is that as we pass from our waking state into that of sleep and are therefore received by the beings of the higher hierarchies, we at the same time cast off that which connects us with our particular incarnation through our physical and etheric bodies. In sleep, we therefore also cast off our national character. Through sleep, we become simply human beings, human beings with all the qualities that we must have through the experiences that we have had as human beings. If, as spirit researchers, we observe what is happening with a person, both when he is awake and asleep, we perceive that when he is asleep, his ego and astral body are living in the spiritual world, just as his physical and etheric bodies also belong to the great world. That this personal life, which, as it were, takes its course within our skin, ceases and that we extend our self to the great self.
Now, consider that in the course of 24 hours we actually experience a summer and a winter state. The earth also passes through these summer and winter states, but the earth traverses them in the course of a year. Why does the earth pass through these states over a year? Because the earth is a being as we ourselves are, though at a different hierarchic stage. The whole earth, if we observe it physically as it is around us, is the body of the earth. And just as we bear within ourselves a soul and spirit, so does the earth also have its soul-spiritual aspect. The difference is merely that we wake up and go to sleep in the course of twenty-four hours, while the earth wakes and sleeps in the course of the year. It is awake from autumn until spring and sleeps during the summer. Thus we can say that during the summer we are living embedded in the sleeping earth, and during the winter we live embedded in the waking earth. It is not true that the earth is awake in summer and asleep in winter, as we can say in the trivial comparison taken from ordinary life. The truth is that when autumn comes, the earth wakes up as a soul spiritual being and is most awake in the middle of winter. The earth spirit is most deeply immersed in thought in the middle of winter and it begins gradually to cease thinking with the approach of spring and it sleeps when outer life is budding and sprouting. The earth spirit is asleep during summer. As human bodies we are not only connected through our physical body with the body of the earth, but we are also connected with the spirit of the earth. We know through various lectures that through the mystery of Golgotha, the spirit whom we call the spirit of Christ united himself with the spirit of the earth. Since the mystery of Golgotha, the Christ spirit has lived within the spirit of the earth. Consequently, if people want to celebrate a festival that would express to them that the Christ spirit is within the spirit of the earth, at what time would they have to mark this festival? They would have to place the festival not in the summer, but in the winter. This is the Christmas festival. It is for this reason that the Christmas festival and what develops from it is celebrated in winter. This derived from a true knowledge which in former times fixed the ordering of the Christian year. The Christmas festival was laid down in accordance with occult truths and not with historical facts, because as regards what now constitutes humanity, man is united with the most fully awake condition of earth existence, in that his soul spiritual aspect is embedded in the soul and spirit of the earth during the winter. In the winter he lives together with the waking earth. And what will people in former times, who as we know base their service and knowledge of the world upon a kind of dreamlike clairvoyance, have done? They must primarily have appealed to what lives in the sleeping earth spirit, to when the earth spirit is for the most part asleep and has withdrawn into a state of sleep. In contrast to people of modern times, they must have been inspired by the truths that flowed to them in an unconscious way as best befitted them. Among the peoples whose cults and knowledge were drawn from a more sleeping, dreaming state, we therefore find in the middle of summer the St. John's Festival, the Summer Festival, in contrast to the Christmas Festival, which is suited to a more modern humanity. What has been continued outwardly, and what our materialistic age no longer understands, has its deep foundation in a spiritual reality. Now we live in an age when people must again begin to think and feel in a completely different way from what was the case in the former period. This former period had the task of making the realm of materialistic thinking and feeling accessible to human beings. And the last few centuries that human souls have been living through have indeed brought this about. Earthly evolution had to pass through this materialistic epoch. It is not good if we only have harsh criticism for materialism, for it had to make its appearance in earthly evolution. But now we are living in a time 
when materialism must be overcome, when spiritual perception must come once more to human souls. This is the more or less clear and indistinct feeling of all those who feel drawn in their own soul to our spiritual scientific endeavors, to our spiritual scientific world conception, that they feel that now is the time when the spiritual world, which had formerly to be perceived in a dreamlike way, must be grasped consciously. Spiritual science exists for this very purpose. The period that has now elapsed was that of materialism. And because humanity had to immerse itself in materialism, the strong impulse that leads it up again had to be active quite specifically through the age of materialism. This is the Christ impulse. When the Christ impulse entered into earthly evolution, the preparation also began. It entered its most active stage in the 14th and 15th centuries. But when the Christ impulse approached, humanity was preparing to immerse itself in materialism. The Christ impulse existed as an objective fact in world evolution. But the people living in the time when it appeared were least of all able and ready to understand it. We now live in a time when we need to begin to understand what took place then. What do we see from this? We see in evolution, to this point, that the Christ impulse has followed a remarkable course. We see that once it entered into human evolution, through the mystery of Golgotha, this Christ impulse was not understood by those living at the time. Let us try to form for ourselves a picture of what people did in their cleverness. In the first and following centuries after the emergence of the Christ impulse, we find that all manner of theological systems are formulated, that people argue about how they should think of the Trinity and so on. We see an endless amount of theological quarreling and disputation over the centuries. And it would be the worst possible path to take if one sought from all these theological arguments to understand today how the Christ impulse was exerting its influence. The people who were arguing about their understanding of it did not understand anything of the way in which the Christ impulse belongs within evolution. Let us try to form a clear picture of how its influence became apparent. I should like to present some facts in this connection. Let us take an event that occurred in the 4th century in the year 312 and on 28 October and which completely determined the future map of Europe. This was when Constantine, known as the Great, the son of Constantius Chlorus, marched against Maxentius, the ruler of Rome, and won a victory over him, which led to Christianity also becoming outwardly victorious in the Western world. Constantine then made Christianity the official state religion, but did he manage this out of his own cleverness? Did what occurred at that time happen out of cleverness at all? We cannot say that this was so. What actually happened? When Maxentius, the Roman emperor, had learned that Constantine was on the march, he first consulted the Sibylline books. He, therefore, set about trying to understand world phenomena in a dreamlike way. What he derived from these books was interpreted to him as follows. The right deed would be done by one who, as the ruler of Rome, would leave the city and fight the battle outside its walls. This was the most improbable advice that could be imagined, for Constantine had a much smaller army than Maxentius and would not have had much success if Maxentius had stayed in Rome. Moreover, it was not the generals in Constantine's army who won the victory. The situation was rather that Constantine had a dream where the symbol of Christ appeared to him. In response to this dream, he ordered that the cross as Christ's symbol be carried in front of his armies. He made his subsequent deeds dependent upon the revelations of his dream. This battle, through which the map of Europe was determined at that time, was not decided by the cleverness of human beings or won by the generals, but by dreams and prophecies. Everything in Europe 
would have taken a different course if things had turned out in accordance with human consciousness and not in accordance with what emanated from unconscious influences that people were not even aware of. Theologians have argued about the nature of Christ, whether he was born in eternity together with the Father, whether he was born in time, whether he is equal to the Father, and so on. In all their thoughts, nothing of the Christ impulse is contained. Rather was its influence to be found in the subconscious minds of human beings. It worked not through the ego, but through the astral body. The Christ impulse was a reality, and it was active without people needing to understand it. That is the important and essential fact. The way in which Christ has been working is as independent of what people have understood of Him as the course of a storm is independent of what people have learned about electric machines or other such things in physical laboratories. The time has now come when we must immerse ourselves consciously in the influence of the Christ impulse. Nevertheless, Christ has always been actively engaged in what has happened historically. Let us turn from this to another example from a later time. For this we need to recall something that I have already explained to you. As regards the time associated with the coming of materialism, it is important to know that if people want to focus their attention upon the spiritual world, it is best to do this in the winter. For this reason, it was always considered that those whose natures are especially gifted for this are endowed with inspirations from the spiritual world during the midwinter nights that have been referred to. Everywhere in folk legends and sagas, it is related how particularly gifted people who do not undergo initiation but are inspired through their own nature, through elemental forces working within them, are inspired during the nights between Christmas Eve and Three Kings Day, during the thirteen winter nights. There is a very beautiful legend that was discovered in Norway not long ago, the legend of Olaf Astason, who goes to church on Christmas Eve and begins to sleep. He sleeps until 6 January, and when he awakes, he is able to tell in imaginations of what has taken place in the soul world and in the spirit land as we call it. He expresses this in pictures, but he has experienced it during these thirteen nights. Such legends can be found everywhere. They are not really what people think of as legends today, but there have always been gifted people who have experienced a kind of nature initiation through elemental forces working within them, which someone who faithfully follows the indications of the path of initiation can also experience through his own will. Thus we can say, during the age of materialism, there have always been people who, when the spirit of the earth is most awake in the middle of winter, have been able to unite themselves with the spirit of the earth and receive inspirations. This was also the time when the Christ impulse that had united itself with the earth could not work through human consciousness. We should think of especially gifted souls who were receptive to the spiritual world. It turned out that such souls receive the impulses for what they have to accomplish from out of the spiritual world precisely in these thirteen nights before the 6th of January. This had to occur. And it could be seen again and again in both insignificant and significant examples that there have been people in the course of history who were spiritually so endowed that when the right moment arrived for them as they were living through those thirteen nights in winter, the spiritual impulse, and in this time especially the Christ impulse, entered into them. During the time of materialism, natural initiations, initiations that therefore took place without conscious human activity, have always been most easily enacted during these thirteen nights. And whenever such initiations manifested themselves, we find that they occurred during these thirteen nights. There is one event 
that even those who have the least inclination to recognize the spiritual world, and very few people are inclined to do so today, will acknowledge that in the 15th century spiritual powers visibly entered into the course of history through a young woman, the maid of Orleans. It can also be proved historically that the whole map of Europe was shaped differently through the Maid of Orleans, having helped the French in the war against the English. Anyone who reflects about this can conclude that everything would have turned out differently in accordance with human intentions if the shepherd girl had not intervened. And in this shepherd girl, forces from the spiritual world The Maid of Orleans was merely the instrument for what was brought about at that time. The influence that was working through her was the Christ impulse. However, there must have been a natural initiation for this, and this natural initiation would have best taken place in the thirteen nights prior to the 6th of January. The Maid of Orleans must therefore have entered at some point into a kind of sleep condition during the time between 24 December and 6 January, when she would have been particularly receptive to the spiritual influence which can be present at this time. It would therefore be presupposed that the Maid of Orleans would have experienced the time from 24 December until 6 January in a not fully conscious state, and had thereby received the Christ impulse. Well, the Maid of Orleans did experience this state of being in a very marked way. It cannot be experienced more strikingly that if one is in that sleeping condition that one is in before one's birth, in the final period that one spends as a child before birth in the body of one's mother. Outer consciousness is of course not capable of apprehending anything then, for it is a state of sleep. And when it is the end of the time in the mother's body, this is the most well-developed state of interuterine sleep. Now the Maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. This is the great mystery of the Maid of Orleans, that she experienced a nature initiation in the thirteen days preceding her birth. It therefore happened that on that 6th of January, when the Maid of Orleans was born, particularly sensitive people eagerly came together in the village and said that something special must have happened. They felt that something special had come into the village. The maid of Orleans had been born, and she had undergone a natural initiation in that condition of sleep that was so significant to her, which she experienced in the last period before birth in her mother's body. This shows us that behind the threshold of what is accessible to human consciousness, spiritual beings are indeed at work beneath the threshold of this consciousness. We see from this something of the significance of a history that reckons only with what is given in documents and outer sources of information. The gods follow the course of history in a different way. They work through other means and on other paths. They place a maid of Orleans into existence, who, through her special karma, is suited for this incarnation where she is able to receive the Christ impulse and to work with it. At the appropriate time, the gods let this Christ impulse flow into human evolution. Of course, both conditions had to be fulfilled for this. The special individual karma of the maid of Orleans was an essential factor. Not every child who was born on 6 January could accomplish what she did. Thus we can indeed say that the Christ impulse has here been working in human beings through those forces that did not come to consciousness in them. Only today are we living in a time when we must consciously receive what for centuries sought to enter history by ways other than the conscious one. I wanted to arouse within you a feeling of how subconscious forces manifest themselves in a tangible way and how the kind of history that can be studied through documents and outward information has something superficial about it. It is good if, especially in our time, we can embrace such a study. For we can see that on the one hand great 
mighty and heroic events are taking place interspersed with sacrificial deeds. But we see that the magnitude of what is happening in our time is accompanied by the consequences of the most extreme materialism, with the result that there is an attempt to explain everything that takes place in our time from purely outward circumstances. This comes to expression in that one nation ascribes the blame for present events to another nation, therefore seeking to judge everything in an external way by finding someone else at fault for what is happening. But the reasons for what is happening in our time lie deeply in subconscious events. We shall speak about this the day after tomorrow. Our time has a quite particular potential, also through all the blood that is being shed, to be able to alert human beings to spiritual impulses of knowledge. When peace is eventually restored to the countries currently at war with one another, people will make the discovery that wars on so mighty a scale in world history cannot be explained from outward causes. They will discover that they are unable to explain this. Today, people, especially the clever ones, are still saying that It is not appropriate to speak about everything that has caused this war. Let history give its own verdict. And they think themselves to be particularly clever when they say that only in fifty or a hundred years will history be able to give the true picture. What people call history today will never explain the causes of present events and it will come to be seen that these causes cannot be discovered from external observation. But there will be other means of help, as is shown from an occult study of our present time. What is one of the most striking phenomena of this destiny-laden time? It is, without doubt, that so many people are crossing the threshold of death when they are still young. We know what happens with a person when he passes through the gate of death, We know that, to begin with, his etheric body, astral body, and ego leave his physical body, and that after a relatively short time he casts off this etheric body and continues his further journey with an extract from it. But is it not reasonable to think that there must be a difference between an etheric body that has been cast off between the ages of twenty and thirty, which would still have been able to see to the functions of human life for decades, and an etheric body that is cast off in old age. Yes, there is a great difference. When someone dies as a result of old age, or through illness, the etheric body has fulfilled its task. But, in the case of a young person, of whom there are countless numbers now passing through the gate of death, the etheric body has not been able to fulfill everything that it could have fulfilled. I should now like to show you through an actual example what happens when etheric bodies are, as it were, forcibly separated from the physical body. One could, of course, give numerous examples of this. But I want to mention to you today an incident that we experienced in Dornach last autumn. We experienced this at the site where the Gertianum stands. A family living in the vicinity of the building had a little son of seven years of age, a family belonging to our anthroposophical circle. He was a very likable seven-year-old boy, a wonderful little child. He was so good that when his father was called up for military service, the little seven-year-old Teo said to his mother that he would have to work especially hard in order to help her in areas where his father would have helped her. One evening after a lecture, Someone belonging to our circle came to tell us that little Teo had been missing since that evening. Our immediate thought was that there had been some accident. Now, on that very evening, through what in outer life one calls chance, a furniture or removal van had come to a place where no such van had been for years and none has been since. At a certain spot, it had overturned. Little Teo had been in the small house known as the canteen because some friends of ours who are working on the building have their meals there. He would have left there earlier, but he was detained for some reason. 
and whereas he would normally have left through a door that would have led him to take a certain path, on this occasion he went through a different door that led him to pass by the van at the very moment when it overturned. The van fell on top of him. This is one of those examples when we can so clearly see how karma works. I have often used the simple comparison in order to show how cause and effect are frequently totally muddled up. We see someone walking along a river. Suddenly we see that he has fallen into the river. We go to the place and find a stone at the spot where it fell. The person is pulled out of the water, but he is already dead. If one does not investigate the matter further, one will recount the affair with an absolutely clear conscience as follows. The man stumbled over the stone, fell into the river, and was drowned. But one would only have to have investigated further to find that his death occurred not because he fell into the water, but that he fell into the water because he was dead. He had had a stroke. The situation is therefore the opposite of what one thinks. So you can see how easy it is to confuse cause and effect. It happens all the time in ordinary science that causes and effects are muddled up. In the present case, it does, of course, become apparent that Teo was the cause of what happened. He was the reason that the van drove past at this time. He guided it to fall on top of him. One has to keep this in mind as the solution to the mystery. But there was more to it than this. Here we have a child who dies as the result of an accident in the earliest flowering of his youth. Now, if one is united with all one's heart with the whole of the building work in Dornach, and at the same time has the possibility of observing the influences involved with this building, one can say that this etheric body that was so forcibly separated from little Teo is now in the atmosphere of the building, and one gains the most beautiful inspirational forces for the work that is connected with it by uniting one's soul with what lives in an extended form, as though enlarged into a small world in the atmosphere of the building. And I shall never hesitate unreservedly to admit that there is much of what I was able to discover at that time about our building that I owe to the fact that I directed the attention of my own soul to the etheric body of little tail that was active in the atmosphere of the building. This is how the connections in the world are made. The essential individuality of this human being goes further on its way, but the etheric body that could have supported a human life for many decades remains behind. Now, just think of the number of unspent etheric bodies that hover in the atmosphere above us and above those who will also live after us. Those etheric bodies that have remained behind derive from those who have passed through the gate of death in early life in the course of our grievous and fateful time. We are not speaking of the paths that the individualities are following. We are speaking of a special spiritual atmosphere that is created by these etheric bodies that have remained behind. The human beings here on earth will live in this atmosphere. They will be immersed in a spiritual atmosphere which will be filled by these etheric bodies that have sacrificed their life forces specifically in order that in the present time mankind can take a step forward as a result of these events. But it will be necessary that one senses what these etheric bodies, which will be the best inspirers of future humanity, indeed want. A beautiful time of spirituality will be able to awaken if people bring understanding, an inner understanding of the heart for what these etheric bodies will want to say to them. All these etheric bodies will help toward the spiritual upsurge of the future. For this reason, it is so important that there are souls that will be able to feel what is coming into the atmosphere of the future through these etheric bodies. You will not learn something about the nature of these etheric bodies only by being able to say that man consists of a physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego, but also by knowing the secret of the influence exercised by these etheric bodies 
and how this influence will work on in the future. Those who already have an inclination toward the ideas of spiritual science will have prepared themselves for being receptive to what these etheric bodies want to say. If we, therefore, turn our souls to the spiritual world, we will prepare ourselves and those who will come after us to feel what the legacy, the etheric legacy of the dead, wants from the humanity of the future. If human souls will be so stirred by spiritual science that they are able to direct their spiritual awareness toward the spiritual worlds, something great and mighty will surely spring forth as an influential power from the blood, courage, suffering and sacrifice. I should therefore like, at the end of today's lecture, to summarize in a few words what can now ensoul and enliven us when we focus our minds upon the great destiny-laden events of our time. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. That is the end of Lecture 7.